This is ChestertonRadio.com. This is Chesterton Radio, your home for podcasts of works by G.K. Chesterton, plus drama, comedy, mystery, science fiction, big bands, and much more. The soundtrack to your Chesterton day at ChestertonRadio.com. Family Theater presents Adolph Manjou and J. Carol Nash. The Mutual Network, in cooperation with Family Theater, presents Two Tickets for Stockholm, starring J. Carol Nash. To introduce the drama, here is your host, Adolf Manju. Thank you, Tony Lafrano. Family Theater's purpose is to bring to everyone's attention a practice that must become an important part of our lives if we are to win peace for ourselves peace for our families, and peace for the world. Family Theater urges you to pray. Pray together as a family. And now to our drama. Two tickets for Stockholm, starring J. Carol Nash as Jan Sobieski. First, let me say, my name is not Sobieski. It is something else. But I cannot say what, because we still have relatives in Poland. It would not be so good for them, you understand, if the communists knew my real name. I have a wife, Rhoda, and two children. I operated a bookstore. When I decided we must leave Poland, Michael was 15, Marilka 13. They were in danger of losing their souls. We were a happy family, just like everyone else around us before the communists came. I remember. Norm? Yes, sir, Oda? Are you alone? I am now. I would like to talk to you. Well, that is one of the privileges of a wife, even during business hours, especially when the shop is part of the house. Michael, Marisa, come with me. Now, what, what has happened to you two? Hmm. Little girl with a black eye and a boy with clothes that, that look as though he has been rolling in every street in Warsaw. Just look at him. Is this her way to come home from school? She started it. It's her fault. Well, Marilka? I didn't begin this one. What did begin it? Well, do you remember the wild rose bush you and Mommy brought home from the woods the last time we were on a picnic? The one we planted down by the sand steel? Yes. Oh, Mommy, Mommy, the boy stamped on it and broke it all down. Why? Oh, they say we're old-fashioned because we believe in God. I see. Well, it's, it's a nice, comfortable way to be old-fashioned, I think. Oh, what can I tell them when they talk like that? Tell them you're proud to be old-fashioned because you understand why you are on earth. And ask them if they do. Tell them it's nice to love God but it makes you feel all warm and kind and, and contented inside. And ask them if trampling on flowers and little girls' hearts do the same thing. Ask them if the greatest, most modern scientist in the whole world can make a rose to replace the one they destroyed. Tell them you don't want to be new-fashioned and smart if it means knowing nothing at all. I never thought about it that way. Neither did I. All right, well, now, run along and, and get cleaned up for supper. We, we can talk more about it then. Yes. Yes, Daddy. Oh, I wish the problems would always be that easy to solve. Oh, you're so wonderful with them. Well, I read too many books, and sometimes I, I talk like them. Young. Yes. Can we always be this happy? Everything changes, Rhoda. All I can say is... We'll try. Where are you going? Well, I have just time to go down to the florist before supper. And if he doesn't have a wild rose bush, <laughs> I shall choke him. <laughs> <laughs> then came the communists. Overnight, almost everything changed. Oh, we tried to keep on being happy, but... It was very hard. Rhoda and I didn't care so much about ourselves because 
we became filled with anxiety for the children. Almost immediately they were, they were forced to attend ZMP, youth meetings. And within a few months, Brother Michael, Marielka, is a quarter too late. We'll be late for mass. Marielka, what, what, what are you doing in that uniform? Michael and I have to go to the youth center. But you cannot wear that dress at mass. I'm not going to mass. Not going? What, what are you saying? The time for the meetings have been changed to 8 o'clock on Sunday morning. I'm not responsible for the change. Take off that uniform. I'm sorry, Father. Talk it over with our leader. If he says I can attend Mass instead of the meetings, I shall do so. Goodbye. That was the first big change. We tried to reason with both of them, but nothing helped. Then one day Michael surprised me listening to a certain radio program. Michael, Michael, what, what, what are you doing, Michael? You know better than to listen to broadcasts like that. Michael, you, you speak like that to your father? I have no father where duty is concerned. So, so that is it. You have no father, no mother, no sister either, I suppose. Marilka feels as I do. I see. Oh, Michael. Michael, can't you see where this crazy communist teaching is leading you? I shall smash every radio in this house if I catch you listening to such trash again. I shall report you. It is my duty. I shall be glad to follow it. Your, your duty. You don't even understand the meaning of the word. I was reluctant to make an issue of what my children were doing for it might drive them, them, them completely away from me. Two weeks later, matters came to a head. Michael, what? What are you doing looking through my account books? I am copying down what I find there. Why? Did you ask? I demand an answer, Michael. Didn't you ever hear of the KWS? Oh, dear God. Michael, you, you don't belong to that. It is my privilege to do so. You need the evidence. To wreck my shop, is that it? You have resisted communization by the state. I have no other choice. Arilka, take this report to Adam Kaczynski. He's waiting for it. Yes, Michael. Now, wait, wait. Rhoda, dear, neither Michael nor, nor Marilke is bad. Down underneath, they, they are bright and shining as they first were. It is only this, this layer of communist filth that must be cleaned off. And then their brightness will, will, will once more shine through. We will save them in spite of themselves. What are your plans, Jan? Well, Rhoda, school will be out in another week. I have rented a summer house on the Baltic seashore. We will go there as soon as we can. We will not be allowed to go. Yes, but, but I have a, a permit. All is in order since I promised the authorities to, to be a good party member. And once there, I, I shall rent a boat with a motor, put in provisions. The distance is not great across the channel to Sweden, so we, sh we, we shall not have to take, to take very much. You don't know anything about a boat? No, but, but I, I shall learn. And, and, and we shall have a compass and... God will help us. And Michael? Well, Michael has always loved the sea. He will not learn the true reason for our excursion un un until it is too late. Where are we going in Sweden? Ah, that, that, is, that is where my real genius comes in. You and, and Marilka will go to Halsingsburg. Here, here, I have a letter from, from Vincent Kadlubleck, who went there last spring. How did you get that letter through? Well, there are ways. And you will contact him as soon as you reach the city. But you must memorize his address and, and he will help you find work and, and rooms in which to live. But aren't you coming with us? Well, across the Baltic, yes. But, but not to Halsingsburg. It will not be good for Michael to be in a city where he can hear and, and talk politics. Vincent Kadlubleck helped me there, too. Through an employment bureau, he secured me a job as, as a woodcutter in the northern forests. Michael and I will go there by train as, as soon as we land. Oh, no. 
It is the only way. I have prayed and, and taught and, 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 and prayed some more and... Well, my mind is made up. Let Mario tell me go with you. Uh, to, to the lumber camp? There and... must be some other way, Jan. You're not used to work of that kind. It will kill you. If it will save Michael, it, it will be worth it. It is in God's hands. He took every cent we had to rent the beach house and get the boat ready. Neither Michael nor Marilka had any idea what was afoot until... Where are we going? Well, get into the boat. All right, now, 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 now you, Michael. I am not going. What? I don't think this is the fishing trip. I think you are going to try to reach Sweden. Get into the boat. So this is why you took the summer house. I should have known you were a traitor all along. Oh, wait, my little dragon is my dear. If you think I should live in the thief society among those warmongers, you will think again. Please. No. What's going on here? Off the beach, car. Here, this way. What do we do? Throw the sack over his head. The sack. Go ahead, help. Hello. No, no, no. Help me get him into the boat. Yes, we will. Sit down in. Stop. Sit down. Come on, here we go. Stop. That is how we left Poland. And like a storybook, we, we, we were almost caught. Well, Rhoda went to work as a waitress in a big restaurant in Hazingsburg, and with Michael and I kept on going north. Michael was sullen and, and nasty and, and threatened to go back to Poland the first time he could escape me. But there was nothing for the time being that he could do, nothing really. The Swedish people would not help him. He had no money, so he had to go along with me. Berger was a very small community deep in the vast forest, high up in the mountains. Only woodcutters lived there. Most of them Swedes, some Norwegians, and some Finns. Michael and I were, were the only real foreigners. We reported for work as soon as we arrived. So, you are San Sobieski, eh? Yes, sir, that, that is correct. And this is your boy, eh? Yes, sir. Give him a few months and he will be bigger than the daddy, eh? <laughs> He's a very big boy. That is good. I am Yalma Bostrom and I am the boss here. I understand. Uh, you will take orders from me. Yes, sir. It's always good to have these matters straight. As you will work together, you will live together. Yeah. There is a little cabin to the north of the settlement that you can have. Uh -huh. You will have to get your own meals. Uh, there are no cooks here. Oh, well, well, that, that will be fine. Do you cook? No, no, but we will manage. Good. You will start work at five in the morning. Good night. Uh, good night. <laughs> if you think I'm going to live here, you're crazy. There's nowhere you could go to. I won't work. Michael, I think, I think it is about time you and I get something straight, Michael. You are going to stay here. And you are going to work because, because there is nothing else for you to do. And if you don't, you'll starve for no one is going to help you to leave here. Now, is that clear? I'll find a way. There will be no one to talk politics. No one to talk to you about them. And if you do find someone, he will hate the communists as much as I do. And it will be better for you to, to keep quiet. And I require only one thing of you. What is that? You will say your prayers every night before you get into that bed. And even if you, if you throw a prayer at God, he will hear it. Maybe he will help you in spite of yourself. And if I don't? You will. Now... And pack your bag and, and let's get settled. Uh, Michael did as he was told. He, he had ne never heard me speak like that before and, and it surprised him. Well, it surprised me too, as a matter of fact. <laughs> well, the days began to go by. There was nothing but work, work, and, and more work. Beginning at five in the morning. Yes, dear. Stop work a moment. I want to talk to you. How long have you been here now? Hmm? Oh, well, well, 
Okay, the, the two months. Uh, almost the two months, exactly. You still handle that axe like it's a coffee pot. This work is no good for you, and you are no good for the work. No, but I can't. I won't leave here. I... <laughs> of course not. I merely need an accountant to keep my books. And you do that for me, hmm? Oh, gladly, gladly. Give me that axe and I'll get on with it before I change my mind. Yes, yes, sir. Now, Mr. Tree, I will chop you as you're supposed to be chopped. He didn't need a bookkeeper. He was, he was just being kind as, as was everyone else. They all wanted to help me and to help Michael. And as the weeks passed, Michael began to enjoy himself. <laughs> and then at Christmas, he, he spoke for the first time of his, of his mother and his sister. He said he, he, said he wished we could, we could be together. And then he went out and, and, and said no more about it. He spoke no more about Poland or the communist either. Then, one evening, when spring came... Oh, you, you sent for me, Mr. Bostrom? I did. You sit down, please. Uh, I wish to ask you a question. Uh, certainly. We have a new man here. He came last week. Oh, yeah, Pavel Thunberg, the Finn. I, I entered him on, on the payroll. He is no Finn. Well, what do you mean? He is Russian and a communist. Oh. He has been talking to the men. I see. He will not be allowed to stay, of course. Yes, but, but, but why you, you tell me? Michael is one of the men he has been talking to. Oh. Oh, well, it, it, it makes... Uh, it's no difference because Michael will, will have nothing to do with him. They have been together several times. Mr. Bostrom, Michael and I are leaving here. I, I, I intended telling you later this evening. Oh. But where are you going? To Stockholm. We will meet the rest of our family there. Too bad you can't go home. That makes no difference. Home, home is, is where your, your loved ones are. Have you told the boy yet? No, but I will tell him tonight. The best of luck to both of you, then. <laughs> Thank you. Mr. Sobieski. Yes? It, nothing. Good night. And as I walked back to the cabin, I was a bit angry with Bostrom for, for even thinking that, that Michael should listen to, to Pavel Thunberg. He was over that forever. But when I reached the cabin, Michael was not there. I learned that he had gone into the woods with Thunberg, so I followed. I tried to tell myself there was nothing to fear, nothing, nothing at all. Michael was over all his, his form of foolishness. I, all this was foolish and all that was necessary was a little faith and enormous confidence and I told myself I had both I continued to search until presently one day the communists will come here as they will come everywhere in the world and they will take over this country and these forests if you will help me I will see that you secure a fine position when it is all over oh dear God why do you approach me come now you are a Pole are you not I am. Your father once on the bookshop in Warsaw, and you were a member of the ZMP. Uh, how did you know that? Please, comrade, give the party credit for even simple intelligence. Now, you will help. I... I don't know. It is impossible that you have forgotten the high principles for which we stand. You must remember all you have been taught about progress and modern thought. I shall have to think... I stood there for a moment, stunned at, at what I heard, and it seemed as though I couldn't move. Michael and the Finn went further into the forest talking, and then when I could, I followed them. I heard the sounds of fighting. Oh, no. What are you doing? Michael! Michael! Please! Michael, let me help you! Take back, Father! I can handle it! Oh. He, he is not dead. No, Michael. He's only knocked out. It is good. When he looked at these forests, he, he didn't see trees and lakes and hills and valleys. All he saw was how they could be converted into 
industry. That is the way communism is. And then I, I suddenly realized something. One cannot be a communist if one loves nature. And if one loves nature, one has to believe in the God who is responsible for it. <laughs> Do you know what makes me realize that? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. He, he stepped on a little wild rose bush, deliberately crushed it with his foot. And I remember that day back in Warsaw, outside the bookshop, when I gave Marilka the black eye and you talked to us. And I wanted to go back to that time again with all my heart. I will never again have anything to do with communism. Michael. Michael, I'm... I'm so proud of you. Here, Michael. What is that? Two tickets for Stockholm. Michael... We're going home. Well, that is all there is to tell. We now have a comfortable flat, and I am a foreman in a store that, that sells farm equipment. Michael works with me, and at night he goes to evening school. We are happy once more. And someday, perhaps, I will have a bookshop again in Poland. Then she is free. God is good. This is Adolf Mongeau again. An early American pioneer, the founder of my home state of Pennsylvania, William Penn, once said, a people who will not be ruled by God will soon be ruled by tyrants. I think that sentence should be engraved on tablets or cut in stone or framed in a prominent place in every American home, particularly in these days when one-third of the human race is either dominated already or else at death grips with atheistic communism. The story which we have just heard has made this very vivid and has also shown the intrinsic evil of a system which purposely corrupts the hearts and minds of youth. This was a true story. A story sent to family theater by the Crusade for Freedom, the independent movement of the American people that uses the weapon of truth to fight communism behind the Iron Curtain. The Crusade for Freedom heard this story from a Radio Free Europe correspondent who interviewed our Mr. Sobieski in Stockholm. It has been a privilege to cooperate with the Crusade in bringing you this documented account of one father and mother who refused to let their children be enslaved, who fought for their children's minds, and who won that fight, principally by the motive, if not exclusively, by the means of prayer. Family theater's only purpose is to urge everyone to pray and to remind us all that the family that prays together stays together. More things are wrought by prayer than this world dreams of. From Hollywood, Family Theater has presented Two Tickets for Stockholm, starring J. Carol Nash. Adolf Manju was your host. Others in our cast were Irene Tedro, Jill Oppenheim, Jack Crucian, Jack Lloyd, and Harold Dienforth. Two tickets for Stockholm, a true experience taken from the records of Crusade for Freedom, was adapted by Criffin J. with music composed and conducted by Harry Zimmerman and was directed for Family Theater by Joseph F. Mansfield. This is Tony Lafrano expressing the wish of Family Theater that the blessing of God may be upon you and your home and inviting you to be with us next week. Family Theater is broadcast throughout the world and originates in the Hollywood studios of the world's largest network.
This is Chesterton Radio, the true, good, and beautiful at ChestertonRadio.com. Come in. Welcome. I'm Tommy Brown. I celebrate myself. I sing myself. I bequeath myself. And when I give, I give myself. I dote on myself. And I contradict myself. As you may gather, we are dealing with the self, as Mr. Walt Whitman happened to view it. But the self is the basic core of each person's existence. It is all that he or she truly owns in this world. And yet how little we really know about ourselves. The deepest, the most impenetrable mystery in the whole world gazes back at you each time you look in the mirror. Who are you? I'm a reporter. I want you to tell me your story, Mr. Salvini. What did you call me? I called you Mr. Selby. That's your name, isn't it? James K. Selby? No. My name is Pollister. Chadwick Pollister. Well, I find that difficult, impossible to believe. Why? Because Chadwick Pollister is the victim. He was murdered. How could you be Chadwick Pollister? And how can they propose to hang me for the crime of killing myself? Our mystery drama, Two Times Dead, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dunn and stars Lloyd Batista. I'll be back shortly with that one. You take the word justice. It comes from the Latin word jus, which means what is right or fair. Now take the word juice, as in orange or grape. It also comes from that same word, use. And it means the true essence of something. It happens that quite often these two words come together. Because in many cases, justice will condemn a person to stew in his or her own juice. Well, simmering in the pot for us now is a true story that happened many years ago. The names have been changed to protect whoever still needs protection. We shall now meet a journalist named Ezra Baines Harper. You sent for me, Mr. Dilworth? Go to Salinsville. Where's that? I don't know, Ezra. Uh, Fifty miles west of Syracuse. Why? Who cares about Salinsville? Oh, who ever even heard of Salinsville? They propose to hang the man day after tomorrow. Oh, what for? Murder, I'd imagine. What's his name? I got it written down somewhere. Why do I have to go? Oh, well, uh, folks like to read about hangings. Why? I guess it's the next best thing to be in there. Hasn't there been enough killing? Nope, nope. Seems like there's never enough. Oh, what are you saying? The echoes of the gunfire haven't even died down from the war. President Lincoln's only been dead three weeks. Ah, all that's last month's news. People have to have a new sensation each day. And if you can't give it to them... They're going to read somebody else's paper. Here it is. Here it is. Fellow named Selby. James K. Selby. And he's going to hang? For the murder of Mr. Chadwick Pallister. Uh, uh, are they sure he's guilty? Beyond a reasonable doubt. Otherwise, they'd never have come up with a verdict. Ezra, there's a train leaving here in an hour. It'll let you off near Salinsville. Be on it. <laughs> Good evening, Sheriff. Yeah, what can I do for you? Well, my name's Harper. Ezra Baines Harper. I write for the Syracuse Courier. Now, here for the hanging, are you? <laughs> I guess so. Yeah, well, why wasn't you here for the trial? I figure my editor was afraid the man might be acquitted. Can you tell me what happened, Sheriff? Uh, the name's Hooper, spelled H-O-U-B-E-R, but pronounced to rhyme with Cooper. Yeah, I got it. Uh, please, continue, Sheriff. Uh, well, where do you want me to begin? Hmm. I'll start with uh, 
Ella May Griswold. And who's she? Housekeeper for Chadwick Pollister's uncle, Nathaniel Pollister. Well, I'd just gone to bed when there was this awful racket outside my window. And there she was, screaming at the top of her lungs. I put my pants on top of my nightshirt and ran downstairs out the door. You please calm down, Ella May. Oh, murder! Ella May, get hold of yourself. Oh. Tell me, what did happen? Murder! I was going back home after visiting my sister-in-law. You know, Rodney's wife, the brunette one, she had that baby. Uh -huh. And the body's laying there out on the road. Whose body? It's Chadwick Pollister. Chadwick? Are you sure? It's Chadwick, and I seen the murderer. Who was it? I don't know. I couldn't see his face, but he was wearing a uniform. What kind of uniform? Well, it, it was a soldier's uniform. Well, you know how it's been. The roads are full of soldiers walking home from the Hell war. May, what did you see? Well, I was walking along when I seen this figure of a person kneeling in the roadside. Well, I couldn't imagine why. I, I was about to ask if something was wrong, but then... Uh, yeah, 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 yeah uh, but then... Well, something, something seemed to warn me. A little voice sung out in my brain. Look out. Danger. All right. Well, lucky it was near where them blueberry bushes line the side of the road. You know, Hesper's Road. Hey, I know where it is. Well, I quickly stepped behind them, but I could peek through and see what was going on. Oh, Ella May, for heaven's sake, what was going on? He was kneeling, as I say, and then I seen he was kneeling beside the body of a man. The body of a man stretched out on the road. The dead body of a man. All right, all right. We have established that. Well, he was taking things from the pockets of this man and stuffing them into his own. What sort of things? Well, things. I don't know. Yeah. Well, then what? Well, and then he stood up. Uh, and you couldn't see his face? It was too dark. What did he do? Well, he quickly looked around. You know, in that guilty way people have when they've committed a crime or a sin. Well, you can just I tell. Now, but... just don't wander off, Ella May. Well, I guess he was satisfied no one had seen him. And then, then he started to run away. In which direction? Well, southwest, uh, away from Hesper's farm. And when he was out of sight, I, uh, I went over to look at the body. It was Chadwick Pollister, all right. You could see his face in the dark, Ellamy? No, Sheriff. I could see the face had been beaten very bad. But the clothes, that was his uncle's suit he was wearing. The suit his uncle gave him. You're sure of that? Oh, I could even see my own stitches where I'd made the sleeves shorter. It's him. It's Chad Pollister. <laughs> And is it? Was it Chad Pollister, Sheriff? Well, someone had taken a pretty good-sized rock and smashed him with it. We found it, blood stains and all, lying not too far from the body. And then what did you do? Well, I formed a posse, and we combed the countryside. Sure enough, we caught him next morning. It appears the fellow was a deserter. He'd been in all sorts of trouble with the Army. Didn't the Army want you to return him? They're not after they heard we was going to try him for murder. As they said to us, he's all yours. Could this Ella May Griswold identify him? No, she said. It was too dark. Well, then where was your evidence? We found the money on him. What money? The fresh, new $10 bills his uncle gave to Chadwick. Twenty of them. Well, the thing was open and shut. And did the soldier plead guilty? No. Naturally, he swore he was innocent. Of course he would. What's his story? Now, what's the difference? He was seen by a witness kneeling by the dead body. The witness didn't say she saw him commit the murder. How do you account for the dead man's money in his pocket? <laughs> How does he account for it? Did he tell such a crazy story? Nobody could ever believe it. Do you suppose he would tell it to me? Oh, he'd tell it to anybody who'd want to listen. When can I hear it? Well, come by the jailhouse tonight after supper, say, 7 o'clock. Well, sir, I never did talk to a reporter before in all my life till this thing happened. 
Well, then it seems I ain't been doing nothing else. Is it possible that the murdered man was not Chadwick Pollister? Oh, no, sir. I could tell by the clothes. I see. Well, why would there be any doubt? It was the same build and everything. Well, I'm sure it was. Well, what do I mean, sure? It it was Chadwick Pollister. Do you suppose I might speak with your employer, his uncle, Nathaniel Pollister? Well, what for? Hasn't he also asked to identify the body? Oh, no. No, nobody had ever asked him to do anything like that. Why not? Well, the poor old gentleman, he couldn't do it. He's blind. <laughs> I'm sorry to impose at a time like this, Mr. Pollister. It's quite all right, sir. Enjoy your paper, Courier. Have it read to me every day, especially your articles. Oh, thank you, sir. Uh, what can you tell me about the murder? Mm, only what they choose to tell me. There's some money. The $200 worth of new bills. Yes. I had the bank give it to them. May I ask why? Yes. To... Start a new life. Well, what was wrong with the old one? <laughs> it's about everything. Now, I must admit, uh, he'd gotten into every conceivable scrape as a boy, and when he arrived at man's estate, these childish pranks uh, escalated into crimes. What sort of crimes? Swindling, embezzlement, oh, various things of that nature. But somehow, I could always get him off. But... At the end, there was nothing that even I could do. About what? He had a contract to supply beef to the Union Army right here to the garrison at Fort Lafayette. I pulled a few strings and got it for him. But it turns out that he not only short-weighted the commissary, but he also sold them tainted meat. The entire detachment became deathly ill. Two men died. Oh, Commissioners from the Inspector General's office were due here to investigate, but oh, everything's in a state of confusion due to President Lincoln's unfortunate assassination. And you gave him money to run away? Yes. Amounted to that. He was flat broke. Didn't he have any money at all? No, no, he lost everything. His kind of heedless, reckless gambler is usually flat broke. But this last escapade must have sobered him up. He swore to me that he would go somewhere, start afresh, make something of himself, stop wasting his life. <laughs> what could I do? You know what they say about blood being thicker than water. <laughs> Mr. Selby, I'm Ezra Baines Harper. I'm a reporter for the Courier. What do you want? I'm here to do a story. What story? Your story. <laughs> sure. But don't you want me to tell your story? Now what good would it do? Well, that's not the point. A story deserves to be told. Why? Because it's the account of a human life. You say you want to hear my story. That's what I came for. Haven't the rest of the boys told you? What boy? Your own crowd, the reporters and such. Well, what would they have told me? That I'm crazy. But why? Why would they say you're crazy, Mr. Selby? Because my name is not Selby. My name is Chadwick Pollister. Your name can't be Chadwick Pollister. It's impossible. Why is it impossible? Because, because Chadwick Pollister was murdered. How could he have been murdered if I'm Chadwick Pollister? How indeed. Once again, we have a question posed and an answer given. And once again, we have an answer that spawns a host of other questions. For instance, is the man lying? Is the man insane? How is it possible? Well, as you know, most things are possible when we arrive in that special place known as Act Two. It's axiomatic. You cannot be in two places at the same time. Neither can one person be two people at the same time. 
Can you be the murderer and also his victim? It doesn't seem likely. But this world is a strange place. And yet what we have heard so far in a prison cell somewhere in New York State in the year 1865 seems to be, perhaps, a little bit impossible. You say you're Chadwick Pollister. You don't believe me. I neither believe nor disbelieve. To me, this is but the beginning of the story. I don't decide until I hear it through to the end. All right, then. Listen to my story. Maybe if you believe me, you can say so to, to, to the governor. And then I won't have to hang tomorrow. Well, for the sake of argument, suppose, just suppose, this is all some mix-up and, and you are Chadwick Pollister. That'll save my neck. But your uncle tells me you're in trouble with the government over the tainted beef you sold to the army. The investigators... What'll they do? Sent me to jail? Well, for the rest of your life, maybe. Maybe, maybe. That's only maybe. But the hang in the day after tomorrow is sure. And it is certain. And it is definite. Just start at the beginning. How can you be Chadwick Pollister? I was born Chadwick Pollister. Tell me about yourself. All right. Let me say, I... I didn't lead what a preacher would call an exemplary life. I lied. I cheated. I stole. I may have hurt people. May have? All right. I did hurt people. Then you, Mr. Pollister, if that's who you are, you're a scoundrel. Maybe. But there's no law that says you have to hang because you're a scoundrel. You only hang for murder. And I didn't do that. But you were born into a wealthy family. You didn't have to steal or cheat. Oh, don't you say that. <laughs> Before my Uncle Nathaniel would let go of a dollar, the eagle would have to scream for mercy. And you might ask him how he made his money. A pious, psalm singing hypocrite. Why, he skins folks alive. Uh, getting back to you. <laughs> the family name... He's off the hook. A man everybody thinks is named James Selby hangs for my killer. Why, he can use his influence to kind of deflect the army investigation. Especially if I am dead. Well, how can he do that? You are a reporter, and you ask how men with money can get to do things. <laughs> but let, let me tell you about that beef. I bought it from some friends of my uncle. Can you prove that? I had asked him for some likely sources of supply. He suggested their names. Was there a witness to this conversation? No. Uh, it's a pity no one else heard it. Oh, someone else did hear it. Someone else was in the room. Ella May Griswold. But you said there was no witness. That's right. Because she wouldn't testify. Why not? <laughs> for more than 25 years. She's been more than just his housekeeper, if you know what I mean. Well, let's get to the murder. That's the only thing that matters. Well, I, I knew I was in bad trouble. It wasn't just one of those scrapes. This whole business of speculators who've been robbing the government blind all during the war. People are angry. They, they want to make uh, an example of somebody. So you went to your uncle and asked him for money so you could go away. And my only thought was to leave the country. Go to Canada or South America or Australia, any place. Well, he gave me the money, and I left the house. I started walking down the road. Then, just below Hesper's farm, I saw a body. A dead body. Lying in the road? Yes. A dead body lying in the road. What, what was it doing? I don't know. It was the dead body of a soldier. Because he was in his uniform. It looked like somebody had crushed his skull. You, you, you couldn't make out his face too well. Uh, I looked through his pockets. Why? Well, it was his foresight habit, I guess. I hope maybe he'd have some money. You know, his mustering out pay. Look, I never said I was an angel. And I found his papers. It was Private James K. Selby. 9th Pennsylvania Infantry. Now, what you're saying is that the murdered man was James K. Selby. <laughs> I looked at him and I said to myself, Perfect! Why should I leave the country? This is what I dreamed of. A fresh 
start a new name. I'd go out west. But you see, Chad Pollis is dead. I am now James K. Selby. So what I did was I, I changed clothes with him. <laughs> it was fabulous luck all the way. Here we are, the same height, the same build. I'm sure we must have even looked alike. This was a... This was the hand of Providence. Providence? To cause a murder so you could escape? The type of Providence that looks after fools like me. And I want to tell you it's a false and deceptive Providence because it leads you into even deeper trouble. I ran away from there. We know that. I had money, my own and his. I spent the night in a tavern on the post road. Next morning, I was about to leave. I'd finished breakfast. Uh, a sergeant and two armed soldiers came into the place, and they walked over to me. Uh, what's your name, soldier? My name? Oh, it's uh, James K. Silby. It is, huh? Yes, it is. I can prove it. I'll show you my papers. Um, here, just look for yourself. Yeah. Yeah, you're private James K. Selby, all right? Ninth Pennsylvania. That's too bad. Why? Why is that too bad? You're under arrest. What for? You know what for? Desertion. Desertion? Wait a minute. Now, no, that... Look, uh, really, I'm, I'm not James K. Selby. Look, soldier, tell it to the court-martial. Tell it to the chaplain. But don't tell it to me. I only know what I read on your paper. Hey, no, you can't arrest me. Are you going to come quietly and nicely, soldier? Or do you want to fight about it? Well, accommodate you either way. Well, now, hold on there, Sergeant. Who are you? I'm Sheriff Hooper. I see you intend to arrest this man. Yeah, he's a deserter from the 9th Pennsylvania. Well, he could also be a murderer. We're looking for a soldier who killed a man not too far from here last night. Are you sure about that? Uh, we don't have a positive identification, but if he's got a certain sum of money on him, that'd nail him. Into your pocket, soldier. Now, wait a minute. Oh, I can explain. Obey your orders. Well, there you are. Two hundred dollars in fresh, crisp, new ten-dollar bills. We've got them for murder, Sergeant. You sure? That money's all we need. Now, uh, you suppose you could let me have them? Oh, well, we got to them first. Now, who has to know that? We got him for murder, and he hangs for that. I got him for desertion. He can hang for that, too. Yeah, but this is peacetime. Well, it was wartime when he deserted. Yeah, but everybody wants to forget the war. My way, he swings for sure. <laughs> you know something, Sheriff? I like the way you think. Why don't you take him? Boys, we never seen him. That's what I'm going to tell the lieutenant. Now, let's get us some breakfast. All right, come along, soldier. Sheriff Hooper. Sheriff Hooper, you know me. i never seen you before in my life. You know me. I'm Chad Pollister. That ain't possible. Chad Pollister was murdered last night. I seen his body. But you didn't see his face. That's right. You took care of that, James K. Selby. I am not James Selby. I am Chad Pollister. I am Chad. You've known me all my life. Walk this way, Mr. Selby. This way. And that's exactly what happened. Yes, and that's where your story falls apart. Well, ah, it's true that the dead body of the victim could not be identified. But the murderer's face is in the open for all to see. You grew up in Soundsville. You spent your whole life here, is that true? Yes. And everybody here would know Chad Pollister, isn't that true? Yes, of course. And why does everyone refuse to believe you are Chad Pollister? Are you saying that somehow, suddenly, overnight, they've all forgotten what you look like? Well? Yes. Do you expect me to believe that? I've gone over the trial testimony. Your lawyer, using the defense you gave him, called witness after witness to the stand. All of them said they had never seen you before. 
All of them denied that you were Chad Pollister. And no. The jury were all from this township. They didn't believe you were Chad Pollister either. They're all lying. But why? They all hate me. Everyone in town hates you. Everyone in this town. Everyone. You've harmed everyone in town? Well, they all hate me or, or they're scared. Of what? Of who? My uncle and Sheriff Hooper. Why? They're the richest men in town. Between them, they own it. The mortgages my uncle doesn't own, the sheriff has. Now, all the farmers sitting on the jury, either my uncle or Sheriff Hooper has notes on their next year's crops. And they pass the word along. What you're saying, then, is that it's a plot. It can't be anything else. But to get a whole town to acquiesce? Please, believe it. It's true. Now, all I needed was to find one person who would testify that I was Chadwick Pollister. And I couldn't do it. I couldn't find even one. Don't let them hang me. Please. Please do something. What can I do? You're a reporter. Think of something. But don't let them hang me. What will it be? Hail. You must be one of them reporters. <laughs> How'd you know? You're here for the hanging, ain't you? Do you know Chad Pollister? Sure did. This fellow Selby, who's being hanged for the murder. Would you say he looks something like Chad Pollister? Well, there is a kind of resemblance, but then lots of folks look like. Yeah, well, this fellow Selby, he claims it's a put-up job. I would do if I was him. After all, who wants to swing? Well, he claims that he is actually Chad Pollister. Did you know that? Everybody knows that. And you say that there's no possibility that the man the law claims is James K. Selby could actually be Chad Pollister? None at all. Do you uh, own this place? My grandpa opened it in 1776, the year the Union was born. Been in the family ever since. Of course, uh, we got a mortgage. And who holds the mortgage? Nathaniel Pollister or Sheriff Hooper? Nathaniel Pop. Say, mister, what are you getting at? Who knows? Uh, maybe I'm just trying to get the record straight. What record? Yes? What record? Well, we have two possibilities. A deserter from the Union Army came upon and killed Chadwick Pollister on a lonely road one night. Or Chadwick Pollister walked the same lonely road, found the dead body of an Army deserter, and changed clothing and identities, and is now being tried for that murder. But if that's true, the whole town is collaborating and committing perjury by refusing to recognize Pollister. Can you get a whole town to create and maintain a unanimous deception? As you know by now, you can get almost anything in Act 3, which you get right here, shortly. Either he's Selby or he's Pollister. Either he's the victim or he's the killer. He has to be one or the other. But which? In cases like these, the popular expression is you pay your money and you take your choice. But here no one really knows what the true choices are. And everyone you ask only succeeds in deepening the mystery. Oh, it's you again, that reporter, Mr. Uh, uh, Harper, Ezra Baines Harper. Mm -hmm. Mrs. Griswold, may I ask you a question? Well, I can't imagine what I could tell you, but feel free. Are you sure the accused murderer... The convicted murderer. Uh, are you sure that he's James K. Selby? That's the name on his army papers. Are you sure he isn't Chad Pollister? Well, how could he be Chadwick Pollister? Chadwick's dead. A murdered body was found by the side of the road. The face was never positively identified. The judge, the jury, all were convinced it was Chad. Are you convinced? If it's good enough for them, it's good enough for me. This James K. Selby, he claims he's actually Chadwick. Now, is that possible? Nope. 
Why not? It, it don't make sense. All of us knew Chad since he was a baby. Now, how could this fella claim to be him? Tell me, did you like Chad Pollister? No, I didn't. Why not? Because he was no good. He broke his Uncle Nathaniel's heart. His uncle, who'd raised him since he was a baby and gave him every advantage. What did Chad ever do to you? To me? Nothing. So you disliked him, not because of anything personal on your side, but because of the way he treated his uncle. You could say that. I gather you like his uncle. Yes. He's always treated me fair and square. He's been a good employer. The best. Thank you, Mrs. Griswold. For what? Oh, incidentally, who was Mr. Griswold and whatever became of him? He was my husband. He worked for the bank, for Mr. Pollister. He was dissatisfied. He wanted to go west, to California, but he never had enough money. And then one day, Mr. Pollister agreed to lend him some. I see. Oh, I know what you think you may see, but it was a legitimate business transaction. He gave Mr. Pollister an I.O.U. Did he ever pay it back? No. Poor man. He was killed. An accident in the gold mine. Mm, and you came here to be Mr. Pollister's housekeeper? Yes. Well, there I was, alone in the world, with nowhere to go, and Nathaniel kindly took me in. He's a saint, that man. Oh, you're not imposing, Mr. Harper. How is it pleasure to talk to someone from a big city? <laughs> Gives one a different uh, perspective on life. <laughs> the convicted killer, Selby, swears he is actually Chadwick Pollister, your nephew. Ah, a fascinating speculation. Surely you could set the matter to rest. After all, no one knew your nephew or knows him better than you do. Uh, that isn't true. I'm blind, so other people would know him much better. Sighted people. Yes, but is it possible? Uh, I don't see how. If it were true, you could identify him, couldn't you? The last time I was able to see him or anyone or anything, he was a child. What does he or did he look like as a man? Hmm. I got no way of knowing. But he grew up in this house. There would be things you and he would have in common. Intimate things. Personal things. No, no. Things are never very intimate or personal between us. But his voice. The voice of the condemned man. Is it the same? The blind have a most acutely developed sense of hearing, or so I'm told. There is a similarity... But many voices really do sound alike. Your nephew, or the man who claims to be your nephew, says that his death would be a welcome way out of a family difficulty as far as you're concerned. That, sir, is a most monstrous accusation. He claims that you have been putting pressure on the townspeople to perjure themselves. I shall not dignify that with further discussion. I must bid you good day. I understand you've been asking a lot of people a lot of questions, Mr. Harper. Yes, yes, I have, Sheriff. And they seem to be ridiculous questions to me. But are they pertinent? And, and am I getting truthful answers? You know, I know what this fellow Selby claims. A jury heard his side of it and didn't believe him. Why do you believe him? I'm not saying I believe him. And I'm not saying that I disbelieve him. What are you saying? I'm saying that I can't make up my mind. If he were Chadwick Sheriff, you personally would be happy to see him hanged. Hanging's nothing to be happy over, Mr. Harper. Yes, but it would be revenge for his breaking off the engagement to your sister. Why should that make me unhappy? I was strongly opposed to it from the start. But you said he broke her heart, which means she was in love with him. But tell me, did she testify at the trial? Did she? No. Why not? It would seem to me that she could certainly identify him as Chadwick Pollister or denounce him as an imposter. Why wasn't she called to testify? You want to know why? Come with me. Come in. Sit down, Mr. Harper. Lydia! Lydia, it's me, Tom. Oh, Tom! 
Oh, Tom, you're home early, and, and I haven't even started supper. It's all right. I just wanted you to meet someone, Lydia. Uh, this is Mr. Ezra Harper. How do you do? Uh, Mr. Harper's a reporter from the big city newspaper, The Courier. Oh, is he? Uh, has he heard from Chad? And no, dear, he uh, hasn't heard from Chad. Chad was here one night. Th- th- does he know who Chad is? Yes, Lydia. Chad walked out of here one night. He, he said he would see me in the morning. The next morning, Saturday morning, we, we would go on a picnic, but he, he never came back, and... And he promised he no, would. Well, that's all right, Lydia. Just talk slow. And everybody tries to tell me that he's dead, but I know he isn't. I know he's in California. Well, how do you know? Well, because I've just been out there to see him. You, you've been out to California? Oh, yes. Yes, I've been out there lots of times. It's quite a long and hazardous trip. Oh, no, not, not when you're used to it. Oh, and there's so many interesting ways to go. Now, Lydia, my dear. But, see, most folks go by wagon train, and that's fun. Uh, have you ever tried it? Uh, no, no. Uh, Lydia, dear, um, uh, we've got to be going well, now. Well, won't Mr. Harper be staying for supper? We, we have plenty. C- could you possibly identify Chadwick Pollister? Yeah, if I were to show you a man... Could you say definitely, yes, that is, or that is not Chadwick Pollister, the person to whom I was once engaged? What is he saying, Tom? There's nothing, dear. There's nothing. Was I ever engaged? I, I, I don't remember. And to someone named Chadwick Pollister? Well, who is Chadwick Pollister? I, I never heard of anyone by that name. Well, it, uh, it, it's been very nice meeting. Well, come again and, and stay for supper. Oh, but, but not tomorrow night. I think I have an engagement to, uh, to leave for Europe. See you later, Olivia. Uh, well, Mr. Harper, now what do you say? Don't you see, Mr. Harper, how they're all ganged up on me? What's that sound? You're hammering up the scaffold for tomorrow. Me. Don't let him hang me. Oh. There must be a way to get to the bottom of things. Wait. Wait. You can't get people to prove your chat with Paulus. What have I been telling you? Did you try to work from the other side? Could you get people to prove that you aren't James K. Selby? Well, you, you had his papers. Surely they tell you where he's from. You could get his friends, family, somewhere. My lawyer tried that. He telegraphed her the address on Selby's papers. And there is no such place. Selby enlisted under false pretenses. You see, but that proves he was always a criminal. He must have been murdered that night for criminal reasons by people he may have double-crossed. Well, you can't be sure of that. It couldn't have been robbers. We don't have much of that kind of robbery hereabouts. Besides, whoever killed him took nothing from him. No. No, it was revenge. Mr. Harper, please save me. Don't let him hang me. What are you doing here? The hang is tomorrow morning, and I want that story. Mr. Dilworth, did you read what I sent on the wire? Yes, and it cost a fortune, too. What, well, what do you think? What do I think? Either way, it's no great loss if to hang him. Let Stop it. Uh, how can I stop it? I'm just an editor. Wire the governor in Albany. And tell him what? Tell him the whole story. Oh, come on. That'll cost a fortune. Uh, 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 it's worth a fortune. To whom? To us. How? We run a big feature. Is justice being served? Why? You've got this big wave building up against capital punishment. Those waves rise and fall. Yeah, but right now it's at the crest. Maybe the governor doesn't want to take a stand. He has to. Whatever he does, he can lose votes. Here's what you can tell him. What if there is a conspiracy? That's the problem. If. No, no, just, just follow this. How long can it be kept a secret? Too many people know about it. Something has to break somewhere, somehow, sometime, right? Yeah, maybe. That's the big word. Maybe. Maybe they'll all come out. But by then, it's too late. The man will have been hanged. This way, if he commutes the sentence to life, he hedges the bet. If it comes out that Selby is really Chadwick and was framed, the governor comes out a hero and humanitarian. What can he lose? 
nothing. I guess because there was a last-minute reprieve that next morning. The hanging morning. And Sedwick Pollister, or James K. Selby, was sent away to prison for life. And what happened? Well, nothing. Nobody ever came forward. The governor lost the next election for other reasons. And Chadwick Pollister, or James K. Selby, kept sending me angry letters. Thanks to you, I am spending my dreary life as an animal in a cage. A fate worse than death. Why did you interfere? Even though I would have been hanged for a crime I didn't commit, it would have been a brief moment of agony. And then I'd be free from pain forever. I can only hope that your uncalled for and unwelcome action has caused you as much distress as it is causing me. I would get a letter like that once a month until 1890 when he died. Mr. Chadwick Pollister or Private James K. Selby. Take your pick. I don't know which to choose. You can make out just as good a case for one side as the other. Mr. Ezra Baines Harper died in 1898 in Cuba, where he had gone as a correspondent to cover the war with Spain. If he knew more than he told in his news reports about the Paulus de Selby case, he never confided in any way to anyone. I will have something I can confide in just a short while. Hi, I'm Lyman Saunders. This is Heartbeat. Are you depressed? Is it hard to get out of bed in the morning? Do you look forward to, well, nothing? Perhaps some chain of events, something you couldn't control, has affected your life. Maybe you've lost your job or experienced the death of a family member or a friend. Whatever the cause, you're depressed. You're not able to shake the feeling of gloom that hangs over your head. Well, I've got news for you, and it's good news. There's a way to handle your depression. And here's one idea. Decide that you have the ability to decide what your life is going to be like and how you're going to feel about life. To get more suggestions on how to handle depression, just put the word depression on a postcard or in a letter and send it to me at this address. Heartbeat, Hartford, Connecticut, 06142. Ask for the depression plan. It's free. The address, Heartbeat, Hartford, Connecticut, 06142. This is Heartbeat. Philosophically and psychologically, our story does not present a problem. Because the philosophers and the psychologists see a dualism in each of us. In other words, it is possible for one to be both victim and executioner. How they square this with reality, I cannot say. But it does seem that theoretically, when someone kills someone else, he kills a part of his own humanity as well. So, therefore, it can be said with some justice that no one ever really gets away with murder. Our cast included Lloyd Batista, Bernard Grant, Ray Owens, and Carol Titel. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. Oh, but why would they get it all? Uh, unless, of course, your aunt wrote you out of her will. There was no will. Or if there was, Farnsworth destroyed it. Oh, the whole thing was awful. I vowed never to marry, and I didn't. But enough of all this. At least now I finally received my poor dear aunt's letters. Well, let me give you these photos. It's our guess that this picture here might be you and your... <laughs> Did I say something wrong? Where did they come from? From a roll of film that I found in an old camera at the same auction where my wife bought the old box of letters. Oh, dear Lord. Oh, Miss Winslow, are you all right? These photographs. Take them out of my sight. Take them out of here. 
And go. And don't bring them back ever. This is Tommy Grimes inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Top stories we'll be following for you this morning on News Radio 95 as we approach the. This is ChestertonRadio.com. International Silver Company presents the Silver Theater. Starring Helen Hayes in Crossroads for Two, an original two-part story by today's Lewis and Hubble Robinson, adapted for Silver Theater by Sue Boardman and directed by Conrad Nagel. <laughs> Brought to you in behalf of two of the greatest names in silverware, International Sterling, world-famous salted silver, and 1847 Rogers Brothers, America's finest silver plate. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is Conrad Nagel bidding you welcome to the first of two New York performances which celebrate the return to Silver Theater of that brilliant star of the American stage, Miss Helen Hayes. And now our play is about to begin. The house lights dim, the silver curtain rises on act one of the two-part drama, Crossroads for Two, starring Helen Hayes as Brenda Mason, with Carlton Young as Steve Carr and Roberto Bomberg as Pablo. The premiere of a new play has just come to its end, and as the curtain falls on the last of a score of curtain calls... Brenda, it was beautiful! Oh, you've got a hit, Brenda. Well, thank you. You're grand, all of you, and the swellest cast to work with I've ever known. Yeah. <laughs> and now, what time is it? 11.20. Good Lord, I'll never make it. Excuse me, everybody. I've got a train to catch. Well, what about the train? Where are you going? Brenda. Oh, Miss Brenda, that show tonight. Well, I want to tell you. Don't tell me later, Ellen. I just have time to make it if I don't change. Hand me that cold cream. Oh, yes, sir. Brenda, Brenda, you're decent. Oh, it's Mr. Barton. Yes, come in, Lee. Brenda, my dear, the superb. Uh, what happened to you tonight? You're outdoing yourself. And not even Brenda Mason has the right to be better than Brenda Mason. <laughs> it did go all right, didn't it, Lee? All right, with 20 curtain calls. Well, half of Washington's out there to meet you. Do you know that? And I've got... Wait, Miss Brenda. I'll be right there. Taxi. Lee, darling, this is the one night I can't meet anyone. I'll be back for the show tomorrow, but I've simply got to catch the 11.30 for New York. New York? But why? For just about the most important thing that ever happened to one Brenda Mason. Yes? I, um, I meant to tell you before, but, well, somehow I haven't told anyone. I, I've adopted a son, Lee. You? Brenda. He's a refugee, a nine-year-old war orphan from Barcelona. I found him through the former Spanish consul in New York. Then you've never even seen the child? No. His boat docks tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock. That's why I've got to go now. I don't intend to have Pablo arrive in America without his brand-new parent being on hand to meet him. Now, wait a minute. You're not going down to meet that boat all by yourself. Why not? I seem to do a great many things for myself. Well, not this. I'll come to New York later tonight. I'll fly in. If you become a foster mother, that ought to make me sort of a foster uncle. Oh, Lee, that's wonderful. And you can bet you're elected. down that gangplank with him. Oh, Lee, what if he doesn't like me? You know, it must be awful traveling all the way across the Atlantic, wondering about the person who's going to be your new mother. And maybe I won't be the kind of person he imagined at all. And of course you won't. 
You'll be a lot finer. You suppose you know any English? Or will we just have to stare at each other? Talk sign language? Now, look, will you stop worrying? No. <laughs> Brenda, why are you adopting this boy? After all, there's nothing to stop you from, well, marrying the right man and having children of your own. Mm -hmm. Nothing except the absence of the right man, Lee. And as for my adopting a child, why shouldn't I? I've got money, success, all any woman could ask except one thing. Someone who needs affection. Someone who needs me. If I were only nine and spoke Spanish. Uh -huh. Look, Lee. They're coming. Senora Tate and Pablo. Hey, this is going to get me. Look, at the first sign of a weep out of me, kick me or something, will you? Yes, but then who's going to kick me? <laughs> oh, look at him, Lee. He's beautiful. Easy now, Brenda. I'm all right. Oh, Miss Mason. How do you do, Senor Ortega? This is... Yes, this is Pablo. Hello, Pablo. How do you do, Miss Mason? And thank you for bringing me to America. I love America. You darling, you do speak English. Como? You see, I was afraid you wouldn't, Pablo, and that I couldn't make you understand how glad I am to have you. I, well, I am afraid he still does not. What he said was a single speech that all of them were taught on board. As yet, he has but little English. Chiquito, you are the English? No, senor. Hablo poquito. No puedo quedarme aquí si no hablo inglés. Si, sí, chiquito, no te molestas. He wants to know if he will be sent back if he cannot speak more English. Oh, tell him no. I did. And he will learn quickly. You engage the governess I suggested. She's at my apartment. Then there should be no difficulty. You may take him now. I shall have to contact you later regarding the final legal details. And now I must see to the others. Adios. Adios, Pablo. Adios, senor. Goodbye, Mr. Ortega, and thank you. Well, uh, we'll go now, Pablo. Uh, we're going home... Do you understand? Home? Si. Home. Comprendo. Do you want to take my hand? Como? I have not words. Oh, Pablo. If your heart is anything like mine, we don't need words at a time like this. <laughs> This is it, Pablo. This is where we live. Si, senora. Lee, he's so quiet. Do you suppose... Well, you quit worrying. It's all new to the youngster. You going to have him stay here? Uh, until the player comes into town next week. The governess will sort of help him get adjusted. Mercedes! I'd like to take him down to Washington, yes, but... Miss Mason. Mercedes, this is our Pablo. Oh, buenvenido, Pablo. Gracias, señorita. Me alegro. Pero tengo miedo que la señorita está enfadada porque no habla inglés. He says he thinks you're angry because he doesn't speak English. Oh, but he mustn't think that. Pablo, come here. It, it doesn't matter, Pablo. Tell him that. No importa que no habla. And I'm the foolish one because I'm grown up and I can't speak his language. Oh, Pablo, darling, I don't care... Mercedes, why does he turn away from me? Spanish children are often so Miss Mason. It's nothing. He is maybe a little afraid as yet. Of course. Uh, let, let's show him his rooms. Come, Pablo. This will be your bedroom. October, Pablo. Si, comprendo. What's this on the walls? Hmm, a regular mural in miniature. The Adventures of Don Quixote. I had Carl Miller paint it. And los muros. La vida de Don Quixote, no? He recognizes it, Miss Mason. <laughs> Rocinante is false and color. Oh, but he says Don Quixote's mule is the wrong color. Oh, <laughs> I'll have it changed tomorrow. And now, this is the playroom, Pablo. Everything in here is yours, just for you. What did you do, buy out a toy department? Does he like it, Mercedes? Why doesn't he say? Como le gusta. Pablo... Como le gusta. Pablo. Oh, 
Pablo! I, I'm sorry, Miss Mason. Uh, wait a minute, Brenda. But I've got to go to him. Oh, that's the one thing you mustn't do. If you really want to know, Pablo's crying in there. And the last thing in the world he wants is for you to see him doing it. Crying? But why? Any idea how you would feel if every crazy dream you'd ever had suddenly came true? I don't know. There's something in his eyes from the first moment I saw him. A sort of fear. Or or even resentment. I've got a lick at Lee. Pablo and I have to be friends. Otherwise, nothing will have changed for either of us. We'll, we'll both just go on being lonely. Sell out business or not, unless you start taking care of yourself. You're on the go all day, every day with Pablo. The zoo, the circus, the fair, Spanish lessons. You can't do that and play a strenuous part every night. It won't do, But Brenda. it's working, Lee. That look in his eyes, it's nearly gone. I think he's beginning to be really happy, Lee. Really and truly whole kit and caboodle happy. Why, that son of mine will actually break out laughing one of these fine days. You mark my words. But, but Brenda, <laughs> listen. can't talk now. I have to go home to him. Good night. Otra vez soy yo al nuevo Don Quixote y les digo mis aventuras más recientes. El asno mío soy yo mi mismo. De esta manera. ¡Hijo! ¡Hijo! Señorita Mason. Mercedes, what's the meaning of this? Pablo should have been in bed and asleep hours ago. Senorita, It's my fault, Miss Mason. I came here three times today to find you, and the last time I decided to stay until you came home. Pablo went to bed once, but he got up again to keep me company. Well, that was very considerate of you. Well, as a matter of fact, it was. From what he tells me, it's about time the kid did something he wants for a change. Really? Who are you? I'm Stephen Carr. Look, the senor. He brings to me esta medal. What is it? A medal. The Distinguished Award for Valor of the Spanish Government. It was of my father. You knew Pablo's father? We flew together in Spain. You flew? Oh. Oh, I see. Here, Pablo, here's the medal. It's, it's very fine. Tell her what it says. El murio porque los and hombres. Yes, she speaks not Spanish. It says, he died because men cannot live in chains. See, si, for the liberty it is good to die. Right, Pablo. Please don't talk to him like that. Uh, Mercedes, you'd better take Pablo back to bed now. Si, senorita. Good night, Pablo. Good night. Good night. Buenas noches, Pablo. Mr. Carr, I believe you've accomplished whatever you came for. And now... You don't like me very much, do you? Why? Because I made Pablo laugh? How many times have you heard him laugh, Miss Mason? I wish you... I, you wish I'd go, I know. But first you should know this. I was with Pablo's father when he died. He made me promise to find the kid and adopt him. Adopt? Well, that's very interesting, Mr. Carr. But Pablo happens to be mine, and I wouldn't think of giving him up. Besides, I don't know anything at all about you. You've suddenly turned up here out of the blue. Out of Spain. Very well, then, out of Spain. And I'd have been here sooner, except that I was helping to fight a war. You knew there was one. Yes, I did know. And if there's anything I hate worse than war, it's outsiders who can't wait to get mixed up in the fighting. I read about that somewhere, Miss Mason. You gave an interview. I've given a great many. I do whatever I can for peace. It's rather a lost cause, but not to me. You fight for peace, is that it? Work for it, yes. It may sound odd, but I like to think I do the same. It does sound odd. We can't decide this tonight. But I'm glad to know you believe in settling things peaceably, Miss Mason, because I'm going to do everything I can to take Pablo away from you. You see, I've got an idea that what the kid really needs is a father. Don't let those interviews of mine deceive you, Mr. Carr. I'm not a pacifist about things like this. You'll find that out if you try to get Pablo away from me. I'll give you a good fight, Mr. Carr. And I'm ready to start whenever you are. And so the curtain falls on Act One of Crossroads for Two. Before it rises on the second act... The act that will bring an answer to one of Brenda Mason's most pressing questions 
I'd like to answer a question that was asked over 200 years ago. Mr. Shakespeare wanted to know what's in a name, remember? Well, we could tell him the names do mean something. They have associations. Those of you who are familiar with Rachmaninoff's prelude in C-sharp minor or Richard Wagner's famous prelude to Lohengrin will agree that the name prelude is rich in beautiful associations. In the past, it's made musical history. And in the present, it's making silver history. For ever since its creation in the early spring, this newest of international sterling solid silver patterns has been winning first place in the hearts of women who seek perfection in all its forms. And this is why. Prelude, ladies and gentlemen, is a pattern that in a very special way expresses the new romantic mood of today. Its lines are soft and rhythmic, and the cluster of roses which forms the prelude ornament has an indefinable charm, a richness and elegance that will make your entertaining memorable. Yes, prelude is exquisite as a fantasy, and yet it has, too, the enduring beauty of the truly genuine. For prelude is sterling silver, solid silver through and through, that will enrich not only your own life, but become a precious heirloom to your children's children. So remember that name, Prelude, the most sought-after pattern in solid silver today. The Silver Curtain rises on the second act of Crossroads for Two, starring Helen Hayes as Brenda Mason. Three hectic, anxious weeks have passed for Brenda with Steve Carr trying in every way to assume custody of Pablo, Brenda's adopted child. Then finally in the courtroom of a Supreme Court judge one afternoon... ...a certified copy of the decree of the Spanish court allowing my client, Miss Brenda Mason, to adopt the child. It is completely in order, executed in accordance with the necessary... It was written by Pablo's father, Your Honor, a soldier dying in battle. It says that I was to find the boy and look after him. Oh, Your Honor, when I'm touring in a play, I am out of town for long periods of time. But at least I'm in this country. Mr. Carr's all over the world fighting for any country that happens. Having heard the testimony and examined the evidence, this court is convinced that Miss Mason has and should retain legal custody of Pablo de Castilla. Mr. Carr, unless Miss Mason permits you to do so... You must make no further efforts to see the child. Mr. Carr! Mr. Carr! Wait before you go. Yes? I... It wouldn't be honest to say I'm sorry. There's one thing, though, I'd like you to know. I won't give Pablo to you, but I want you to feel free to visit him whenever you wish. Well, that's a pretty quick switch, Miss Mason. I'm a realist, Mr. Carr. I have... Pablo legally, but there's a lot more to this than wherefores and whereas is. He's still talking about your visit with him that night. You're, you're the one real bond he has with his father, and that's important. And, Mr. Carr, I have a farm upstate. I'm going there this weekend with Pablo and the Bartons. I'd like you to come, too, if you will. Well, that's very decent of you under the circumstances. Then you'll come? I think you might like it. it, it it's quite a change. There's even a cow. A cow? Oh, when you put it on that basis, when you lure me with a cow, well, that sells me, Miss Mason. I'll be there, and thank you. <laughs> Good morning. Oh, hello, Mr. Carr. Sleep all right? Perfectly, thanks. Are you always up at this hour of the morning? Well, it seems my son comes from a long line of early risers. <laughs> Since I've so little time to be with him, I've started turning out early, too. Right now, he's taking the car down, cow down to pasture. Uh, let me help with that digging. No, I... Here, give it to me. Well, what's the matter? It's nothing. It's a little crazy, in fact. What is? When you took that spade away from me just now, it... Well, have you ever had something happen... And just at that moment, you get a flash that the identical scene had happened some time before. Sure, I know what you mean. It hasn't, of course, just a, a retroactive imagination. At least, that's what they taught us in psychology. Where'd you go to school? Kansas State. When I went, that is. Half the time, I was hanging around airfields or trying to put old jalopies together. I'm still at it, too, more or less, only now it's a new kind of combat plane. Oh. I tested the ship in Spain, but it wasn't sound. So now I'm making changes. If they work out all right, I'll take it abroad and try again. You'll fly for some country while you're doing it? Sure. 
Which one? Oh, I don't know. Maybe China. Maybe some little European nation that's either got to build up its air force or else. Or else what? Or else some big friendly neighbor will take it over. War happens to be your business, Mr. Carr. Please don't make it Pablo's. You think I would? Why not? You seem to enjoy fighting other people's wars. And you're not satisfied with the planes they already have to kill people. You're devoting your life to perfecting a better one. You've pretty well made up your mind about me, haven't you? Yes. As it happens, my own father was killed in the World War. I learned then about needless destruction, and I've hated it ever since. So while you're my guest here, I ask you not to talk to Pablo about war or any of your deadly little mechanisms that make it possible. Will you agree to that? All right, Miss Mason. It's a bargain. And now, do you suppose we can have breakfast, or aren't your guests allowed to talk about food either? <laughs> On the contrary, Mr. Carr, I often say a man's best friend is his breakfast. <laughs> Now, Pablo, here's one of those dilemmas that faces every croquet player. You can either try for the wicket or hit Miss Mason's ball. I think the wicket, no? Well, you'll have to figure out your own strategy, Pablo. But, of course, if you did hit Miss Mason's ball, you'd have two chances to make the wicket, and then you could hit her again right after you went through. And that, I suppose, is letting him plan his own strategy. <laughs> It'll make a man out of him. Mm. Now, put your foot on the ball, Pablo, and smack it into the woods. Oh, oh, Mr. Carr, you think of everything. Oh, it's been swell, Miss Mason. I don't mind admitting I hate to leave. But why do you? The Bartons and I have to go, but you can stay and visit Pablo. Spend the week. We'll be out again after the show Saturday night. See, si, Senor Steve. Senor Steve. See si that you read that. <laughs> Hello there, Philip. Miss Mason, I thought you were going to stay in town on show night. Couldn't do it. A week at a stretch is too long away from that young caballero of mine. Think I'll start commuting. Good. He's been missing you. Has he really? You're not just saying that. No, of course not. Why wouldn't he miss you? Then, then you don't still think I'm a complete bust as a parent? No, I don't. I guess I was wrong about that, Brenda. Thanks, Steve. Good night. See you in the morning. So, you see, Pablo, when people say, what is a picnic? You say, sandwiches, sunburn, potato salad. And red ants. <laughs> And this is what I meant when I talked about quiet paddling. Regular Indian style. Can't even hear a swish. Now listen. Pablo. <laughs> He's asleep. Yeah. <sighs> Swell day. Swell night. Well, where's that music coming from? I don't know. Somebody's radio across the river, I guess. Want me to paddle? No, that's my job. You lie still. Don't forget, you have a show tomorrow. Uh-huh. Brenda. Hmm? What are you thinking? I wasn't really. Just looking up at the stars and, well, wondering about the person who made them and this river and this night. Boss architect. Uh-huh, exactly. The boss architect. He must be very proud of designing a night like this. I've seen a few other designs he couldn't be very proud of. Maybe those weren't his fault. Whose were they, then? No, I'm afraid even the boss architect makes a lot of mistakes. For one thing, he put the North and South Poles too far apart. The North and South... Oh. Oh, did he, Steve? Didn't he? I'm not so sure. Oh, Brenda. Senor Steve? Oh, Pablo. Estamos, I mean, we are near to home, yes? Already, perhaps? <laughs> <laughs> yes, son. We are near to home yet, already, perhaps.
There you are, darling, all tucked in. Warm enough? See, si. I'm enough warm when it's not just Mama Mia. Mama Mia? Pablo, you never called me that before. Steve, he said to me that I should now call you so. Uh, good night, Pablo. When it's not just. And sleep tight, darling. See, si. very tight, the life, Steve. <laughs> Come on, Steve. Yeah. Oh, I'm nearly forgetting. My plane, Steve. The little letter plane you gave to me. I can have it to sleep with me, no? A plane? It is there, Steve, by the window. You see, Mama Mia? Why, it's a lovely toy, Pablo. A transport plane. No, no. It is like the one the Senor Steve and my father were flying to shoot down the enemy. But it is better, faster. Oh. Mama. Brenda. Senor Steve. Uh, you is... stay here, Pablo. Brenda. Don't say anything. Just let me alone. Look, Brenda, I broke the promise I made you. I know that. But it was unavoidable. I've been working nights out in the barn on some small models in my plane. Pablo found them yesterday and begged for one. After all, what harm does it do? It does a great deal of harm. Pablo doesn't see that plane as a toy or a model. It's the real thing to him. And it brings back all the memories I'm trying to make him forget. And you think you can? I know I can. But not if you keep all of it alive for him. Not if you keep reminding him of Spain, of his father. His father who went up in the air to kill men, but he got killed himself instead. I suppose you'd like to train Pablo to fly, too, so he can shoot down some other man, or a dozen men. And you could train him. Who better? It's your trade, your living, it's your life. Brenda, listen to me. No, I don't want to ever listen to you again. All right. Have it your way, then. Your prim, proper, pacifist way. And lock Pablo up somewhere so he'll never read a newspaper or hear a radio. That way he won't know what's really happening in the world. And he'll think you're grand when you make your little speeches for peace with all the rest of the talkers who do nothing. I'm beyond that now, Brenda. I've seen people killed. Women and children. Animals, too. And it made me mad. Fighting mad. So I'm trying to do something about it. That's my job. A man's job. And it's about time I got back to it. I agree with that. It's more than time you left here. There's a train in half an hour. That's fine. I... Brenda. Goodbye, Steve. And I'd rather you didn't see Pablo again. You needn't worry. I won't. Goodbye. Oh, Steve. Mamma mia. Senor Steve. He's going away? Um, yes, Pablo, Senor Steve. He uh, has some business to attend to. He will not even say adios? No, he won't even say adios. Mamma mia. You cry. I'm sorry, Pablo. Because of Senor Steve, you cry? No, Pablo. Just because... Because the boss architect made the North and the South Poles so far apart. Well, we hope you enjoyed tonight's performance of Crossroads for Two and that you'll be back to your radios next Sunday to hear the stirring finale. We hope, too, that you remember what we told you about International's new prelude, Sterling. For believe me, ladies and gentlemen, few of your possessions can give you the feeling of background, the inner satisfaction and pleasure which Sterling silver can give you. Because the beauty of Sterling is permanent. It's solid silver, through and through. Standing beside me now is a young man who can answer your most down-to-earth questions about Sterling silver. Be sure to listen to him. All right, Frank Gallup. Ladies and gentlemen, many of you would have sterling silver in your homes today if you realized how easily and practically it would fit into your budget. For instance, a formal dinner service of prelude sterling, complete for 12 or 24 persons, can be purchased out of income like your radio or automobile. Or you can start a service with single place settings as low as $16.75 apiece. A place setting consists of six finely wrought pieces, luncheon knife and fork, salad fork, butter spreader, teaspoon, and cream soup spoon. And there are other payment plans which your silverware dealer will be glad to explain if you'll drop in and see him tomorrow. So take advantage of his friendly invitation. Remember the date, tomorrow, Monday. Remember the pattern, International Sterling's New Prelude. Next week, ladies and gentlemen, Helen Hayes, Carlton Young, and Roberto Bomberg will bring you the moving finale of our two-part drama, Crossroads for Two. Next week also will mark the last of these Silver Theater broadcasts for this season. So be sure to be with us, won't you? 
In the meantime, remember, if you want solid silver, you want international sterling. If you want silver plate, you want 1847 Rogers Brothers, both proudly created by International Silver Company. Original music on tonight's show was scored and conducted by Mark Warno. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. This is Chesterton Radio, your home for podcasts of works by G.K. Chesterton, plus drama, comedy, mystery, science fiction, big bands, and much more. The soundtrack to your Chesterton day at ChestertonRadio.com. International Silver Company presents The Silver Theater, starring Helen Hayes in Crossroads for Two. An original two-part story by Therese Lewis and Hubble Robinson, adapted for Silver Theater by Two Boardman and directed by Conrad Nagel. <laughs> Brought to you in behalf of two of the greatest names in silverware, International Sterling, world-famous solid silver, and 1847 Rogers Brothers, America's finest silver plate. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is Conrad Nagel welcoming you to the final performance of Silver Theater series of dramatic productions until next fall. And tonight, as last week, we are happy to have with us that truly distinguished actress, Helen Hayes. <laughs> the house lights dim and the silver curtain rises on the concluding episode of Crossroads for Two. Starring Helen Hayes as Brenda Mason, with Carlton Young as Stephen Carr and Roberto Bomberg as Brenda's adopted son, Pablo. Our scene, the private office of Lee Barton, Brenda's manager and oldest friend, on a morning in July. I'm not trying to argue you out of anything, Brenda. I'm all for taking the play on this European tour, and I want you in it to guarantee the investment. And, Lee, why must we rush things so? I want to keep working, Lee. I don't like not having anything to do. Uh, it's ten whole days since the show closed, and you're bored already. Oh, no, that isn't it. I love my days with Pablo, and not having to rush away from him every evening, but, golly, after he goes to bed, then I... Well, I just want to keep working. No, 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 why don't you be sensible and go over to the farm for a couple of weeks? Oh, that's no good. It's worse up there. Isn't it a creep? Well, you've hardly seen the place since... Well, that is... Since Steve went away. That's what you were going to say, wasn't it, Lee? Well, why shouldn't you? Why shouldn't you talk about Steve? Pablo and I do often. Well, I think it's a shame you've let Steve spoil the farm for you. That's my fault, not his. He made the place so pleasant by being there last spring that... Now, when he isn't, it just doesn't seem as attractive. It isn't any more serious than that. <laughs> no. Well, all right, Brenda. I'll do whatever you say. Ah. Uh -huh. Then we'll go to London, eat lo Yorkshire pudding, and maybe even play before the King and Queen. Uh, excuse me. Yes? The London call, Mr. Barton. Mr. Corners. Oh, yes, yes. Put them on. Hello. Mr. Lee Barton? Yes? London calling. One moment, please. That's Connors, Brenda. Oh. Hello. Hello, hello, Frank. Lee, old man. How are you? Oh, fine, Frank. Fine. Never better. Well, it's all set. A whole European tour. Open on London the 20th. What about Brenda? Well, Brenda's definitely decided. She's right here with me now. Put her on, will you? Of course. Brenda. Hello, Frank. Brenda, I'm delighted you're coming over. London needs a good play and a good actor. I bow, Mr. Connors. All the way across the Atlantic, I bow. I mean it. <laughs> I see Brenda. I read about your adopting a child. Thanks. Yes, a war orphan. I'll bring him along. Be sure to do that. Frank, what about the war situation? Oh, nothing to worry about. Nothing at all. Everybody's too scared of everybody else over here to make a move. Well, that checks with what I've been hearing. As a matter of fact, the situation may stay as it is for years. And then you'll be so old, you have to make your London debut in a character part. <laughs> all right, Frank. You want to talk to me again? No need. <laughs> no details. Goodbye, Brenda. Have a good coffee. Here you are, Lee. In fact, there we both are. 
Now, grab your hat and come along. Where to? Today's Pablo's birthday, and he's certainly not going to celebrate it without having his foster uncle on hand. Well, but why didn't you tell me? Because I was afraid you'd go out and buy him something thoroughly impractical. But we'll stop off on the way home and you can get him a nice pair of sticks. Sticks? What an extraordinary thought. I don't see why. What's wrong with sticks? <laughs> Come se llama ese pito. Pues no importa. Es maravilloso. Oh, Pablo. Hello there. Mamma mia, señor Lee. Look what I have. Hey, what in the world? What's a Chinese rickshaw? See, sí, and this is mine. For my birthday. What? See, mamma mia. I'm so your See, see the here? Oh, no, no, Miss Mason. This, this rickshaw was sent to Pablo by Senor Carl from China. From China? He's in China, but how do you know? Well, there was a note that came with the present, Senorita, from Chung King. See, it is weird. Look, I can read it. To Pablo, for him, this is a great day from Steve. Oh, and there was something more to him. Something more? For you, Mamma Mia. Look, and on these two days, a note. Yes. For Pablo's mother, to whom this is perhaps an even greater day. Oh, it's a present for you, Brenda. Do you not open it, Mamma? Uh, yes. Yes, of course. Please. Oh, it is a little doll. Yeah, some kind of Chinese goddess, isn't it? Yes. Carved and jade. Oh, Lee, have you ever seen anything so... Mama, you do not like what the most easy thing to you? Oh, yes, Pablo. Of course I like it. Uh, Pablo, uh, don't you want to practice running that rickshaw of yours outside? See. And... Si. Come, Mr. <laughs> careful, Pablo. Be careful of the door now. First, I ride you. Then it is the turn for me. Well, uh, from now on, I think I will have a first day every week. A first day, I am in favor. In China. He said he might go there. <laughs> Sending Pablo a rickshaw crazy. Brenda. Huh? Are you sure you're being wise about Steve? Steve gone, Lee. Out of my life and Pablo's. Well, only because you sent him away. A pacifist and a militarist aren't a very happy combination. But Brenda... Steve works at war. The idea of that, the sound of it, offends me. Oh, I know it's natural for him to talk about his job just as it's natural for me to talk about the theater. But I can't have him telling Pablo about his beautiful, shiny, new pursuit thing. Pablo's father was killed in one of them. I don't want the same thing to happen to Pablo. I don't want him to know any more about war than he knows already. That's one of the reasons why I took him. To give him a chance to forget it. Well, I never thought it was the actual fighting that appealed to Steve so much as testing that new plane of his. But that's even less admirable as I see it. Developing a bigger and better fighting machine that'll kill more men faster. Oh, Steve and I had this all out, Lee. He said we were both like the North and South Pole with a world between us. And he was right. I still know he was right. Hear that? What? The air mail flies over twice a day. You can imagine what a help that's been. I wonder if you're the wisest woman I ever knew or even more confused than the rest of us. I wonder, too. If you ever figure it out, you might let me know. <laughs> Come on, Lee, let's find Pablo. I want to ride in a rickshaw. <laughs> of the distinguished American actress Brenda Mason. In this, Miss Mason's first London appearance, she more than justified the high esteem in which she is held by her countrymen. And all Paris will agree that one does not need to speak Miss Brenda Mason's language to appreciate the quality of her artistry. It is to be regretted that Miss Mason and her company are to appear for so short a time in Rome. It is a good play. Westfield House. Paul and Brenda Mason is an American. Nevertheless, she is an actress. Her play should be seen. Cancelled, Brenda. Nearly every booking left on the tools. Telegrams have been coming in ever since last night. From Prague, Bucharest, Sofia, Warsaw. Well, what's happened? Maybe after four months in Europe, they've suddenly discovered we don't speak their language. Now, this is no joke, Brenda. No. There's something up. All kinds of things are rumored. Ultimatums, threats. Oh, Lee, we've felt that sort of undercurrent ever since we came over. Yes, but this is different. 
Now, even the people in the streets show it. There's a tension in the air. And these cancellations, well, how do you account for them? I don't know. But it looks as if our brilliant European tour has gone a little sour. Well, the only place left for us to go at this point is home. You can take the company back, Lee. But I promised Pablo I'd show him the rest of Europe. And I want to do it while there's still a Europe for him to see. Uh, Brenda, I don't want to leave you here. There may be real danger. Oh, you go on. And don't worry. I gave Pablo a book the other day about the ancient Greeks. And ever since he's been calling himself Hercules. <laughs> After all, you can't hire that kind of protection these days. <laughs> Polkans. Why do they call them the Polkans, Mamma Mia? Why, because... <laughs> Darling, I'm afraid you've got me. I ought to know, but if I ever did, I'd forgotten. We go on to some other country soon, oh, no? Oh, Pablo. There must be a dervish inside of you. Don't you like it here? Oh, see. It is a nice little country. But there are others I would see. Oh, Miss Mason. Miss Mason. Miss Mercedes, what on earth? Get back to Miss Oh, it has happened. They talk of war. Now it comes. Mercedes, what's happened? Tell me. The ultimatum. For weeks they have fear of it. Now early this morning it has come. The ultimatum. They're going to fight, no? Be quiet, Pablo. Wait. Hello. Uh, this is Miss Mason. What's this talk about an ultimatum? Three hours? And what'll happen if... Oh, yes, I see. Thank you. Oh, wait. Will you give me the address of the American consulate? Oh, thanks very much. What happens, Mama? What is it? I'm going to find out. You stay here with Mercedes, Pablo. I'll be right back. Are you serious, Miss Mason? That's the little we can do. Healed for assistance several hours ago. You sent out a list of the prominent Americans. Harry, oh, or... another telegram, sir. Oh, thank you. Of course. Yes. Just as I expect. Listen, Miss Mason. The Great Impossible send planes, evacuate citizens in immediate crisis. State Department sending warning to powers concerned against endangering American lives. Meanwhile, take all precautions. Good luck. From Paris, my last and strongest hope. But that means we're caught in here. We can't get out. I'm afraid so. Government here has declared a state of emergency. Closed the frontier and grounded all the planes. And no one's going to do anything about it? Why? Do thousands of people have to be killed before the diplomats of the world choose to see that something is wrong? There's nothing more than I can... Mr. Carrick, I'm sorry, but this man Mr. insisted Carrick. on... Steve. Steve, Carr. What are you... Hello, Brenda. Where's Pablo? At the hotel with Mercedes. But how did we'll you... We'll go get them. Mr. Carrick, I'm Steve Carr, and I've just flown in from Paris. I have a plane that will carry three more passengers. You pick out the people you want to go and have them at the airport in 15 minutes. Oh, yes, Come on, Alex. Brenda. Steve. Oh, Steve, how, how did you know? Your activities have a way of getting into newspapers, you know, and they have newspapers in Paris. But what are you doing in Europe, I... You went to China. I sent the plans of my pursuit plane to Washington, and they've been approved. I was on my way home, and... Uh, Brenda, what's your hotel? The Ritz. It's just down the street. Now you. I'm... Hold on there. You there. Do you want me, officer? Your name is Stephen Carr? That's right. You're the pilot of the plane that landed a few moments ago at the National Airport? I am. You will come with me to military headquarters. You're under arrest. So, ladies and gentlemen, we come to the end of Act One of tonight's Silver Theater story, Crossroads for Two. You know, for many weeks during these brief intermissions, it's been a pleasure and a privilege for me to tell you of the beauty and quality of 1847 Rogers Brothers' silver plate. And you know that this extraordinary craftsmanship is not a new development with this distinguished house that goes back almost a century. For even in the beginning, 1847 Rogers Brothers' designs had the fine, upswinging grace of Connecticut's own birches. The patient fidelity to detail that characterizes the true artist in silver. And because this loyalty to the highest ideals that endured through the years, the name of 1847 Rogers Brothers today is admittedly the most precious in silver plate. So if you've never owned 1847 Rogers Brothers silver plate, why not see how gloriously beautiful it is by accepting this friendly invitation? Ladies and gentlemen, tomorrow, Monday... Let your silverware dealer show you a complete service of 1847 Rogers Brothers silver plate in the Lovelace pattern. For this is the exquisite Pierce pattern, whose sterling like the tail is winning praise from women everywhere. 
A design of wedding ring orange blossom inspiration with graceful tapering lines and beautiful proportions. And you can now get 62 pieces of this thrillingly lovely silver plate for only $59.75. That's a saving of more than $14 over open stock price. Your silverware dealer will be delighted to show it to you and to explain on what easy, convenient payment terms you can own silver plate from the proudest house in America. America's finest silver plate. 1847 Rogers Brothers Silver Plate. The house lights dim, the silver curtain rises, and here is the concluding act of Crossroads for Two, starring Helen Hayes as Brenda Mason. A nation of southern Europe besieged the disaster of attack by land, by air, an impending reality, and in the office of the commander of military affairs... You may consider yourself at liberty, Mr. Carr. You're fighting for this country with foolhardy at this time, but certainly not a criminal action. Criminal action? Trying to get your own countrymen out of a war. However, you? while I can take no action concerning the flight you have made into this country, I can prevent you from leaving it. But, Commander, you must Mr. realize... Carr, this country is virtually surrounded by hostile forces. Forces mobilized, ready, and, I think, anxious to move. Yours is a foreign plane of a bombing type. That's true. A bomber's the only ship I could get on short notice that was big enough. But it's unmarked. There are the enemy anti-aircraft gunners at our borders. How are they to know the plane is not our own, leaving the capital with a cargo of bombs instead of your countrymen? We'll take that risk. But we will not. One shot fired at the border may be the spark to set off the conflagration. The car, I'm sorry. You cannot leave the capital. The interview is ended. Thanks for all your help. You're welcome. Good day. Oh, Steve. Steve, what happened? Is it all right? Sure. Sure. Everything's swell. Then you're not under arrest. Whatever gave you that idea? The commander just heard I was here and wanted to offer me a job. He's heard about me, my flying for Spain with the Chinese. After all, those things get around. Steve, why are you lying? Don't you suppose I know this is a mess? Now, come on, tell me the truth. I'm a big girl now. All right. The truth is we can't leave. They won't let us. Not until the government makes up its mind one way or the other about the ultimatum. But, Steve, is there a choice? Sure. They can surrender and receive the so-called protection of their nice, friendly neighbor, or they can fight that same friendly neighbor and be outnumbered six to one. A swell choice. But the rest of the world, surely they won't just stand by. I've got a hunch that the rest of the world is going to be looking the other way when this little grab takes place. They'll be too busy over a peace conference. You haven't changed, have you, Steve? In fact, nothing's changed. You're still quite convinced that there's no argument like a gun. And the bigger the gun, the stronger the argument. That's not a bad way to put it. Certainly a couple of million guns would carry a lot of weight in this country right now. And sanity. There's no place for that, of course. These countries couldn't get together and settle whatever their dispute may be without sacrificing countless lives. You wouldn't approve of that. Sure I would. If I lived in Utopia, I'd be all for it. But I don't, Brenda. Won't Stop you it, really? Please. Stop it. Oh, don't you see? It's our old argument all over again. Just as hopeless, just as futile as ever. And how can I fight with you when you come all the way over from Paris to... See, it seems our wars have crossed at last. Let's call a truce. Okay. It's a deal. We'll have lunch together. All right. But before we do, I'd like to stop at the hotel and see that Pablo and Mercedes are all right. Of course. And tell them to make for the cellar if there's any sign of trouble. Oh. I'll check at the airfield and see that they're not manhandling that plane. We'll uh, meet in the dining room at the Ritz in half an hour. But, Steve... We're forgetting the ultimatum. Sure we are. Why not? There isn't anything we can do about that. And if this country ceases to exist at 3 o'clock this afternoon, I want to tell my grandchildren that I spent the last three hours of its history having lunch with America's most beautiful and talented actors. Just for that, I'll buy your lunch. <laughs> After all, I couldn't disappoint your grandchildren. <laughs> How's the farm, Brenda? Does the cow ever moo in my memory? What's her name? Uh, Hezekiah? Hepzibah. Oh, well, how is the old girl these days? We didn't get together much after you left. Every time I looked at her, I thought of you. Brenda, that's one of the nicest things you've ever said to me. <laughs> <laughs> my wife is awful for her. She can speak to I must get to her. Annie is not well and she'll worry for me. I'm doing everything I can, Doctor. Believe me. But my Annie is sick for myself. Oh, Steve, that poor old Don't man. Don't think about it. Tell me about the rickshaw, Brenda. Did Pablo like it? Did you like it? Yes. So don't get carried away. Uh, no. Oh, really? Pablo adored the rickshaw. He wanted to hire it out as a taxi. 
He said if the Chinese made money that way, why shouldn't he? <laughs> How did you handle that one? Well, I told him he should keep his amateur standing and I'd raise his allowance. Well. <laughs> <laughs> the, the other present that came from China was charming, Steve. Well, that's okay. It's the loveliest jade figure I've ever seen. You know who she is? No. One of the eight Chinese immortals. The only woman in the bunch. They call her the goddess of mercy. I see. And Brenda. Pardon me, sir. There'll be something else. Uh, no, thanks. Uh, but look, waiter. Yes, sir? See if you can find out what's happened to the musicians. They're dying on us. Tell them to play up. Very well, sir. Tell all you. Play up there. Oh, I fear their heart is not in it, sir. Like everyone else, they're afraid. The other patrons think only of what may happen. They look at maps and listen to the radio reports. But you and the lady, you, you only laugh. Some of the others, they say to me that you're crazy. But I tell them, no, you're only American. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I suppose that amounts to about the same thing, doesn't it? Yes, madam, often I believe so. <laughs> and, and now, sir, if you have further needs, one of the other waiters will serve you. I have permission to leave so that I may be home by three, and, and I must stop for gas masks for my wife and daughter on the way. Good day, madam. Thank you, sir. He thinks of gas masks while you tell me about the goddess of mercy. You know, it's a good thing for an actress to see the world, Steve. To find out that things like this can happen to people overnight, just like that. They don't happen that way on the stage. There's always a reason. Where's the reason here? Greed. Somebody reaching out. Somebody wanting something that doesn't belong to them. Steve, what time is it? Uh, ten or three. Well, that's silent. Waiter. Oh, wait. Yes, sir. That signal. A warning, sir, to make for cover. Does that mean an air raid? I don't know, madame. No one knows. Waiter! They probably want the streets clear by three, just in case. Steve, we've got to get back to my hotel to Pablo. Come on, there's no little time. Right. Well, I'll have to walk, Brenda, all I can. I know, I know. We just done this walk in the the square. All those troops. Home guard, last line of defense. But they look like boys. They are. Their fathers are already at the border. You can't cross the square. It's been ordered cleared. You'll have to go around. Listen, will you? We're Americans. Sorry, sir. I have my orders. My, my son is at the hotel. I've got to get to him. Please, officer. Well, ma'am, I... Oh, thank you. Thank you. Come on, Steve. Stand aside. Nice back. work, Brenda. Better run, Steve. Run. <laughs> Going up. Going up. Please Let's go. Ahead. Full car. Next car, please. All guests are advised to take refuge at once at the hotel bomb shelter. Floor, please. Nine, Nine please. please. Brenda, your floor. Um, four. Jim's been trying to get through the foreign office all day. But it's been busy. 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 Oh, if it only stopped that siren. I don't think stop it. forgot to pack his heavy sweater. I don't know how to get it to him now. Last week at this time, we were at the festival. Little did I think that... Fourth floor. Mercedes! Pablo! Pablo! Please, they're not here. Perhaps... Miss Mason, Miss Mason. Oh, yes? At last you were here. Your son and his governess are in the bomb shelter in the cellar. Oh, thank heaven. And you, Miss Mason? Uh, uh, later, but thank you. Yes. Brenda, perhaps you'd better go down. Please, listen. The siren. It stopped. Yeah. Everything's suddenly so quiet. What do you suppose... Steve, it must be nearly... The time has come, the war has said. To talk of many things. Oh, Brenda, it's good. Good to see you. I'd have been frantic if you hadn't come. Frantic. I followed your tour in the papers. I kept track of you. You did? Yeah. Pablo, I hope he's all right. Yes, sir. All citizens. Yeah. Attention. Steve, listen. Yeah. Attention. It's a loudspeaker out there in the square. It must be connected with the government radio. Come out on the balcony. Yeah. All citizens, at 2.35 p.m., your government sent its answer to the ultimatum received this morning. That answer was refusal to surrender your liberty. The hour deemed is now past, and as yet the troops massed beyond our borders have not marched. However, continued caution is advised. Maybe I was wrong. I guess the hour hasn't come. But what now? Who knows? Six to one, and they're ready to fight. How can they? They can't. It would be suicide. But these people have been independent for centuries. They want to stay that way. They've got a lot of heart. Yes, but what they haven't got is just about two million more men to back them up. Well, that announcement seems to have broken the tension. They're all out on the streets again. Yeah, and that's not a very smart thing to do. What did I tell you? Steve! 
Brenda, inside. Oh! Oh, Lucy, they can't. They can't. All those people have just come out. You'd better get back in and fast. You two, come on, Brenda. And don't watch it. Please don't. Now listen to me, Brenda. Oh, oh, Steve. They didn't have a chance. They're helpless. Oh, look, there's our little waiter from the hotel. He's trying to get away. Run for it. Yes, run. Faster. Oh, he'll never make it that way. Look out! He had gas masks to his wife and his daughter, and... Uh... Oh, do something! Why don't you do something? You can't just stand there! There's nothing anyone can do now. It's all over. The planes are going back. Uh... This is just a sample of what they can expect if they try to resist. But how can they resist? Look at that square! They'll give in. There's nothing else to do. Steve, it... It could happen anywhere. What we saw out there. It could happen in New York. It could, Steve. It could. No, no, Brenda. Don't think of New York like that. Think of it as it is, as it must always be. Fifth Avenue on a sunny day. The hurdy-gurdy man. Shoeshine boys. Carriages in front of the plaza. I want to go back, Steve. I want to go home. You will. We may even get out tonight, as soon as the other troops march in. Steve, you... You've seen all this happen many times. No, not many. But often enough so that I couldn't forget it. Brenda, do you remember shouting at me a moment ago, telling me to do something? Oh, yes, it seems so, so terrible that no one was. You got mad. Well, it's always made me mad, too. That's why I've been flying and fighting these last years, working on my plane. You thought I wanted to kill people. Well, I didn't. I only wanted to prevent people being killed. I want peace, too, Brenda. But I know the world as it is today. And the only way to be sure of peace in such a world is to make defense so strong that no one dares make war. I never believed that. But after today, Brenda, how can you help it? Would this have happened if they'd been able to protect themselves? I guess you're right, Steve. I haven't seen things as they are, only as I wanted to see them. You couldn't have, done it. You didn't know. You couldn't. All along, I thought you were so wrong. I love you, Brenda. Oh. You know that, don't you? Even when we seemed farthest apart, I loved you. I do know, Steve. Because nothing was right for me after you went away. We'll go home together. And this time, I'll stay. Oh, Steve. If you only knew how long I'd wanted to be like this. They got the wind from my ear. Where did oh, they pee oh, oh. me? I do that pee oh, very Oh, no, Pablo, you must not. Senorita, Pablo no. thinks he's now a soul. Do you see? It is you. <laughs> Hello, Pablo. Oh, Pablo, give me that balloon. Give it to me. Where is my gun? I am a soldier. You're not a soldier. You'll never be a soldier, do you hear? You are me. But, Brenda, after what we just said, I thought you... You thought I understood. And I do, Steve, I do. I know we've got to be strong, ready and prepared to fight, if we must fight. But because that's true for us, for our generation, must it also be true for Pablo and his? I don't know, Brenda. I'd like to think things might change, but... They must, Steve. I'll face reality with you from now on. But that doesn't mean I'm going to stop hoping and working for something better. I see now that it's stupid to deny today. But we have tomorrow. It's the only hope there is, Steve. And it's our job to fulfill the promise of a different tomorrow. Ladies and gentlemen, I know I'm speaking not only for myself, but for all of you, and I say thank you, Helen Hayes, for making our final Silver Theater performance a truly memorable one. <laughs> and thank you, everybody, and you especially, Carlton Young and Roberto Bamberg, for your fine support. You were really grand. Helen, before you go, would you tell us if there's any truth to the rumor that you're going out to California? That couldn't mean a picture, could it? No. It's uh, for a play Charles MacArthur wrote with Ben Hecht called Ladies and Gentlemen. Herbert Marshall will be in it, too. We'll probably open in San Francisco sometime in July and then bring it here in the fall, if it's a hit. Well, I know it will be. And after you've settled down for a nice long run, I hope we'll be lucky to have you with us again on Silver Theater. I'm looking forward to it, Conrad, because I've really enjoyed appearing on these Silver Theater broadcasts. And I've also enjoyed seeing 1847 Rogers Brothers' new Lovelace pattern. It's really beautiful silver plate. Well, thank you again, Helen, and for a grand show. Good luck to you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, since this is the last Silver Theater broadcast this season, 
I think I'd like to say a word myself before we ring down that final curtain. Our little company here in Hollywood has enjoyed bringing these programs to you each Sunday, and we hope that as you think back over them, you'll remember them with real pleasure, and that you, as well as we, will be a little sorry that they're all over for the season. We hope also that you'll remember the two great names that made our Sunday half hours together possible. 1847 Rogers Brothers, creators of America's finest silver plate, and International Sterling, creators of world-famous solid silver. In their behalf, we want to say a sincere thank you. Thank you, our audience, for listening, and you, our cast, who helped to make the Silver Theater program so entertaining. We hope to be back on the air again in the fall. So until we meet again, may we also hope that you'll remember the words that make silver dreams come true. If you want solid silver, you want International Sterling. If you want silver plate, you want 1847 Rogers Brothers, both proudly created by International Silver Company. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. This is Chesterton Radio, the true, good, and beautiful at ChestertonRadio.com. This is Chesterton Radio, your home for podcasts of works by G.K. Chesterton, plus drama, comedy, mystery, science fiction, big bands, and much more. The soundtrack to your Chesterton day at ChestertonRadio.com. Broadcasting Company presents the first in a new series of famous stories for young people, Adventure Ahead. This week, a tale suggested by that epic of the sea, Two Years Before the Mass, by Richard Henry Dana, a story which has brought reading excitement to six generations of American boys and girls. And so, Adventure Ahead! <laughs> It was 1844, and the first time that I ever saw the Pilgrim, I knew she was the ship for me. Because in all of Boston Harbor, she had the finest lines, the deepest draft, and masts that almost scraped the sky. Yes, the Clipper Pilgrim seemed the answer to my dream. The largest, tallest, most seaworthy ship that I had ever seen. And even though I'd never been to sea and hardly knew my way around a deck, I climbed aboard to find the captain. You looking for somebody? Well, uh, yes, I am. I want to speak to the captain. Not after a job, are you? A berth? Yes, sir. She's a fine ship. Maybe. Well, there's worse ships afloat in the Pilgrim, and there's better ones, too. What do you mean? You'll find out soon enough if Captain Taylor finds you on. Do you think he'll take me? I've I never been to sea. It won't make much difference this trip. Pilgrim's due to sail tonight, and we need men. You look strong enough, husky. You can learn. We'll make a sailor out of you. Why, you might be first mate by the time we sail back home again. Well... Thank you, Mr. Uh, my name's Harris. Save the mister for the office. I'm just one of the crew. All right, Harris. You'll find Captain Taylor aft. Aft? Need men to fill out the crew. I expect he'll be glad to see you. So, you want to sail before the mast, eh, lad? Yes, Captain. Yeah, you're kind of young. Any experience? I want to learn, sir. I'm not afraid to work. Yeah, you seem mighty anxious to sign aboard. Yes, sir, I am. Know where we're bound for? Well, uh, uh, no, sir. California, that's where. Know what that means? It's a long ways off, sir. Why, it may be a year or two years before we sail into Boston Harbor again. Makes no difference, Captain. I want to go to sea. Mm. I like the cut of your jib, lad. Thank you, Captain Taylor. You'll be kind of an apprentice seaman to start out, what we call a soldier. But the crew will show you the rope. Won't take you long to get the drift of sailing. No, sir. Keep your eyes and ears open, Dana. And obey the orders of the mate. The mate, sir? Yeah. First mate, Mr. Raggett. Yes, sir. Take your gear and go along now. Report to Mr. Raggett. A new man, eh? Yes, Mr. Raggett. Ever been a sea, Dana? No, sir. Ah, a landlubber. Please, sir, I want to be a sailor. All I'll right, try to work... Dana, none of your jaw. When I talk, lend an ear, understand? Yes, sir. Starting off as bad as the rest of the crew. How does the captain expect me to run this ship with a bunch of shoe clerks, cherry pickers, landlubbers? McCabe! Mr. McCabe! Hi, sir. Hi, Nick. Here's a new man, McCabe. 
Give him a bunk in the postal. All right, Nick. Dana here thinks he wants to be a sailor. Yes, sir. But I'll take that out of him by the time we're on the horn. Hey, we all love her. Work that way, Nick. Oh, did we, Mr. McKay? Aye. And who asked for your opinion? Well, I only... Don't forget, you're just the second mate on this ship, McKay. When I want your opinion, I'll ask. But I only wanted Shut to... Up. I don't like a man that talks a lot, McCabe. I'll make you wish you never sailed aboard the Pilgrim. <laughs> Dana, your gear all stowed away? Oh, hello, Harris. Yeah, I'm all ready. You think we'll sail soon? Sometime tonight, the wind comes up. Oh. Say, you better get some sleep, Dana. After we get underway, you'll be busy climbing around the rigging most of the night. I'm too excited to sleep. <laughs> After a few months, you'll be glad to take your sleep when you can get it. Especially aboard this ship. What do you mean, Harris? When you've been around... Oh, hey, well, Dana, this is it. You mean we're underway? Hi, get a move on. Here's where you learn to spread canvas. The sails were loose, the yards were braced, and the clipper pilgrim was on her way, leaning from the damp night breeze and rolling with a heavy ground swell. Oh, everything seemed beautiful that night as we sailed into the dark Atlantic bound southward for Cape Horn and California. But in the morning, things didn't seem so beautiful. With all the crew on deck, the day started off with a few words from the captain and Mr. Agat. Welcome to the Clipper Men. Some of you are old hands. You know the work I want. And the new men will manage fine if you obey the officers. That's me, the first mate, Mr. Agat, and second mate, Mr. McCabe. All right, take over, Mr. Agat. All right, stow the gas. You didn't sign aboard the Pilgrim for no pleasure cruise. I expect every man jack of you to work. And after that, work harder. Obey orders, do your duty. Fair well enough. But if you don't, I'll break the man that crosses me, understand? All right, stop and watch on deck. Rest of you below. <laughs> From that day on, our work seemed never to cease, for there was always work to do aboard a sailing ship, rigging to be examined, continually replaced, sails to be mended, and ropes or yards repaired, taking off, mending, putting on, taking off, mending, putting on. There's no rest for those at sea, regardless of the weather. It was difficult to learn at first, the scheme of things aboard a full-rigged clipper, but the crew helped me in every way. I never will forget Tom Harris's advice to me before I went aloft among the sails. First time. It's not hard, Dana. Keep one hand for yourself, one for the ship, and never spit the wind. The winds blew up and down the pilgrim's deck. Days grew into weeks and months. But there was always work to do. More work and still more work. Our Mr. Raggett thought of that. Washing down the deck, rubbing, holy stone, oiling up the rigging, racing rust, mending sails. The ship was like a lady's watch, never in repair. One afternoon, when the weather was bright and we stood well off the coast of Brazil with a strong wind at our stern, move along, trim the top rope, bring in your boom. You, Dana Harris, I said, quite right along, toil up this rigging. I said, look aloft there, I want to see you slug at work, at work, from skin to sign. What are we to see the rigging, you boom? Well, Dana. Look Three months of this. What do you think of sea life now? Well, it's hard enough work, Harris, but I don't mind. I, uh, I'll get used to it, I suppose. No, Dana. As long as Mr. Raggett's aboard, none of the crew will get used to this driving, driving. Well, you shipped with him before, haven't you? Aye, many times. Hard work and never a kind word. Well, what about the captain? He's hardly ever up on deck. Doesn't he know the mate's just stirring trouble? I doubt it. Captain Taylor trusts the mate, I'm sure of that. And... Since the captain's sick so much, well, someone has to take command. The captain's sick in his cabin most of the time. What's wrong with Captain Taylor? I don't know. No one knows, I guess, except Dr. Agate. Dr. Agate? I... Does he know about medicine? I suppose his cabin's full of jars and bottles. Well, does that make him a medical man? Well, he's the maid. He keeps the medicine chest. Well, I hope then is I never get sick on this voyage. Well, none of Agate's cures or remedies for me either. All I need to keep me ship shape is my good luck charm. <laughs> as long as I have this, I'm safe. Can I see it? Hi. The lucky elephant. Yeah. Oh, 
An, an ivory elephant. Where'd you get it, Harris? India, four years ago. Oh, I'll uh, give it to you, Dana. Someday, uh, when I quit the sea. I'd like to have it, but that'll be a long time waiting. <laughs> Wind's up, Dana. Hi, squally off the starboard. Dirty weather on the way, all right. Getting near Cape Horn. Uh, won't be many days. Oh, here's McCabe. <laughs> he looks sad. Aye. What's wrong, McCabe? Aye, oh, it's Agar again. I just had another set two with him. Oh? He's been after me ever since we left Boston. Aye, I'm afraid of him. What are you afraid of? I don't know. He might do anything. As long as the first mates are running this ship, we're headed straight for trouble. <laughs> And so it went. As we neared the horn, Mr. Agate seemed more and more in charge, the keeper of our destiny. And we scarcely ever saw the captain. But by that time, the spring storms of October broke upon us. And we were busy hauling, furling canvas to keep the ship upright on course through tempest gales and freezing, icy rain. Day after night after day, we plunged through mountainous waves, driven westward through the straits by savage, lashing gales. We were on deck, on watch continuously, furling sails, tying broken yards and spars, drenched by rain and snow and sleet and hail, and waves that tried to wash us over. Dana! Dana! Hi! Slack off, Harris! Huh? Against the head pump! Here's another! <laughs> Steady on! Right. There he caught me. Been below deck? Stay out of it. Everything's a wash, Dana. Bill, all over. Look out! Another! Are we shipping water? No. Pilgrim's built for worse than this. It's McCabe. Easy on there. Careful, does it? Oh, what a night, eh? Rough night. Let me up that rigging, Harris. Where are you going? Up the mainland. Why are you deaf? Order. Royal Yard. Get it away. But in this weather. You can't climb a rock, McCabe. Have to order. Who's ordered? First mate. Mr. Haggard says I go along. So I go along. All right, I'll do. He'll never make it. Not in this scale. Hold on. Watch it. <laughs> there he is. Still climbing aloft. Can't we, can't we do something? Not it, not it, Dan, especially when it comes from Mr. Rack. How can he hold on in this wind? Not the heave of the ship. Look out. out. He's slant. He's falling. <laughs> Cave was lost. There was nothing we could do to save him. Four days later, when the Cape Storm blew itself away, Harris and I were talking. He ordered the Cape up in the rigging. Mr. Raggett ordered him along. What do you mean, Harris? I think he tried to kill McCabe. I wonder. <laughs> Dana were on deck that night. They saw it happen. The mate ordered McCabe aloft. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wait, man! Would an officer in his right mind order a man aloft like that? He certainly would not. But the mate's mad, he is. Hi, he's mad. Well, men, what are we going to do about Mr. Agar? We can't do a thing. Huh? What's that, Dana? There's nothing to be done, men. Well, can't we go to Captain Taylor? No, it wouldn't do any good. Why, what do you mean, Dana? We don't know a thing for certain. And Captain Taylor, sick or well, has faith in Mr. Raggett. But if the mate is really mad... That's not for us to say. Why not? Why can't we take the law in our own hands? Yeah, that's, that's mutiny, men! And at sea, mutiny's never the answer to the troubles of a crew. You better think it over. <laughs> With fresh, strong wind behind us, we sailed on northward, up along the coast of South America, past Chile, Panama, Mexico, closer, drawing closer to our goal of California. And throughout the long five months of travel, we suffered neath the stinging lash of Mr. Agate's vicious tongue. From dawn to dusk, he screamed at us, threatened us, and swore at us. And when the good ship Pilgrim anchored at our destination, San Diego, and our voyage halfway through, the worst, we hoped, was over. And we celebrated with a shore leave. Our first since leaving Boston as the crew was emptied of her cargo and the holes refilled with cattle hide. And then, in April, we set sail again, bound for the Cape 
and home. The pilgrim was going back to Boston, and we were going home. We thought the mate might change, but he was no different than before. He managed everything, and ranted, roared, and raved. He didn't have a friend aboard the ship. Coming off watch one afternoon, I brushed with Mr. Agate just after he'd left the captain's cabin. Oh, excuse me, sir. What are you doing here, Dana? Why, why nothing, sir. I'm going forward to my bunk. Well, get along in. Stay away from this cabin. I don't want none of you swabs even getting near Captain Taylor. Understand? Watch, Dana. I... You look like somebody jarred your compass. I just fell foul of the mate. Oh, in today, huh? I'm glad you went to drift to Mr. Agate this time. Outside Captain Taylor's cabin. Oh, giving the old man medicine, I guess. How is the captain? Well, no one knows but the mate. The old man hasn't been out of his cabin since we left California. He's been in there alone nearly two months. Except for Mr. Agate. Aye. Except for Mr. Agate. Strict orders of the mate. Nobody goes inside. The cabin door is most always locked. Captain Taylor must be very sick. We have to take the mate's word, Dana. He knows more about medicine than anyone else aboard. Maybe he knows too much. You know, Harris, mm. I'm curious about that cabin. What do you mean? Do you suppose someone could get inside and find out about Captain Taylor? Talk to him alone? Why, I, I don't know, Dana. I mean, is the cabin door always locked? Well, most of the time, yes, but who dare to go inside against the mate's orders? I might. What? You? I'm curious about that cabin, Harris. I'd take the chance. But the mate, he'd kill you if he found you there. Aye, he would that. But it's worth a try. If you and the crew will help me, I have a plan. Of course we'll help you, Dana. We must get word to the captain. Tell him about the ship and the mate. It's our only chance. We must get word to the captain. Careful now. The mate, huh? Here he comes, careful. Uh, Mr. Agate. Well, well, what do you swabs want? We, uh, we're, uh, having trouble binding these spars. Huh? We can't lash them tight enough, mister. Let me have a look. There. Ah. Well, this rope's too wet, see? Uh, aye, aye. You two call yourselves sailors. Huh? You use some dry rope like this. Make a bite, circle around twice. Captain Taylor? Yeah. Yeah. What do you want? I thought that door was locked. I, uh, I'm sorry to bother you, sir. But I have to talk to you. You see, I... That is, we of the crew didn't know how well you were, sir. And we wanted... Crew? You speak for the crew? Aye, sir. Mr. Agate tells me the crew is going to mutiny. You're dissatisfied with your work. Mutiny? That's what he says. Oh, no, Captain. Eh? We, uh, well, we're not exactly satisfied with Mr. Agate's way of running the ship in your absence. But we're all working, sir. Working hard. There'll be no mutiny. But, but he told me. The mate. It's not true, Captain Taylor. Believe me, sir, I speak for all the crew. Well, well why did the mate tell me that? Mutiny is a serious charge. Aye, sir, it is. Nothing strange about all this, lad. What he's been telling me. Why, I... I oh, uh, can, uh, can I help you, sir? It's... It's just my complaint. Uh, uh, tell me the medicine, lad. Medicine? Tablet. Out the tablet. Oh. You see, Captain? Hey, right, lad. And some water. Why, what's wrong, lad? Sir. These tablets. Eh? Huh? Did... Did Mr. Agate give you these? Aye, lad. And you've been taking them? For the last two months. I'm a sick man, lad. Of course, sir, I understand. But if I may ask, sir, do you really feel better after taking these? Well, uh, no, not so much. Mr. Agate says if I don't take the tablets, I might feel worse. The mate told you that, sir. Aye. Captain... I have a suspicion that all isn't right. What's that, lad? These tablets. What you talking about? Captain Taylor, speaking for the crew, I'd like to tell you about the way the ship's been run since you've been locked in here. All right, lad. 
The mate wasn't wrong when he said we talked about mutiny. But we had a reason, sir. And that's what I want to tell you. Last resort, sir. We agreed that I should come and tell you about these things. We thought you'd want to know, Captain. It's incredible. Incredible, lad. I've wondered about the mate. And this explains a lot of things to me. But what can I do, lad? I'm too weak to leave this bed. What can I do? Well, if I may suggest, sir... Aye, lad. First of all, stop taking these tablets, sir. I don't know what they are, but I'd stake my life they're harmful. But if I stop, lad, uh, I may get worse. Well, possibly... I'll chance it. Crew and my ship mean more to me in life. I'll chance it. We need you, sir, to take control of the ship again. That'll be the day, lad. If the scheme works... It must work, Captain Taylor. You must come back and take command. We're five or six weeks off Cape Horn. And in the dead of winter, we can never sail around without you, sir. The captain followed our advice and slowly came around to health again. Lots of exercise. And when he was hungry, we sneaked him bully beef and biscuit. All unknown to Mr. Agatha. though. And then, one day in June, Captain Taylor left his cabin, came on deck, quite suddenly, surprising all the crew at work. But most of all, surprising Mr. Agate. Faster! Faster, you slugs! What I need is a black snake whip! That makes you move along! Did you say something about a whip, Mr. Agate? Huh? Why, why, Captain? Uh, surprised to see me, eh, mate? You! You, sir! You shouldn't be up! Oh, no! Why not, Mr. Agate? Why, your health, sir! My health? I, I never felt better. Your uh, cure was real good, Mr. Agate. I feel fine. Oh, you do? Well, you got no right up here. No? Then why not? I've earned my right to run this ship. Oh? I've been running a pilgrim for the last three months and before that. So I understand. And I can sail her into Boston myself. Oh, can you now, Mr. Agus? And nobody will stop me. No? Well, I can stop you, Mr. Mate. You've been running things too long aboard my ship. You made several big mistakes. First, when you tried to poison me. Huh? And then when you didn't recognize men, real men, these men, your crew. The crew? But they were going There's to... not a better crew on any ocean, Mr. Agate. You might learn a lot by watching them. They're mutiny. What it about It seems to me, Mr. Mate, that if anybody is guilty of insurrection and taking over the control of a ship, it's you, Mr. Mate, and nobody else. Yes, sir. Yes, Captain. If I didn't need every man jack aboard ship to get around the horn, I'd toss you in the brig, Mr. Mate. So you're on good behavior. And if you make good, I'll forget about the charges I mean to bring against you, mate. Aye, sir. Watch your step, Mr. Agate. And don't be asking any man, Jack, to do a job you wouldn't do yourself. Oh, hey, oh, Captain Taylor, there's a bow headed out of the south, sir. Aye, lad. First of the Cape Storms. You'll have them all the time from now on. Short turn sail! Man the clothing! Man, the Cloland! It's getting dark, sir, in the southeast. Aye. Aye, it'll be rough and heavy through the straits this time of year. Aye, sir. Mr. Raggart! Aye, sir. Aye, Captain. You think you can manage to help us out? Aye, sir. On your way, then, mate. But I'd advise you, watch your step. We'd prepared for winter weather, but we never expected the heavy storms that lashed our ship from stem to stern as we went around the Cape. The worst of all the storms struck late one night when I'd come up on watch. The great ship rolled and pitched and wallowed in a heavy sea, driven blindly eastward by a gale of rain and sleet and snow. It was all a man could do to keep his feet upon the wet and slippery decks. Dana! Dana! Aye, sir! Aye, Captain! Uh, easy on there, lads. Aye, sir! Harry's with you. Right here, Captain. Good. She's rough tonight, lads. Aye, she's heavy. You lash the longboat? Aye, aye, sir. Now, oh, hold on. Here comes a tall one. Hey. Hey. Uh, lift the rigging holes. We'll weather through. Every spar yard on flash down, sir. That's right, Captain. Uh, we'll hope for the best, lads. Uh, have you seen the mate, Mr. Agard? It's along the deck, Captain. Oh. Belay, mate! Mr. Agard! Light along, Mr. Agard! Aye, Captain. You want it, mate? Aye, Mr. Agard. All snug aft. Aye, Captain. Took another turn of lashing around. Uh, uh. Stop, Mr. 
down, sir. Hey! She's down all right. Drag it loose. Yeah, she's liable to break off, saving the deck. Somebody ought to go aloft. Please, flash her down against the mast. But it's dangerous. A man can't climb up in this wind. Let's see. But she's got to be lashed. Can't be done, Captain. Not in this weather. No worse than night. You sent McCabe along. What did you say, Harry? You heard him, Mr. Raggett. You sent McCabe up in weather as bad as this. Well, oh, you're going to order aloft this time, Mr. Raggett. Well, I... Uh... That top mare's got to be mended, mate. You going aloft yourself? Me? No. No, I won't. No. It's death for the man that tries... But you ordered McCabe aloft, didn't you? I won't. It's death. Certain death. All right, Mr. Raggett. You've had your chance to make good, and you failed. I don't care. I won't go up. I won't. I won't. No. No, Captain Taylor. Hey, Dana. I'll go aloft, sir. Yes. I'll go up. You? She must be lashed down, sir. I think I can do the Hush. job. It's a long chance, Dana. I know, Harris. But I'll try it. I may, Captain. Well, I'm not ordering you, Dana. But if you think you can make it... Aye, sir. Then go aloft, Dana. And best of luck. Thank you, sir. The wind's bitter. The rope's icy. Be careful, lads. Watch your step, Dana. I'll be careful. I think we'll make a play. Hey. I don't know, Harris. Mr. Raggett! Aye, sir. Keep your eye on young Dana, doing the job you're afraid to do. Climbing higher. Higher. Up and up I climb, hand over hand upon the icy ropes and rigging. Sleet and rain beat down and splashed my face. The whole ship lurched suddenly. It escaped me into the sea. It seemed like hours until my frosted, bleeding hands had lashed the rope like a man. I started down to deck again. Here he is, sir. Here's Dana. Oh, easy, lad, easy. Hi, Captain. Hey, give me a hand, Dana. I'll help you. I. You lash her down tight, lad. Hi, Captain. As good as McCabe might have done himself. Watch it, another one. <laughs> You're a brave lad, Dana. A brave lad. Agus! Mr. Agus! Hey, sir. Hi, Captain. You call yourself a mate? Take a look at a real seaman. And I want to tell you men, members of my crew, that I know what you went through under the rule of Mr. Agate. And he'll stand trial for his misdeeds when we get to Boston. <laughs> Since Mr. Agate's in the brig, that leaves us without a first mate. And since young Dana had the most to do with bringing Mr. Agate to justice, I'd like for Richard Dana to be first mate of the Pilgrim till we get to Boston. Well, congratulations, Mr. Dana. I, I don't know what to say, Harris. You should have been the one to get the first mate's birth. Well, you earned it, Dana. I didn't. <laughs> I uh, guess your good luck white elephant wasn't working this time. Oh, huh? uh, one thing more, man. Mr. Agate won't be drawing his salary down in the bridge. So I propose to divide it up equally among the crew. I expect you can use the extra money when we get to Boston. <laughs> when we get to Boston. Ah, those were magic words to us who had been away from home so long. And the last weeks and days went quickly. After two long years at sea. Two years at sea. Well, Mr. Dana. <laughs> All right, Harris. Now that we're sailing into Boston Harbor, you can drop the formality. Oh? Huh? Why? Well, in a few hours, I won't be first mate. And the pilgrim and our long voyage will just be a memory. Well, in that case, Dana, here's a good luck piece I'd like to give you. You know, the tiny elephant you always liked? Oh, yes, but here, Dana. little souvenir. Oh, thank you. Little souvenir of our trip together. Two years before the match. This story of two years before the mass, suggested by Richard Henry Dana's classic of that name, was written by Tom Goutte and was the first in NBC's new series, Adventure Ahead. Young Dana was played by John Thomas. Music was by Doc Whipple. The entire production was directed by Joseph Mansfield. During the weeks to come, as each Saturday morning unfolds Adventure Ahead, you will meet a gallery of heroes and heroines who appeal to youthful-minded listeners of every age. From the pages of books and stories, 
both old and new, your adventures will come to life, engaging in their exploits solely for your pleasure. NBC and its affiliated independent stations present Adventure Ahead as a public service. This is the National Broadcasting Company. This episode from the life of Sherlock Holmes will be transmitted to our men and women overseas by shortwave and through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Petri Wine brings you... Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce in the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. The Petri family, the family that took time to bring you good wine, invites you to spend the next half hour listening to Dr. Watson tell us another exciting adventure he shared with his old friend, that master detective, Sherlock Holmes. And say, let me tell you something I found out just the other day. Steaks are really back again. Good, thick, juicy porterhouse steaks. Mm. That's for me. A thick, tender steak on the rare side, together with a glass of Petri California Burgundy. You know, Petri Burgundy is a perfect mealtime wine. And with meat or any meat dish, it's the very last word in good eating. Honestly, when you taste the wonderful flavor of that rich red Petri Burgundy, you're tasting one swell example of the art of winemaking. It's full-flavored and just about the most delicious wine that ever poured from a bottle. Try it the next time you have steak or chops, or the next time you have hamburger or pot roast. Believe me, Petri Burgundy is the best friend a good meal ever had. And now let's look in on our good friend and host, Dr. Watson. Ah, there you are, Mr. Bartell. Evening, Doctor. Just in time to join me in a cup of coffee. Draw up your chair, young fellow, my lad. Thank you. Ah, that's it. Well, Doctor, you told us last week that tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure takes us to the south of France. That's right, Mr. Bartell. The south of France in the year 1900. A beautiful playground bordered by the bluest of blue seas and populated with an extraordinary cross-section of cosmopolitan Europe. Rich man, poor man, beggar man, thief. All of them attracted by that Riviera paradise. All of them drawn by the magical spell of a small white ball spinning round the rim of a roulette wheel. Now, don't tell me that you and the great Sherlock Holmes were there on a gambling spree. We were not, Mr. Bartell. <laughs> At the time my story begins, we had just concluded an extremely delicate mission. A mission, I may say, that uh, concerned the safety and good name of... Uh, a very prominent member of the royal family. Say, Doctor, you don't mean... Uh, one story at a time, Mr. Bartell. In any event, my boy, I'm afraid that's a case about which my lips are sealed for all time. But to return to tonight's adventure, one June evening, I persuaded Holmes to accompany me to the gambling casino at Fregius, not far from Cannes, where we were staying. It wasn't quite as fashionable as a casino at Monte Carlo, but as I intended to do a little modest gambling myself... It seemed an establishment more suited to my means. As we stood there at the green baize covered tables, the chatter of voices and the melodic chanting of the croupiers as they called the results of each spin of the wheel formed a background to a quiet conversation that Holmes and I were having. Lost again, Watson. Oh, confounded. That number 10 must come up soon. Oh, why not cut your losses, old fellow, and come for a stroll with me on the water? Well, just a big wake. A couple more bets, Holmes. I, I have a feeling that 10 is bound to come up in a minute. <laughs> Watson, I believe the blood of a gambler courses through your veins. Oh, there's no harm in taking a little flutter once in a while. Why don't you risk? a few francs, oh, huh? Oh, no, thanks you, my dear chap. The law of averages convinces me that my money is safer in my pocket. In any case, I'm a little dubious as to the integrity of this particular casino. Oh, huh? what makes you say that? Well, you will observe that this roulette wheel has a double zero. Most continental wheels have only a single one. 
would indicate that this house is extremely concerned with its percentage. Mesdames et messieurs, faites vos yeux. Oh, just two more turns of the wheel, Holmes, and I'll take that walk with you. Oh, you mustn't be here, Spielen. Why do you not play from the other side of the table? Why must you always stand next to me? Hello. The trouble up there. I've placed my bet, so, so let's go and see. I ask you, so why do you play here beside me? I'm afraid I don't see any reason why I can't play wherever I... Squish, you are, you've broken my luck. Ever since you come to the table, I've done nothing but lose. Please, to move away. I'll move away yourself if you don't like my company. Heinrich, why do you not stop now? You've already lost more than we can afford. One more throw in, sir. I can win it all back if only this young man will move away. Why should my husband move? He's had a bad run of luck, too. Rien ne va plus. Ne. Rouge, impériment. Ah, you've lost again, Watson. Heinrich, you must stop now. I must stop, Ilsa, because I've lost everything. I hope you're satisfied, Mr. American. You've broken my luck and ruined me. I hope that you and your turn will be ruined too. Heinrich! Heinrich, pay for me! I never heard such rubbish in my life. Were you listening to him, sir? I heard his last few remarks, Mr... Uh, Gilbert. Roger Gilbert. And this is my wife, Helen. How do you do? My name is Holmes, and this is my friend, Dr. Watson. How do you do? How do you do? Didn't you think his remarks were a little out of place, Doctor? <laughs> I certainly did, Mrs. Gilbert. I don't see how he can possibly blame your husband for his run of bad luck. I didn't like the look on his face as he left the table, though. Have you any idea who he is? His name is Schneeman. He's staying at the same hotel as we are. I've never spoken to him, but I've heard him being paged there. Well, he shouldn't gamble unless he can afford to lose. Well, I'm losing, darling, and I can't afford it. Oh, but I can let you have more money. You know that. Oh, no, Helen, I... I may have married an heiress, but I'm not going to use her fortune to gamble with. Oh. <laughs> I'll lose my own money, and then I'll quit. Mesdames et messieurs, take for Your last bit, Watson? Yes, Holmes. This time I know that number 10 is going to come up. It's got to. <laughs> I've lost again, darn it. Helen, this is my bad night. Well, why don't you stop now, dear? Holmes, I've made 350 francs. On this throw of the wheel, old fellow, but as you've lost some 500 francs doing it, I can't say that your profits stagger me. Oh, Mr. Holmes, <laughs> I can see that you're no gambler. I'm afraid not, Mrs. Gilbert. I didn't say that, Holmes. Uh, you may not like roulette. You've taken a good many chances in your life with long odds against you, too. Well, nevertheless, old chap, in the sense Mrs. Gilbert means it, I'm not a gambler. Oh, that's a good idea. Say, hey, what's the commotion over there? It's that German woman with a crowd forming around her. Yes, yes, the wife of that man that said I ruined him. Attention! Attention! Est-ce qu'il y a un docteur dans la salle? There must be trouble. He's asking for a doctor. A doctor? Come along, then. Will you excuse me, please? Thank you. Excuse me, madame. Mon ami, a doctor. Monsieur! What happened, Mother? It is my husband. Is he ill? I just found him lying out in the garden. Please come with me at once, gentlemen. Uh, of course we will, Madam. What seems to be the matter with him? Here, Doctor. I think he is dead. He's lying by that tree, Doctor. Please see if you can help him. Somebody else seems to be on the scene before us. Who are you, sir? I am Monsieur Chevray, director of the casino. Do any of you know this poor man? I am his wife. Is he... is he dead? I... I am afraid so, madame. Let me look at him. I'm a doctor. Was your husband gambling in the casino tonight, madame? Yeah, he was. Poor Heinrich. He lose everything that we have. I'm afraid he's dead, madame. Shot through the heart. Oh, do leap a cut. Suicide, Watson? Yeah, looks like it. Mm. Yes. Powder burns on the shirt front. Revolver clutched in the right hand. Fingers in a natural position. The angle of the wound settles it. Obviously self-inflicted. I missed you as you slipped out of the casino. What's wrong with him? I'm afraid he's dead, Mr. Gilbert. Yes, he committed suicide. I hope, young man, that you are satisfied. All night you brought him bad luck. He asked you to move away from him to change his luck, but no, you could not do it. Oh, Frau Schneeman, I'm terribly sorry, but I really don't see how you can blame me. I do blame you, and I also blame you, Monsieur Chevry. Me? But what have I done, madame? Why do you let a man lose all his money at your tables? Is life so cheap to you, and money so important that you cannot close the tables to someone before he's ruined? Madame, I am all sympathy for you in your tragic loss. But the casino cannot be held responsible. 
If your husband could not afford to gamble, then he should not come here. How are we to know the financial limitations of, uh, of our customers? You said that your husband lost everything you had tonight, madam. Yeah, everything. Then how do you account for this sheaf of banknotes in his breast pocket? Good Lord, must be several thousand francs, sir. Then he wasn't ruined. And his suicide, therefore, cannot be blamed on his losses at my casino, madame. How do you account for this money, Frau Schneemann? Well, I do not understand. Heinrich kept nothing from me. I know that he had not so much money on him when he started tonight. Uh, well, why do you all look at me like that? Is it that you think? You think... Quick, why isn't she fainted? I've got her. We must, must get her to her room. You can take her to my suite in the casino. No, let's take her to the hotel. My wife will look after her. Poor woman, she's had a dreadful shock. She can probably do with another woman's company. That's very considerate of you, Mr. Gilbert. Where are you staying? At the Hotel Crayon. It's quite near here. I'll get a cabin while I'm doing that, Watson. See if you can revive her, will you? Jesus then we'll God. take her to the Hotel Crayon. It's very kind of you, Mrs. Gilbert, to let us bring the poor lady into your suite. Well, it's the least I can do, in spite of what she said about Roger bringing her husband bad luck. Oh, I'm sure she'll need your help when she wakes up, Helen. Yes, I think you'll find that she'll sleep for some hours. I give her a strong sedative. Well, we were just about to have a drink, gentlemen. Do you care to join us? Oh, thank you, sir. Well, that'd be very nice, Mr. Gilbert. Roger was just telling me that quite a large sum of money was found on Herr Shaman's body, Mr. Holmes. Uh, yes, Mrs. Gilbert. Several thousand francs. It's very puzzling, Holmes. Why should a man commit suicide with so much money on him? I think the answer is obvious. He didn't. What on earth do you mean? Well, the money was placed there after he had shot himself. The banknotes were in his breast pocket, if you remember. Hard to the usual place to carry money. Though it is the easiest pocket for someone to insert it without disturbing the body. But why on earth should someone place money on him after his suicide? Prevent the casino from getting a bad name. I've heard of it being done on several similar occasions. Gives the impression that the unfortunate victim had other motives than gambling losses to account for his suicide. Great, Scott. You mean that one of the casino employees found the body lying there and slipped the money in his breast pocket before we arrived on the scene? As you know, my dear Watson, I'm not a gambling man, but I'll lay you a hundred to one. That is what happened. Well, that's a new one. Well, here are your drinks, gentlemen. Oh, thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Say, Helen, Mr. Holmes has given me a brainwave. Another one? What is it this time, Roger? Now, I've been losing very heavily tonight. Roger, no. I've told you. If you need money, I'll be only... But I don't. I've got a scheme for making some. Oh. I'm going to gamble again tonight after dinner. If I lose, here's what I'll do. I'll stain my shirt front with red ink. Walk out in the grounds, fire a shot, and lie down as though I'm dead. I'll wait for someone to come along and stuff my pockets full of banknotes. <laughs> not, not a bad idea, Mr. Gilbert. I think it's a darn good one. What do you say, Mr. Holmes? Uh, it's a whimsical one at any rate. Who knows? You might even be successful. Roger, you're not really going to do it, are you? Sure. Perhaps I'll get some of my losses back that way. <laughs> well, let's drink to it, gentlemen. At least I may have hit upon an idea of making money. <laughs> Dear Watson, you'll have to work hard at your practice when you get back to England. Your infallible system appears to be extremely fallible. And yet the fellow who told me about it said it couldn't miss. It's just a matter of doubling the stakes each time you lose oh, and then... Oh, my dear fellow, I've been studying your system. But I can tell you a really infallible way of making money at roulette. You can? What is it? Well, own the gambling house and operate the tables yourself. The odds would be all in your favor. Oh, what a brilliant suggestion. Own the gambling house and operate the tables not gambling for tonight, Watson? It's nearly 11 o'clock. No, yeah, I think so. Let's take a stroll round the other table, shall we? By the way, old fellow, the young American, Mr. Gilbert, was losing heavily again tonight. He was? I wonder if he'll try that trick that he threatened, the one with the red ink and the shot in the night. I shouldn't be at all surprised. As a matter of uh, interest, I saw him leave the tables about half an hour ago. Shh, shh, shh. Here comes his wife on the arm of Monsieur Chevry, the director of the casino. I agree with you. Good evening, Mrs. Gilbert. Monsieur? Bonsoir, monsieur. Hello, Mr. Holmes, Dr. Watson. Monsieur Chevrolet is giving me a personally conducted tour of the casino. It's quite fascinating. And uh, it is quite fascinating for me to have so beautiful a woman on my arm, <laughs> mademoiselle. 
I know that I am the envy of all the men in the room. Oh, stop <laughs> flattering me so much. I'm not used to it. Mrs. Gilbert, how is, um, Frau Schneemann? She seems much better. She wakened an hour ago and insisted on going back to her own room. I wanted her to spend the night with us in our suite, but she wouldn't hear of it. I think I should drop in and see her before I go to bed. Oh, you have finished the gambling for tonight, perhaps, Doctor? Well, no, perhaps about it, Monsieur Chevry. I've had a bad run at the tables. Oh, I am so sorry. Has anyone seen Roger? He left the tables about half an hour ago, Mrs. Gilbert. After doing as I did and losing quite heavily. So he lost again, did he? I wonder if he'll try that uh, new system he was talking about. <laughs> we were just discussing that possibility ourselves, Mrs. Gilbert. Mrs. Gilbert! Mrs. Gilbert! Frau Schneemann, you shouldn't have left your hotel, you know. It is too late to worry for me, Herr Doctor. It is for Mrs. Gilbert now that you should worry. What do you mean, madame? Well, I went back just now to where poor Heinrich died. And there, lying in the grass, I saw another body. I was too shocked to go too close. But I am quite sure that I recognize your husband, Mrs. Gilbert. Oh, Dr. Watson, she's ruined Roger's trick. And he'll have taken fright and bolted by the time we get there. Watson, maybe let's go at once and find out, shall we? He, he hasn't gone. He's, he's still lying there. It's a most convincing spectacle. That red ink really does look like blood. Yes. And blood sometimes looks like red ink. Mr. Gilbert. Roger, get up. The joke's spoiled. Roger, get up. I'm afraid that's impossible, Mrs. Gilbert. He's dead. Dr. Watson's story will be continued in just a second, which is all the time I need to tell you that the easiest way I know to transform a simple meal into a feast is to serve that meal together with Petri California Sauterne. Petri Sauterne is a delicate white wine that's the perfect companion for chicken or turkey. Turkey, ah, yes. Turkey and Petri Sauterne. That's the heart of any Thanksgiving dinner. Look, why not make this Thanksgiving dinner the best one you ever had? Give it the air of a banquet. Serve it with Petri Sauterne. And when you buy that Sauterne or any wine for your Thanksgiving dinner, whatever you do, look for the letters P-E-T-R-I. Because a Petri wine is always a good wine. Well, Doctor, so the young American's joke turned out to be another tragedy. Yes, Mr. Bartell. The poor fellow was lying there dead with a bullet wound in the heart and a great splash of blood staining the whiteness of his shirt front. What happened next? Monsieur Chevry, director of the casino, took the distraught widow away from the scene while Holmes and I examined the body closely. Within a few minutes, we were joined by Inspector uh, Ganivet of the French police. As we stood there in the moonlight, the sounds of music could be heard from the casino. It was hard to believe that two men had died in that lovely garden since the moon had risen. <laughs> Monsieur Holmes, you and Dr. Watson have concluded your examination. Yes, Inspector Ganivet. Will you favor me with your observations? You say that you are certain that this is not another suicide? I'm sure of it, Inspector. Look at the wound. The bullet entered the body at a direct right angle, whereas a self-inflicted shot is always fired obliquely. Yes, that is so. Then uh, you suggest that this man was shot from above as he lay on the ground pretending to be dead. I'm convinced of it. Why, Monsieur Holmes? Well, for two reasons. Though it's impossible to be sure without a laboratory test, I'm certain that beneath those blood stains are stains of red ink. Look for yourself, Inspector. Mm -hmm. Yes, indeed it does look like it. What is your other reason for being certain that this man was shot as he lay here pretending dead? I'll show him the banknotes, Watson. Uh, here you are, Inspector. We found them stuffed in his breast pocket. So, banknotes with a bullet hole through the middle of them. Very illuminating. Uh, tell me, gentlemen, how many people knew of this, uh, this little plot you have told me about, this plan of the dead man's to pretend to be shot? Just three people, Inspector, Dr. Watson, myself, and Mrs. Gilbert. Hello, then the answer is obvious. You and your friend are innocent. It must be the wife who killed him. No one else knew of the plot. Mm, I'm not so sure of that. Frau Schneemann, the dead German's widow, was in the next room when Gilbert told us about his plan. She might have heard, though I could swear that she was asleep. I gave her a very strong sleeping draught. 
From what you have told me of her husband's suicide, she might easily have had a motive for murdering this oh, man. Oh, come, 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 gentlemen. Surely it's obvious who murdered Mr. Gilbert? Who, Monsieur? Well, it's certainly one of the two widows. Since there seems to be some doubt in your minds, I suggest we return to the casino. I can promise you the answer to your question within a very few minutes. <laughs> Monsieur Chevray, now that we're all assembled in your office, I shall sit down quietly and let Inspector Ganivet conduct his examination. No, 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 Monsieur Holmes. No, you have handled the case so far. Please to cons continue it to the end. Yes, Monsieur Holmes. I should appreciate it. On behalf of the casino. Very well, gentlemen. It won't take me long. Frau Schneemann. Ja, Herr Holmes. Uh, what time did you leave your hotel tonight? Well, I do not know what time it was. Well, what made you leave it? Well, I could not sleep. I knew that they had taken poor Heinrich's body away, but I felt that I must walk back there. It was the last place I saw him alive. How close did you come to Mr. Gilbert's body when you saw it lying there? Oh, close enough to see who it was. Then I ran into the casino to tell his wife I knew what had happened. How did you know? You say you uh, didn't come close to the body. I could tell by every line of the body as it lay there. I could tell because I knew that poor Heinrich's death would not be avenged. Thank you, Frau Schneemann. That will be all. You may go. Oh, Monsieur Holmes, she has no alibi. Surely you should stop her. If I'm to conduct this investigation, I must do it in my own way. Pardon, Monsieur Holmes. Please continue. Uh, you may go, Frau Schneemann. Mrs. Gilbert? Yes, Mr. Holmes. Where were you prior to our meeting in the casino tonight, just before we discovered your husband's body? After I left the hotel, I walked over here along the seafront. Can anyone verify that statement? I suppose not. I didn't meet anyone that I knew. And what did you do when you arrived at the casino? I played a little chemin d'affaire. A few moments later, Monsieur Chevrolet came over to the table and asked if he might escort me over the club. Ten minutes after that, we walked into you and Dr. Watson. That is quite true, Monsieur Holmes. I can swear to it. Thank you, Mrs. Gilbert. I'm sorry to distress you with these questions. You may go. I'll wait outside, Mr. Holmes. I must know what happened. Wait for me there, madame. I shall join you in a few minutes and escort you home. Ah, oh, well, another suspect for the poor alibi, alibi eh, Gallivet? I must say, Monsieur Holmes, your methods puzzle me. It seems to me that both those women should be watched. Yes, I agree with the inspector, Holmes. Please don't worry, inspector. I've asked two of your plain clothes men to keep an eye on the ladies. And now, Monsieur Chevre, I'd like to ask you a few questions. Ask me any questions you wish, Monsieur Holmes. Thank you. You will agree that it is the custom of the casino to put money on the bodies of suicides after their death. To give the impression that gambling, uh, gambling losses were not responsible for the tragedy. Well, I, I do not think... Oh, come now, Chevre. I know that is a fact as well as you do. Exactly. Now, on those rather gruesome occasions, whose responsibility is it to secrete the money? Yours? Or do you entrust the matter to an underling? I do it myself. I see. Did you place the money on Herr Schneemann tonight? Yes, monsieur, I did. And did you also perform the same service... On the body of Mr. Gilbert? No. I knew nothing of that death until a German lady, Frau Schneemann, come running into the casino. Excuse me interrupting, Monsieur. Uh, of course, Inspector. What is it? I think that you are wasting time. It is obvious that Madame Gilbert committed the crime. She knew of her husband's plot. She had no alibi and she had the motive. For is not uh, <laughs> marriage itself the greatest of all motives for murder? Oh, my dear Inspector. How very cynical. Madame Gilbert did not kill her husband. I know it. And what is your opinion, Watson? Well, it's a German woman. She had no alibi either. And remember, she was half mad with, with grief. Mr. Chevre, you say that you know Mrs. Gilbert is not guilty. How do you know? I was with her myself at the time the murder was committed. Oh, indeed. How very interesting. And what time was the murder committed? Well, it, it was... It, it was... Our investigations have never established what time the murder was committed, Monsieur Chevre. I'm afraid you've walked into my trap. You've given yourself away. Great, Scott Chevre, it was you. Chevre, I've known you a good many years, and this is going to be a hard thing to do. I am going to arrest you. Oh, no, you're not, Gennivet. Put down that revolver, sir. Do not be frightened, Doctor. I am not going to shoot you. Chevre, why did you murder Roger Gilbert tonight? Surely you know that too, Monsieur Holmes. Because I am in love with his wife. She's young, beautiful, and rich. It did not occur to me 
until I saw the young fool lying there tonight pretending to be dead. In my profession, it is natural that I should carry a revolver. What was simpler? Mr. Dilbert gave me the perfect opportunity. I, I could not resist it. Put down that revolver, Chevre. Why are you all so frightened? Surely you know how I am going to use it this time. I think so, monsieur. But it's a coward's way out. What an unperceptive remark for such a perceptive man. No. No, all my life I have been a gambler. I gambled tonight for the highest stakes of all, and... And I lost. No. No, I'm not afraid to pay for my losses. Au revoir, monsieur. <laughs> Extraordinary case, Holmes. I never suspected Chevre. And I, old chap, suspected him from the beginning. Well, I wasn't the only one who was stupid anyway. Inspector Ganivet thought it was the wife. True. Very puzzling conclusion for a detective inspector to arrive at. Well, it seemed logical enough to me at the no, time. No, 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 my dear Watson. Cold logic should have told you otherwise. Roger Gilbert had been losing heavily and had planned this hoax. He obviously had no money on him. Therefore, the money was planted in his pocket by Chevre. After he shot him? No, my dear fellow. Before. Before? The bullet hole through the banknotes provided that. Now, uh, had the money been put there innocently, Gilbert would have, um, well, you know, come back to life as soon as the person placing it there had left. He would not have remained lying on the ground for a murderer to find him. And Chevre must have bent over him as he lay there, placed the money in his breast pocket, and then fired. Precisely, Watson. Well, Holmes, I must say you solved it very neatly. And you've told Inspector Ganivet that you wanted no credit in the case. Naturally, uh, publicity would be unfavorable. If you remember, no one is supposed to know that we're in the south of France. <laughs> I'm certain that the inspector learned a few tips about detection tonight. Possibly, old fellow. <laughs> and I hope that uh, you have learned a few things about gambling. How do you mean, Holmes? Well, you're backing the wrong color. Hmm? A gambler is usually superstitious, and superstition... Well, I should have told you what color to follow tonight. I still don't understand you, Holmes. I was playing number ten. Exactly. Number ten is black. You should have followed a red color tonight, old fellow. The color of red ink. Red ink. And blood. <laughs> Hey, Doctor, that was a swell story. I didn't know you liked to play roulette. Well, you know, I, I figured out a system for roulette. It's like yours. Uh, every time you lose, you double your money and keep doubling until you win. Oh, it's a great system, Mr. Bartell. There's only one thing wrong with it. What's that? You lose, you go broke before you win. <laughs> look, 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 take, take my advice. Don't gamble. You can't beat the laws of chance. Uh, but suppose I bet on a sure thing. Like what, for instance? Oh, like the fact that Petri wine is always good wine. It is, you know. Because the Petri family has been making wine for generations. They've been handing down from father to son, from father to son, the art of turning luscious, sun-ripened grapes into delicious, fragrant wine. Ever since the Petri family started their business way back in the 1800s, they've been perfecting the art of winemaking. That's why Petri wine is always good wine. The Petri family took time to bring you good wine. So no matter what type of wine you prefer, why not take a few seconds of your time to look for the letters P-E-T-R-I. They spell delicious wine, Petri wine. Well, Dr. Watson, what new Sherlock Holmes story are you going to tell us next week? Next week, Mr. Bartell, I'm going to tell you of a strange adventure that Sherlock Holmes and I had when we were in Stratford-on-Avon many years ago. It concerns an actor... A mysterious boating accident and several dead butterflies. It sounds good, Doctor. I'll see you then. Oh, fine, but now, now, don't forget next week we're going to broadcast our program from the Paramount Theatre in Hollywood for the Victory Loan Drive. So if any of our friends are going to be in Hollywood, we'd love to see them there. Just buy a Victory Bond at any store or bank on Hollywood Boulevard and in return you will be given your ticket of admission. Better hurry up, though, before all the seats are gone. Let's really buy lots of those victory bonds. Let's finish the job.
Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure is written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher and was suggested by an incident in the Sir Arthur Conan Doyle story, A Study in Scarlet. Music is by Dean Fossler. Mr. Rathbone appears through the courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer and Mr. Bruce through the courtesy of Universal Pictures, where they are now starring in the Sherlock Holmes series. The Petri Wine Company of San Francisco, California, invites you to tune in again next week, same time, same station. This is Harry Bartell saying goodnight for the Petri family. Sherlock Holmes comes to you from our Hollywood studio. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Tonight, Columbia brings you as guest star, Hollywood's genial character actor, Stuart Irwin. The story is by the author of The Thin Man and the Maltese Falcon, Dashiell Hammett, one of America's acknowledged masters of the art of suspense. Suspense is compounded of mystery and intrigue and dangerous adventure. In this series are stories calculated to intrigue you to stir your nerves, to offer you a precarious situation, and then withhold the solution until the last possible moment. Tonight, for instance, Stuart Irwin plays for us a pleasant, easygoing assistant chief of police in a small town who, to everyone's surprise, was instrumental in solving a murder. We trust that with this tale we shall keep you in... Suspense. For suspense tonight, CBS presents Stuart Irwin in Two Sharp Knives by Dashiell Hammett. Shortly after 2 a.m., a poker game had just broken up at Ben Camdley's, the doctor coroner of Deerwood City. Scott Anderson, Deerwood's chief of police, and Wally Shane, his assistant, were standing. Where are we heading for, Scott? Let's walk across the street, Wally. Railroad station. Gee, aren't you afraid of the excitement, Chief? Don't you think that watching the 211 come in is apt to be too much for your blood pressure? Well, if it is, Wally, you can always carry on. You've been a pretty good imitation of an assistant to me for some time now. Yeah? Yeah. If anything happens to me, you'd be the chief. Don't worry. It won't be any harder for you to fool the public as chief. Hi, Elmer. Uh, howdy, Scott. Uh, hi, hello, Wally. Kind of late for you boys to be around, ain't it? No, I don't know. We sort of figured we'd put the town to bed tonight. How's the 211? On time? Right on the nose. She ought to be blowing for the bend in just about three seconds now. Yep. What'd I tell you? It's her now. Expecting anyone on her, Scott? No, Elmer, I'm not expecting anyone. Well, and I just thought we'd come over and watch you come in, that's all. You know, Elmer, you never can tell who might get off, though. Dick Turpin, Henry Morgan, Jesse James, Dick, Jack the Ripper, or six officers of Murder Incorporated, or even your Aunt Gussie. I guess you're right, Wally. Well, here she be. Pardon me, Jinx, but I gotta be rolling the wagon out to the baggage car. Well, I can't complain. I can't complain, Cap. Well, maybe you can, Elmer, but I sure can if you hold us up with that freight there. You got much more? Nope. This is the last piece now. There you are, Cap. All done. Okay. See you tomorrow, Elmer. Hey, Scott. Do you see what I see? I mean, do I see the man who just got off that train? The answer is yes. Well, he's a ringer for the guy we got a picture of. That is the guy. Well, then, what do we do now? We take him, Wally. My car's at the corner of the alley. But Scott... We'll tail him up the street. Okay, Scott. There he goes now, over toward the taxi stand. Come on. Let's follow him. Hello, Furman. Huh? All right. 
I don't believe You're I... You're Mr. Furman, aren't you? Yes, I am. Philadelphia? Yes. I'm Scott Anderson, chief of police. What? Chief of... What's happened to her? Happened to who? Oh, oh no, you don't. No. Let me go. Oh, no. You think you can pull that sort of okay. stuff with me? You're very much a crack at that mug. Oh, no, no, no. Wait a minute. No. Wait a minute, Hold gentlemen. it, Wally. Well, Furman? Well, I... I am sorry. For a moment there, I thought you weren't really a policeman. Thanks. It's nice to know I look almost human. Yes, it... It was silly of me. I'm... I'm sorry. Well, let's get going now before anything else happens. Okay, Furman, get in the car. I'll drive, Scott. Anyhow. I'll, uh, are you taking me to police headquarters? That's right. What for? Philadelphia? I, uh, I don't think I understand. You understand that you're wanted in Philadelphia for murder, don't you? Murder? Why, that's ridiculous. That's... Who told you that? Well, it's a cinch he didn't make it up. But wait, there, there must be... Take it easy stick. now. Just wait till we get down to headquarters. And I'll show you what I mean. Now then, here's the circular on Lester Furman. It was sent out by the Transamerica Detective Agency in Philadelphia. Take a look at it. Oh, uh. $1,500 reward for the arrest and conviction of Lester Furman, alias Lloyd Fields, alias J.D. Carpenter, for the... for the murder of Paul Frank Dunlap in Philadelphia on December 8th, 1942. Well? It's a lie. You're Furman, aren't you? Oh, yes, but... That's your picture on the circular, isn't it? Oh, yes, yes, but I... Well, I... Scott, I see you and Wally got Furman, huh? Oh, hello, George. Uh, you lucky stiffs. Now you two split a grand and a half reward. I uh, never seen nothing like it. You know, if it ain't vacations in New York at the city's expense, it's reward dough. Judge, someday, if you don't remember you're the jailer around here, not the DA, hmm? you're going to be wearing your teeth on the outside of your lips, and I'll be the guys who arrange them that way. Savvy? Uh, just because you caught a guy who's hot in Philadelphia. It's a lie. It's a frame-up. You can't prove anything. There's nothing to prove. I never killed anybody. I won't be framed. Take it I easy, won't be framed. Furman. Take it easy. You're wasting your breath on us. Save it for the Philadelphia police. We're just holding you for them. But it's not the police. It's the Trans-America Please Detective... turn you over to the Philadelphia police. Mr. Anderson, I... I... Well, then... Then there's nothing I can do now? There's nothing any of us can do till morning. You'll have to search you now, then we won't bother you anymore till they come for you. But I... Wally, you look through his bag. I'll see what he's got in his pockets. Okay, Scott. Well, all he's got on him are some business cards, a few letters, a hundred and... and dollars, a book of checks in the Philadelphia bank, and a few odds and ends. What's with the bag, Wally? Not much. A couple of changes of clothes, some toilet articles, and... Oh, here's a thirty-eight. Loaded. Pretty little thing, isn't it? Okay, put those things in what I got in the vault. All right, George. You can take Furman now and lock him up. This is the most ridiculous come thing Come on, I... darling, come on. We ain't had nobody in our little Husko for three days running. Hey, yeah? Uh, you'll have it all to yourself. Just like a sweet of the Ritz. But I... Come on, in you go. I tell you, 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 you're making a mistake. I demand to be allowed to get in touch with my lawyer. I... Hey, how about you boys cutting me in on a little of that blood money, huh? Oh, sure, George, sure. I'll forget all about that two and a half you've been owing me for three months. Mm -hmm. Make Furman as comfortable as you can, George. Take good care of him. He's valuable, huh? Yeah, now, if it was some bum that didn't mean a nickel to you... George, any day now, I'm going to forget that your uncle is county chairman and throw you back in the gutter just to see how high he'll bounce. Remember that. Oh, Scott, I, I didn't mean nothing. That's I... all, George. Never mind the rest. I'm going home now. If anything's urgent, I can reach there. But get this. I don't want to be disturbed. Unless it is urgent. Hello. Hello. Scott. This is Wally. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, well, what, what, what time is it? It's five after six in the morning, and you'd better come right down, Scott. That fellow Furman's hung himself. What? Furman hung himself? Yep, by his belt, from a window bar. Dead in a mackerel. I'll be right in, Wally. Phone Doc Camsley and tell him I'll pick him up on my way down. No doctor's gonna do Furman any good, Scott. Well, it won't hurt to have him looked at. You'd better phone the chronic court at Douglasville, too, and file a routine report. Already did that. And what's more, hold on to your seat. The DA's on his way over, in person. The DA? Yeah. I'll be there before you hang up, Wally. Come on in, Chief. Ted Carroll, the DA, is here, and he's plenty hot under the collar. What's he burning about? Oh, he's just mad, running up quite a phone bill on us, too. Been calling Philadelphia every couple of minutes since he got here. What kept you so long? Oh, I couldn't get the car started. Well, let's go in and see the old buzzard. Oh, Ted. Listen, Scott, what is all this? Oh, well, what? There's some funny business going on here. What's funny about it? Man hangs himself. Just another case of suicide. Sure, it was suicide. But I just telephoned Transamerica. Dug a guy out of bed there. And he said they'd never sent out circulars on Furman. Didn't know about any murder he was wanted for. All they could tell me about him was he used to be a client of theirs. You know what to say, Ted. I don't either. Oh, a fine chief of police you are. What on earth kept you so long? Car store. Came as quick as I could. Ain't you so crabby, Ted? Nothing. I guess it's just the district attorney and... Ah, oh, now, come, come, gentlemen. Nobody'd know you two are staunch admirers of each other. <laughs> okay, Wally. Tell me, what do you make of it? Well, there's plenty wrong, Scott. First, that Trans-America thing. They never send out circulars about Furman. And now, get this. I talked to the Philly police just before you came in. There wasn't even any Paul Frank Dunlap murdered. There wasn't? No. What did you get out of Furman before you let him hang himself? That he was innocent. Didn't you grill him? Didn't you find out what he was doing in town? Wally, didn't you? What for? He admitted he was Furman. The description fitted him. The photograph was him. The Trans-America Detective Agency is supposed to be on the level, ain't it? Philadelphia wanted Furman. We didn't, but Scott... I sure, Ted. If I'd have known he was going to hang himself. Yeah, but then if your aunt wore pants, you'd be your uncle. You said Furman had been a client of Trans-America. Did they tell you what the job they did for him was? His wife left him a couple of years ago, and he had them hunting for her for five or six months. But they never found her. They're sending a man up here tonight to look things over. Yeah, huh? Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm going out and grab a quick bite. But I might as well tell you, Scott, there's going to be trouble over this. I know that, Ted. There usually is when somebody dies in a jail cell. <laughs> Become of that 1,500 fish now, eh, huh, Scott? What happened there last night, George? Nothing. Furman hung himself. Did you find him? Uh-huh. Wally took a look in here to see how things was before he went off duty, and he found him. You're asleep, I suppose. Well, uh, I was catching a nap, I guess, but everybody does that sometimes, Scott. Even Wally sometimes when he comes in off his beat between rounds. Yeah, but I always wake up when the phone rings or anything. Oh, sure. Well, suppose I had been awake. Can't hear a guy hanging himself, can you? Did Doc Campbell say how long Furman had been dead? Yeah, he done it about five o'clock, he said he guessed. Oh, you want to look at the remains, Scott? They're over at Fritz's undertaking parlor. Not now. Hey, and speaking of Furman, what are you going to tell the guys from Transamerica when they show up here tonight? <laughs> Come in, come in. Oh, uh, they, they told me I'd find you here. You're Chief Anderson, aren't you? Yes, that's right. I'm Carl Reesing, assistant manager of the Trans-America Detective Agency in Philadelphia. This is Mr. Wheelock, who was Lester Furman's personal attorney. Glad to know you, Mr. Reesing. How do you do, Mr. Wheelock? Hmm. How do you do? I know you gentlemen are already in possession of most of the details concerning Mr. Furman from the time he arrived in Deerwood until the time of his death. But perhaps you don't know that the police of most towns in our corner of the state have also received copies of this same reward circular. Take a look at it. Oh. oh. I must say this circular is an excellent forgery. You're sure it's a forgery, Mr. Easing? Oh, yes. There's no doubt about it. But it's an excellent forgery. Tell me, Mr. Wheelock, 
Was Mr. Furman a native Philadelphian? Oh, my, yes. He was a well-known, respectable, and prosperous citizen of Philadelphia. Married, I believe? In 1934, he married a 22-year-old girl named Ethel Bryan, daughter of a Philadelphia family. And the Furman's had a child? Isn't that right, Mr. Wheeler? Yes, born in 1936, but the child lived only a few months. Mr. Furman's wife disappeared after the child's death. Well, what year was it that she disappeared? Mr. Reesing should remember that. His agency worked on the matter. Oh, I remember it well. Uh, Mrs. Furman disappeared in 1937. We never heard anything of her again, although Furman spent a lot of money trying to locate her. What did she look like, Mr. Reesing? Uh, in just a moment, uh, I have a picture of her right here in my briefcase. Uh, uh, here it is. Quite pretty, isn't she? If you care for that type. I see what you mean, Mr. Wheeler. Well, she's attractive as that. Judging by this photo, I'd say that she was a small-featured, pretty blonde, with a weak mouth and large, somewhat staring eyes. Well, that's an accurate enough description, all right. If you don't mind, I'd like to have a copy made of that photograph, Mr. Reesing. Oh, you can keep that one if you like. It's one that we had made up at Transamerica. Uh, her description's on the back. Thanks. Did uh, Furman ever divorce her? No, sir. He was a lot in love with her, and he seemed to think that the child's dying made her a little screwy so that she didn't know what she was doing. Uh, that's right, isn't it, Mr. Wheelock? That is my belief, Mr. Reesing. Uh, you said Furman had money, Mr. Wheelock. Uh, about how much did he have? And who gets it? I should say his estate will amount to perhaps a half a million dollars left in its entirety to his wife. Mm-hmm. It's quite a handy sum for anyone to have, I'd say. Mr. Wheelock? Everything shows that somebody framed Furman into the Daywood jail. And that frame-up drove him to suicide. But there has to be something else. A lot else. Well, then, what are you going to do? I'm going across the street to the undertaking parlor and have a look at Furman. I'll see you later. <laughs> Hello, Doc. Hi, Scott. I figured you'd come over here to the undertakers pretty soon. What's in your mind, Doc? Uh, let's uh, get out of this crowd. I, I want to tell you something. I just got rid of two guys in my office. Let's go back there. Suits me. Two of those uh, bruises uh, showed, Scott. What bruises? Furman. Up under the hair, there were, there were two bruises. Why didn't you tell me? I'm telling you now, Scott. You weren't here when I made my examination. This is the first time I've seen you since then. Why didn't you spill the stuff about Furman's bruises when you were testifying at the inquest, then? I, I'm a friend of yours. Do I want to put you in a spot where people can say you drove this champ to suicide by third degreeing him too rough? Ah, you're nuts. How bad was Furman's head? Well, Scott... Uh, that didn't kill him, if that's what you mean. Yeah, there's nothing the matter with his skull. Just a couple of bruises nobody had noticed, and unless they parted the hair. I thought you ought to know, though. Yeah. Thanks, Ben. Yes, who is it? This is Fritz, the undertaker. Listen, Scott, there's a couple of ladies over here that want to take a look at Furman. Is it all right? Who are they? I don't know them. Strangers. What do they want to see him for? I don't know. Wait a minute. Can I please see him? Why do you want to see him? Well, I... I'm... his wife. Herman's wife? Yes. Oh, 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 certainly. I'll be right over. So long, Ben. I've got to go back to the undertakers. So long, Scott. Hey, Scott. What do you want, Wally? I want to talk to you a minute. Over here where we won't be seen. Okay, what is it? A couple of dames came into Fritz's undertaking place just as I was leaving. One of them's Hotshaw Randall, a babe with a record as long as your arm. She's one of that mob you had me working on in New York last summer. Does she know you? Sure, but not by my right name. She thinks I'm a Detroit rum runner. I mean, did she recognize you just now? I don't think she saw me. Anyway, she didn't give me a tumble. You don't know the other one? No, she's a blonde, kind of pretty. Okay, Wally, stick around a while, but stay out of sight. Maybe I'll be bringing these dolls back with me. Whatever you say, Chief. Oh, 
Oh, there you are, Scott. I wondered when you were coming. Uh, this is Mrs. Furman, and this is Mrs. Crowder. How do you do? Hiya, Chief. They just saw the body. Mrs. Crowder? I thought your name was Randall. What do you care, Chief? I'm not hurting your town any. <laughs> <laughs> Don't call me Chief. You city slickers, I'm the town whittler. Thank you for letting me see him. It's all right, Mrs. Furman. But I'll have to ask you and your friends some questions. So if you'll just come across the street to headquarters, we'll get on with the routine. <laughs> any questions, I want to tell you something. Mrs. Furman, your husband didn't commit suicide. He was murdered. Murdered? Ah, oh, Chief, we got alibis. We were in New York, and we can prove it. And you're likely to get a chance, Tim. What brought you down here, anyway? Murdered? Well, who's got a better right to come down here? She was still his wife, wasn't she? She's got a right to look out for her own interests, hasn't she? Mm-hmm. Uh, it reminds me of something. Uh, excuse me a second. Uh, I've got to make a phone call in the next room. Officer Hamill speaking. This is Scott. Yes? Is Wally around? No, he's not here. He said you told him to keep out of sight. I'll find him for you, though. Right. Uh, tell Wally I want him to go to New York tonight. Send Mason home to get some sleep. He'll have to take over Wally's night trick. Oh? Mr. Anderson, Mr. Anderson, do you think I had, had anything to do with Lester's, with his death? I don't know, Mrs. Furman. I know he was killed. I also know he left you something like half a million. Wow. Dollars? Dollars. All right, Chief. Let's stop clowning. The kid here didn't have a thing to do with whatever you think happened. No? No. We read about Lester Furman committing suicide in yesterday morning's paper. And about there being something funny about it. And I persuaded her she ought to come down to Mr. Dear Anderson. I wouldn't have done anything to hurt Lester. I left him because I wanted to leave him. I wouldn't have done anything to hurt him for, for money or anything else. Had I wanted money from him, I would only have had to ask him for it. That's the truth, Chief. For years I've been telling Ethel she was a chump not to tap him. But she never would. I wouldn't have hurt him. Why'd you leave him then? Oh, I don't know how to say it. The way we lived wasn't the way I wanted to live. I wanted... Oh, I don't know what. Anyway, after the baby died, I couldn't stand it anymore. Excuse me. Hello? Oh, yeah, Hammer? Hmm? You gave Wally the message? Yes, yes, I want him to go to New York tonight. Okay, where is he? Home? He is home, huh? Okay, thanks. This is, uh, Foreman. Uh, this circular that got your husband in the jail. Did you ever see that picture before? No. Well, that's... It can't be. It, it's a snapshot I have. It's an enlargement of it. Who else has one? Nobody that I know of. I don't think anyone else could have one. You've still got yours? Yes. I don't remember whether I've seen it recently. It's with some old papers and things. But I must have it. Well, Mrs. Furman, it's stuff like that that's got to be checked up. Neither of us can dodge it. Now, there's two ways we can play it. Yes. Mrs. Furman, I can hold you here on suspicion until I've had time to investigate things. Or I can send one of my men with you to check up in New York. Yes. I'm willing to do that if you'll speed things up by helping them all you can. If you'll promise you won't try any tricks. I promise. I'm as anxious all as All right. Ought... All right. How'd you come down? We drove down. We got a great big car. That's my car, see? That big green job across the street. Yeah. yeah. And my man can ride back with you, but no funny business. Oh, I don't worry, Chief. Come on. We're going to see Wally Shane. The man is going to drive to New York with you. Wally? Who is it? Scott, Wally. Come in. Ladies first. Harry. Harry. Ethel. No, you don't. No, you don't. No use reaching with that gun, Wally. Already got you covered. I guess you win, Scott. Yeah, I guess I do. Come along back to headquarters with me like a good little boy. Wally, 
You're under arrest for murder. Well, and that's how I knew it was all up, Scott, the minute I saw those two dames going into Fritz's. Then when I was ducking out of sight, I ran into you, and I was afraid you'd take me over there with you, so I had to tell you one of them knew me. Figuring you'd want to keep me undercover for a little while anyhow. Long enough for me to get out of town. Why didn't you get out, Wally? Well, I dropped in home to pick up a couple of things before I scram, and that phone call of Hamill's catches me, and, and I fall for it. You see, Scott, I figured you're not on to me yet, and are going to send me back to New York to see what dope I can get out of the dames. Well, you fooled me, brother. And I thought you'd fall for that. Then you didn't just stumble into all this accidentally, did you? No, I didn't, Wally. I figured Furman had to be murdered by a copper. To know reward circulars was well enough to make a good job of forging one. Incidentally, who printed that Furman circular for you, Wally? Now, I'm not dragging anyone in with me. It was only a poor mug that needed dough. Okay, Wally. You see, I knew only a copper would be sure enough of the routine to know how things would be handled. Only one of my coppers would be able to walk in a firm and sell, bang him across the head and string him up on the... Those bruises showed, you know, Wally. They did? I guess I should have wrapped two towels around that blackjack. Well, gee, Scott, I seem to have slipped up on a lot of things. So that narrows it down to my coppers and... Well, you told me you knew the Randall woman. There it was. Only I figured you were working with him. What got you like this, Wally? Same thing that gets most saps into jams, a yen for easy dough. And I was in New York, see, Scott, working that Dutton job for you, palling around with big shot racketeers, passing for one of them, and... Yes? Well, I got to figuring that my work takes more brains than theirs, and they're taking in big money, and I'm working for coffee and cakes. That kind of stuff gets you, Scott. Anyway, it got me. Mm-hmm. Then I ran into this Ethel Furman, and she goes for me like a house of fire. I liked her, too, see? So that's dandy. But one night, she tells me about how much dough her husband's got and how he feels about her, and I get to thinking... Thinking what? I think she's nuts enough about me to marry me. So I get to thinking, suppose he died and left her his role. Mm-hmm. I see. So I run down to Philly a couple of afternoons and look Furman up, and everything looks fine. I took my time working out the details, meanwhile writing to her through a fellow in Detroit. Go on. Finish one. Well, I decided to do it. I sent those circulars out to a lot of places, not wanting to point too much to this one. And then when I was ready, I phoned Furman, telling him to come to Deerwood Hotel that night. And sometime before the next night, he'd hear from his wife, Ethel. I knew he'd fall for any trap that was baited with her. Only I guess I'm not as sharp as I thought I was, Scott. Maybe I, yeah, Wally. Maybe I. Yeah. That doesn't always help. Old man Camsley, Ben's father, used to have a saying. To a sharp knife comes a tough steak. Well, sorry you did it, Wally. I always liked you. I know you did, Scott. I was counting on that. Dashiell Hammett's Two Sharp Knives, starring Stuart Irwin. Tonight's story of... Suspense. Columbia presents these tales of mystery and intrigue and dangerous adventure for your relaxation and enjoyment. Next week, suspense will not be heard because of a special holiday broadcast. Columbia's review of the events of the year. Twelve crowded months, which has been scheduled. On the following Tuesday, January 5th, there'll be another in this series. Same hour, 9.30 Eastern Wartime. 
William Spear, the producer, John Dietz, the director, and Bernard Herman, the composer-conductor. Our collaborators on Suspense. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Hollywood, California, Monday, May 24th. The Lux Radio Theater presents Under Two Flags with Herbert Marshall, Olivia de Havilland, Lucy Velez, and Lionel Atwell. Lux presents Hollywood. Under Two Flags comes to you through the courtesy of the makers of Lux Flakes. May we thank you for supporting the Lux Radio Theater through your regular use of Lux. Tonight, our stars are Herbert Marshall, Olivia de Havilland, Luby Velez, and Lionel Atwell. Our guests, Miss Fanchon of the famous team of Fanchon and Marco, now Hollywood's first major studio woman producer, and Louis Van Den Ecker, formed former sergeants in the French Foreign Legion. Our producer, Cecil B. DeMille. Our conductor, Louis Silver. So do we welcome you to another hour in Hollywood. Before starting our play, let me say that from all I hear, Lux Flakes seem to be mighty popular with modern brides. They're not going to risk dishpan hands if they can help it. They know that we men don't like red, rough hands. Such a hand feels coarse and unpleasant, makes a man wince inside, though naturally he tries not to show it. Mrs. John McGuire, who was married this year, puts it very well when she says, Maybe men respect them, but believe me, they don't admire dishpan hands. I'm not going to have them, thanks to Lux. As Mrs. McGuire knows, Lux guards against dishpan hands. It has no harmful alkali to dry and roughen the skin. You'll find it speeds up dishwashing, too. I turn the microphone over now to Hollywood's celebrated producer and star finder. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. <laughs> Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight's production of Under Two Flags recalls memories of the golden age on Broadway. David Belasco was starring Blanche Bates in this great play. I was acting in another production nearby, and frequently members of our company would slip into Belasco's theater to watch Miss Bates rehearsed as Cigarette. Among us was a very young girl, also destined to leave the stage and try her luck in the fad that was soon to sweep the country, moving pictures. She did uh, rather well. Her name was Mary Pickford. Our story is from the celebrated novel of Louise de la Ramee, and tonight, thanks to Paramount and RKO Studios, we star a gentleman of long acquaintance with our microphone, Herbert Marshall. Bart leaves the set of Angel, his new picture with Marlena Dietrich, to portray the role of Corporal Victor. As cigarette, there's Guadalupe Villalobos, the hard way of saying Lupe Valles. Born in San Luis Potosi, daughter of a colonel and an opera singer, Lupe flared to fame on the Mexican musical comedy stage and her firecracker personality prompted me to cast her in the third version of The Squaw Man. Olivia de Havilland's third appearance in the Lux Radio Theater finds her in the part of Lady Venetia, lovely, talented, and youthful. Olivia can look forward to a most brilliant Hollywood future. She's just completed Call It a Day and has begun work on It's Love I'm After for Warner Brothers. Just as busy as Lionel Atwell, who, like Lupe is home from picture-making in England. He's just finished the road back for Universal and last train from Madrid for Paramount. We meet him tonight in the role of Major Doyle. From this point on, let our stars account for themselves. Up with the curtain, then, as once again we bring you the magic of the Lux Radio Theater, presenting Under Two Flags, starring Herbert Marshall, Olivia de Havilland, Lupe Valdez, and Lionel Atwell. Yeah. 
Algiers. Land of shimmering sands and blazing sun, of trackless desert wastes, of scorching days and magic star-swept nights. Land of the foreign legion. On the edge of the Great Sahara, the little Arab town of Saida lies drowsing in the midday heat. Only in the cafe Cigarette is there any sign of activity. Cigarette herself, a vivacious young French girl, moves from table to table, chatting with the patrons. Suddenly the doors flung open as her father waddles excitedly into the room. Cigarette! Cigarette! Where are you? Papa, what is wrong? Cigarette! The 14th Company of Legionnaires. They have marched away. What? That is impossible. No, no, they are gone. With my own eyes, I see them go. They cannot do this to me. They owe me for wine, for beer, for food. Oh, they will never pay now. We are ruined. Oh, Papa, you donkey. Why did you let them go? Why? I am one man. Can I stop a whole regiment? And I am one girl. But I will stop them. I will see the commandant. Oh, no, it is too late. Already they have marched across the desert. The commandant will make the march back. Wait here. I tell you, I will see the commandant. I will, I will, I will. I'm sorry, little one, but Major Doyle is busy. Get out of my way. Here, here, what's this? Oh, hello, cigarette. Hello, hello. This food here would not let me speak with you. It's all right, Orderly. Well, it's nice to see you. <laughs> Thank you, Monsieur le Commandant. Why, oh, you robbed me, eh? You ruined my father, my cafe. Oh, you pig! Easy there, easy. What's all this about? Look at this bill. Hmm? What you find, legionnaire saw me. And what do you do, huh? You march him away. Now I never get my money. Oh, never, never. There, there, now, cigarette. I wouldn't do anything to hurt you. I never gave you a thought. No, you never do. Well, what can I do about it now? The company's gone. You can order them back. Call them back? Mm hmm. But I can't countermand an order. But, Commandant, for me? For cigarette? No. No? No. Oh, what a great big no. And yet you say you love me. But when I ask you such a little thing like this, you say, no! Now, now, look here. Have I ever refused you anything in reason? Mm -mm. You always have been very, very kind. Yes, and too blasted patient. <laughs> now, I've, I've waited a long time for you, Cigarette. Ah, but you will soon be a colonel. Yes, you said major when I was a captain. <laughs> Did I? I never know how to take you. Now, do you love me or don't you? So very, very much. And when you are a colonel... I shall love you so much more and... Uh, and uh, what? Now you will bring the men back for me, yes? Uh, and when they come back, I will kill you, hmm? hmm? <laughs> like that. Oh, cigarette. <laughs> Goodbye, uh, no, 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 Come back here, come back here, come. <laughs> Little devil. Orderly. Come on, Dan. Orderly. Tell the adjutant to send a messenger out to the 14th Company and order them back to barracks. Order them. Didn't you hear? Jump. Come in. Commandant? Well, uh, Corporal Victor is here, sir. Victor? Who's he? One of the survivors of the 17th Company, sir. Oh, yes, yes, yes. I want to see him. Commandant? Come over here. Your name, Victor? Yes, sir. 17th Company. How many have you left? Eight, sir. It was a surprise attack by C.D. Ben Yusuf. Yes, I know that. You're lucky any of you came out alive. Yes, sir. Corporal Victor, your company was on its way here to Saida. You were carrying food for Colonel Farol's mess. Yes, sir. Well, where is it? We haven't got it, sir. Arabs take it? No, sir. I gave it to the men. What? Emergency rations, sir, just after the attack. Emergency rations? How long has caviar been emergency rations? There were no complaints, sir. <laughs> you know those stores were for Colonel Farol's private use? The Colonel has excellent taste, sir. I might add that his wine is also up to the mark. <laughs> <laughs> I see, I see. <laughs> Made up your mind to have one good meal before they finish you off, eh? <laughs> well, I think I'd have done the same thing myself. Thank you, sir. Corporal Victor, huh? Hmm. Any military service before you join the Legion? 
Yes, sir. British Army, of course. Here. How long in the Legion? First year of my second enlistment, sir. Good. I'll get you transferred to my battalion. It's the best battalion. I like to have the best men. I like to be under the best commander. Huh? Let her do, Corporal. Let her do. Yes, sir. Oh, if I might make a request, sir. Well? There's another survivor, Legionnaire Rake. Hmm? I'd like to have him transferred with me, sir. Rake, eh? Friend of yours? A very old friend, sir. He's been with me... Uh, we've been friends for years. I'll arrange it. Thank you, sir. Uh-huh. You know, Rick, I think I'm going to like the 14th. They're a jolly bunch. Yes, sir. A bit noisy, sir. Don't call me, sir. You really must get out of that habit, Rick. Tried it, sir. But it will slip out like... Hello, hello, my friend. How are you, Ivan? Sit down. Rake and I were just about to open a bottle. A bottle? Of course, I'll sit down. Bless us, cigarette, cigarette, bless us here for the first time. Yes? Who's that man over there? Big one at the table with the band. <laughs> you like his looks, eh? <laughs> <laughs> that is Corporal Victor. Oh, Corporal Victor. Uh-huh. I think I'm most welcome. <laughs> you will like it here, Corporal Victor. <laughs> I'm sure I will. Corporal Victor, I welcome you to my cafe. I am cigarette. How do you do, mademoiselle? May we have three glasses, please? What? But uh, I am cigarette, the mascot of the company. Again, how do you do? We are very thirsty, if you don't mind. But always, the first time you come, cigarette gives you a bottle of wine. Thank you, mademoiselle, but we have cognac, as you see. Now, may we have our glasses? So, you refuse my wine. You insult me, my cafe. Perhaps we should be glad of your wine later. We have no glasses for you, now or later. You are too good for us here, Corporal Cavior. <laughs> no. If you're not going to serve us, mademoiselle, we shall have to go to another cafe. Uh, don't let him get away, cigarette. You lose your customer. Sit on his lap, cigarette. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, no, no. The corporal would not like for someone to sit on his lap like this. <laughs> That's quite all right, mademoiselle. But I hope you don't mind if I stand up. Like this. Ah! Oh, you, 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 you pig, you dog. You sit me on the floor, yes? Yes. Good night, mademoiselle. <laughs> One hour a day for rest and recreation, and we've got to spend it here in the bar. Well, get off my bunk, Ivan. I don't... Please. Well, come on, get off. Don't you think you better have a nap, sir? I mean, corporal. Thanks, Wake. I'd rather finish carving this model. The horse, sir? It's a model of Forrest King. Like it? Carved him a bit delicate-like, haven't you, sir? His legs, I mean. Well, perhaps I have. Yes, he'd have a broken foreleg with a bone like that. You know, sir, at the time he almost hit the rail at Aintree... <laughs> He had a great heart, that fellow. The biggest in England. Oh, sir, it would be nice to see him again, wouldn't it? He's about the only thing I'd care to see again. Attention! Commandant, going the rounds. Already, Commandant. Uh, listen, men. We're having a visitor. An English lady from the hotel. Now, act your best. At ease, men. Is this the place, Commandant? This is it. Come in, Lady Venetia. I do hope the men don't mind. Mind? Why, they are honored. Well... Oh, the men must be tortured with the flies. Shouldn't they have screens in their quarters? <laughs> screens? <laughs> it's said in the Legion that when a fly bites a legionnaire, the fly dies. <laughs> <laughs> Is that right, Corporal? <laughs> Quite right, sir. Oh. How do you do? How do you do? Corporal Victor, one of my best led men, Lady Venetia. English, of course. Got a fine record in the Legion, I mean. Nothing to be ashamed of there, at any rate. <laughs> Thank you, sir. This carving, is it your work, Corporal? My recreation. It's beautiful. A perfect model of an English thoroughbred hunter. A hunter, is it? A lot he knows about those. He sees nothing but Arab ponies in these parts. Might have been carved from memory. Not likely, I should think. But that's dangerous ground, my lady. Better not look into their pasts. I'm sorry, Corporal. I'm glad you like the model, my lady. Well, shall we get along, Lady Venetia? Thank you, Commandant. The other barracks, my lady, are...
It gave me the creeps when I saw the way you looked at her. For a moment, I thought she knew you. No. I've never met her before. She's beautiful, isn't she? So it isn't Corporal anymore. It's Sergeant from now on. Sergeant Victor. Thank you, sir. Now, you know Arabic, Sergeant? Yes, sir, some. Good. I have an assignment for you. Important. Go down to the Arab horse market. Some new traders have just come in from the desert. And keep your eyes open. For what, sir? For any talk of Sidi Ben Yusuf. Any hint that he's collecting his tribes. Very good, sir. Oh, and uh, Sergeant. Yes, sir. You may see an English captain down there. One of the party of visitors. He'll be buying horses. <laughs> see that he isn't cheated. Huh? I'll do my best. Go along now. I know, I'll take that horse here. And show me some more like it. Did you see that, sir? Yes, our English friend has bought the same horse four times. Those Arabs are shrewd traders, Wick. Shrewd, sir. They're downright thieves. That girl over there, you know, cigarette. She seems to be helping him to buy. Not helping him, Rick. I should say she's helping the Arabs to sell. Come on. The Englishman will buy this tree and this black one here. No? Oh, but that grey one, I think I like him better. Good afternoon, sir. Hey, oh, good afternoon. Buying horses, sir? Yes. What do you want here, Sergeant Cabillard? Oh, just looking on. Look here, cigarette says the black's a finer horse than the grey. Do you agree, Sergeant? Since you ask my opinion, sir... I would take the gray. The black is a bit weak in the forelegs. And what would a legionnaire know about horses? You take my word, Mon Captain. I know. There's one way to prove the black is best. I will ride him, and the other boy shall ride the gray. We will race. Good idea. Excellent. That'll show. It is a good idea, sir. But with your permission, I'll ride the gray. You see, the Arab boy might be inclined to think that someone wants you to buy the black. What? Oh, I see. Yes, splendid, Sergeant. Splendid. Look here, my dear, you don't mind if the sergeant rides against you, do you? No. It will be a pleasure to beat him. Well, well then, forget that. Look here, I see you too, you know. You ought to have a bet on this. Let's say uh, a bottle of wine to a kiss. What? As the lady likes, sir. We, oui, I bet. Even though it would kill me to pay. It's all right, mademoiselle. If you don't care to pay, it will be the horse who will win. We could compromise and allow you to kiss him. For you, 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 I'll pay no one. I say, look out, she's riding off. You made a jolly angry, Sergeant. Cigarette, I didn't mean to. Come back. After a Sergeant. Cigarette, wait. There he goes, and I'll bet he catch up. He will that, sir. Look at him, going right out into the desert. Cigarette, stop. Pull up. No, 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 no. You've got to let me explain. No. If you don't stop, I'll have to lift you off your horse. Let me alone. Let me alone. Put me down. <laughs> I will when I've spoken my piece. Look out. Look out. I'm falling. Cigarette. Cigarette. Cigarette, are you all right? Can you sit up? Cigarette, look at me. You, you fool. Why don't you leave horses alone if you can ride? Do you want to kill me? Do you want to break my neck? No, I couldn't break that lovely little neck. Oh, I, I hate you. I'm terribly sorry if I was rude. Sorry? Yes, really. I didn't mean to offend you. No? The first time you come to my cafe, you insult me. And the next time you see me, you tell me to kiss a horse. <laughs> you know, after all, you did say it would kill you to pay the bet. Uh, are you really sorry? I am indeed. And you have forgiven me? <laughs> Would it have killed you if I had paid my bet? I should say not. <laughs> then, here. You like that? Like yeah. it? Who wouldn't? I'm sorry we didn't bet some more. <laughs> well, but we did. Five, six, ten bets. And every time you won. Huh? <laughs> What are you thinking about? What? Huh? Oh, nothing much. Just watching the sunset. I have been watching it too. But I have been thinking. 
What about? Oh, about you. I did not know I could hate a man so much and fall in love with him so quick. Oh, what a strange little creature you are, Cigarette. Now we've got to go. Come on. <laughs> it will be a long walk without the horses. Shall I carry you? Oh, no, no. This isn't the first time I walk in the desert. Many a times I march with the legion. Yes, you told me you were the mascot. <laughs> that night at the cafe? <laughs> Even though you did not look at me then, I knew that you liked me. And I like you too. And tonight you will come again. And I will fix a little table so nice for you in the alcove. Then I think we will bet some more. You will come, yes? My dear cigarette. That's an invitation no soldier could refuse. Before going on with our play, let us imagine for a moment that we're in a typical American home in which we meet three members of our unseen radio audience. First, you hear Joe's sister, Dorothy, who has come over tonight especially to listen to Under Two Flags with Nan and Joe. It's a swell show, isn't it? I wouldn't think of missing the Lux program, and I couldn't live without my Lux. Oh, seems to me there's always something rather you can't live without. Now, there's a brother for you. I'm really very economical, Joe, darling. Yeah. But listen, Nan, I got four of the grandest dresses today. I'm going to be the best dressed girl in town. Four? Oh, Dot, you are getting extravagant. I'm not, thanks to Lux Flakes. You see, dear, I can put more money into new clothes this year because Lux has been saving me so much money on cleaning bills and my things last so much longer now. they really new looking. Besides, it leaves dresses so clean and sweet. Are you going to Lux everything? Yes, ma'am. I'm not buying a thing that isn't Luxable. Then nothing but Lux Flakes will ever touch them. I'm too thrifty to risk ordinary soaps or rubbing with cake soap. Dorothy has found the way to dress well at very little cost. Nowadays, every store is full of Luxables that are knockouts for smartness. And they'll look as smart at the end of the season as they do right now if you stick to Lux. These gentle flakes are made to protect colors and fabrics. Remember, anything safe in water alone is safe in Lux. Back now to Mr. DeMille. Under Two Flags, starring Herbert Marshall, Olivia de Havilland, Lupe Valles, and Lionel Atwell. <laughs> Later the same evening, convinced that Sergeant Victor is in love with her, Cigarette sings happily as she prepares the private table in the cafe. But the sergeant has forgotten his promise. He's late even now, and Ivan, the legionnaire, amuses himself by poking fun at Cigarette. <laughs> so it is the sergeant now, huh? <laughs> You're in love with him. In love? Oh. I hate him. Of course, of course. Maybe that's why you make up a nice table here, because you hate him. <laughs> mm. He is not coming here. No. <laughs> you can be sure of that. <laughs> what do you mean? I know he's not coming. And you know why? why? Because there is a ball up in the English hotel. He's gone up there. <laughs> ah! <laughs> oh, you're a fool, is bad. Legionnaires are not permitted at the hotel. No. But, but he has gone there. I saw him. And I bet you he does not come here. All right. I bet you. Ah, <laughs> so you were expecting him. <laughs> there I was, Lady Venetia, down there with the old Adams buying horses. I've heard they're rather shrewd, Captain. Well, of course, I had to watch my step, I did. Excuse me, sir. Oh. Now, what is it, Sergeant? Important dispatches just arrived, sir. From Egypt? Quite possibly, sir. Sure, sir. I must go. You coming, Lady Venetia? No, I'll wait. Don't be long, Captain. No, I won't. And thanks, Sergeant. So, a Sergeant now. Yes, my lady. Tell me, was there any such important message? There might have been. But I didn't bring it. It's very dangerous for you to be here under false pretenses. It is indeed. Twice dangerous. Twice? A firing squad on one side. Your eyes on the other. You're a daring man, Sergeant. I had to come to bring you this. 
Oh, the model of the horse. You were kind enough to admire it. Will you accept it from me as a gift? Thank you. I shall love it. Not only for itself, but because you risked so much to bring it. Do you know, this is the best exciting thing that's happened to me in all this monotonous country. Africa, monotonous? Well, look about you. Isn't it monotonous? But this isn't Africa. It's just a ball in a hotel in any part of the world. Africa's out there. In the Arab quarters, the Jewish bazaars, the cafes, the Kabyl dancers. Things I'm afraid I shall never see. Things you ought to see if you want to know Africa. I could take you, you know. Or perhaps adventure doesn't appeal to you. You're daring me, aren't you? Yes. You realize it's absurd, Im impossible. Right. And that's why I might do it? Of course. Oh, you oughtn't to tempt me. When can we go? Now? Now? How can we get out? Can you climb? I used to climb apple trees. Then come on. The balcony shouldn't present any difficulties. <laughs> Cinderella has to go home. We'd better say goodnight out here. Thank you for showing me Africa. It's been thrilling. You didn't think that was Africa, did you? But you said it was. Did I? No. The real Africa's out there in the desert. The Maibu oasis at full moon. Maibu. It sounds enchanting. And only three miles out. Are you tempting me again? Yes. Are you tempted? Dreadfully. But of course it's impossible. Oh, quite impossible. I'm afraid so. Unless... Unless? Will there be a full moon tomorrow night? I shall see to it personally. <laughs> Good night, Sergeant Victor. Good night, my lady. Oh, you came out here after all. Didn't you know I would? And after you ordered the moon especially for me? There it is. Shall we sit down? You were going to show me the rest of Africa. It's all around you, my lady. The desert, the oasis, these ruins here. How silent. How grave. And how incredibly old it all is. Yes. That's Africa. This place must have a story. A thousand stories. Shall I tell you one of them? I'd much rather hear another. Your own. Mm, my story is much too long, much too dull to tell you. Not dull, I'm sure. No, perhaps not dull. And it hasn't seemed long till now. After this, it'll be endless. After this? Being with you, feeling the nearness of you. You'll never know what it's meant to me. Oh, please, you mustn't talk this way. Do I frighten you? No, but... You see, it's, it's, it's the old trick. I'm just playing on your sympathy. Oh, you had that from the first moment I saw you. You don't belong here. You're miserable here, aren't you? I was. I'm not anymore. You mean that... that I... Uh... Yes. You've changed everything for me. Venetia. Oh, don't say any more. I... I must go back now. Do you want to go back? No. That's why I must. Oh, what's up? What's the matter? How do I know, Almighty Commandant? All in, you men. All in. It's an attack. I heard the Commandant say so. City Ben Yusuf's tribes, they have attacked by Insufra. Ten Commandant. Men, you just received marching orders. Iron Sufra has been attacked. You're ready to move in an hour. Full packs. That's all. Captain, dismiss! Sergeant Victor! Sergeant Victor! What is it, Rick? Sir, I've been looking for you. I've just seen Lord Seraph. Lord Seraph? Yes, sir. He's just arrived, sir. Gone up to the hotel he has. He mustn't see me. Oh, he'd know you, sir. He'd recognize you, sure. 
And, sir, remember that lady who came to the barracks that day? Lady Venetia? Yes. She's his niece, sir. His niece? Rake, you've got to pack for me. But we're marching an hour, sir. I can't help that. I gave the carving of Forest King to Lady Venetia. It has the name carved on it. I've got to get it back. Oh, he'd know Forest King, sir. Bring my kit. I'll meet you at the parade ground. Wait! Oh. Oh, hello, cigarette. Oh, Victor. Where have you been? Two nights I waited for you, and you did not come. Why? I'm sorry, cigarette, but I couldn't. Was it the commandant's orders? He gave you some special duty? No, no, I was detained. Oh. Forgive me, cigarette, but I must go now. You would leave me and not even say goodbye? No. I was coming to say goodbye before I left. Believe me. Goodbye? Is that, is that all you were going to say to me? Please. You must forgive me. I've got to go. Victor. Venetia. I, I climbed the balcony. I hope no one saw me. Oh, thank heaven you've come. If you hadn't, I should have gone to you. I couldn't let you go without seeing you. Venetia, there's something I've got, I'm going to ask you. There is anything very odd of me, but really it's important. It's the model of the horse. I've come to ask you to give it back to me. But why? It's mine. I love it. I, I can't explain, but I must have it. Will you give it to me, please? Well, of course I will. It's in the other room. But you must let me have it again when you come back. But you won't be here when I return. You will be in England. No. I shall be here, Victor. I but... can't leave you, ever. But, Venetia. Oh, no, don't speak. I've thought it all out. I know nothing of you except yourself, but that's all I need to know. Venetia, dear, do you realize what you're saying? It's madness. Oh, no. When two people love each other like this in part, that's madness. And you won't always be a legionnaire. Someday your service will end. It will never end. I can never go back to England. I'd only be exchanging my service here for a prison cell. I don't believe it. You're trying to frighten me because you think it's hopeless. But it isn't hopeless. I won't let it be. You can't forget me, Victor. Can you? No. You want me to wait? Want you? Then I will. May I come in? Who's that? Don't go. It's only my uncle. No, no. I can't see him. I shall be here when you come back. I love you, Victor. Goodbye, darling. Goodbye, Venetia. Cigarette. Cigarette, where are you? Yes. Yes, Commandant. Look, my darling. You see this? It's my new commission. I've got it, cigarettes. I'm a colonel. The colonel? Don't you see? This is the thing we waited for, planned for. Cigarette. Cigarette. Oh, you're crying. What is it? Darling, tell me, what is it? I cried because... Because you, you go away. Maybe you, you never come back. You lie. It's that sergeant. You've been different to me since the first time you laid eyes on him. Not a decent kiss have I had since that day. It is not true. I hate him. You're lying to me. You're lying to me. Aren't you? Aren't you? Yes, I am lying. It is the sergeant. You're crying for him. I warned you once, Cigarette, that I'd never let another man take my place. No man ever shall. What? What do you mean? I warned you, cigarette. Come on! Come on! Commandant, you want to see me, son? Yes. Yes, Sergeant Victor. 
I've got a little special detail work for you. Very good, sir. You'll pick up 20 men. Cut across the desert. You north towards Iron Sephra. Hold a position 15 kilometers this side of the fort. Excuse me, sir. I don't quite understand. You said 20 men. You north across the desert. Well? That's right through the heart of the Arab forces, sir. I know that. We'll never make it, sir. You have your orders. But with only 20 men. You have your orders. It's certain death for all of us. I suppose you know that. Death is part of every soldier's equipment, Sergeant Victor. Pick your men and leave at once. If you don't mind, sir, I'd like to ask for volunteers. Do what you want. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Because for station identification, this is the Columbia Broadcasting System. KMX Los Angeles, the voice of Hollywood. Before we resume under two flags, I am privileged to introduce a soldier who served under three national banners, the Belgian, French, and Polish. He spent seven years in the French Foreign Legion, campaigning in Algeria, Morocco, Indochina, and the Sahara, rising to the rank of sergeant. In the World War, he became a lieutenant, was severely wounded, underwent 23 operations, and received several decorations, including knighthood in the French Legion of Honor. In recent years, he's been a military technical advisor in Hollywood. He worked for me on the Crusades, and most recently on Paul Muni's picture, The Life of Emile Zola. Ladies and gentlemen, a true soldier of fortune, Lieutenant Louis Vandenecker. My thanks, Mr. DeMille. I suppose a lot of people are wondering what crime I committed to have joined the Legion. If I disappoint you, I'm sorry. But the law and I have never had any argument. Men join the Legion for one reason. Adventure. Criminals are not found in the ranks. And if one of them manages to join, he is soon arrested by civil authorities. It was my impression that they ask no questions when you join the Legion. <laughs> That's true. But that does not keep uh, criminal from... Uh, from uh, that does not keep uh, <laughs> police from uh, chasing a criminal. Uh, what, what are the qualifications then for enlistment? Only two. You have to be of age and in excellent health. In our play, Van, we mention Ayn Sufra and Saida. Do those towns mean anything to you? A great deal. I served many months at both places. In fact, at Ayn Sufra, there is a bottle embedded in the wall of one of the buildings. In it is a slip of paper with my name and the date, just a souvenir I left behind. As one who encountered the Arabs many times, what's your opinion of them as fighters? Very high. Arabs have no fear. They believe that if they die fighting, they will go to paradise with many pretty girls. We had our hands fall many times, and I've been just as scared as anyone could be. When marching, the legionnaires are always in square formation, ready for instant trouble. And at, at night, they pitch their camps in square formations too. They are never without their rifles or their picks and shovels. Now they're overcoats, judging from what I've seen. Why overcoats in the desert? Because the coat acts on the same order as a thermos bottle. It gave the heat out. After seven years in their ranks, Van, what's your most vivid memory of the Legion? Their wonderful spirit of comradeship. They will not only risk their lives to save a wounded comrade, but there is case after case of as many as six men going to their death trying to recover the body of a dead comrade rather than let it fall in the, hand, in the enemy's hands. In the Legion are men of every race, color and religion under the sun, men of every profession, living together, fighting together as brothers. If the world wants an example of brotherhood to follow, let the world look to the French Foreign Legion. Thank you, soldier. <laughs> Herbert Marshall, Olivia de Havilland, Lupe Velez, and Lionel Atwell take up our story, Under Two Flags. <laughs> One week has passed. The fighting has broken out at Ain Sufra, 
But no word has come from Sergeant Victor and his 20 men, doomed to perish trying to hold a hopeless position. In her room at the hotel in Saida, Lady Venetia turns toward the door as her uncle, Lord Seraph, enters. Venetia! Yes, Uncle Harry? I say, Venetia, where in heaven's name did you get this? This model of the horse here? Oh, it... It was given to me, Uncle Harry. But when? A little over a week ago. Curious. Very curious indeed. It must be an old carving. Well, I'm sure it isn't old. As a matter of fact, I know it's new. But that's impossible. Don't you see? It's Forrest King, Tony Brett's old horse. It has the name carved on the back. Tony Brett? Who's Tony Brett? Don't you remember the scandal? Tony Brett's younger brother committed a crime, and Tony shouldered the blame himself. Last summer, Tony's brother was injured, and just before he died, he made a full confession absolving Tony. And where is Tony Brett now? Why, he's dead, I believe. The man that carved that horse and gave it to me is a legionnaire, an Englishman and a gentleman. He must be Tony Brett. Impossible. But wait a minute. As a matter of fact, none of us ever saw Tony's remains. I can't tell you how I know, but I have a feeling I'm sure that Sergeant Victor is Tony Brett. Isn't it said that the Legion is full of dead men? Where is this man? I'd know Tony anywhere. He's gone, marched away with Colonel Do Bo Doyle's battalion. Can't we get him back? I'll do what I can. You... You want him to come back very much, don't you, my dear? I do. So much. I beg your pardon, Lady Venetia. Yes, Paul? You asked to be informed of any wounded return. Yes. There's a train of ambulances just arrived, my lady. Oh, thank you, Paul. Thank you. Easy there. Handle him easy. Oh, Phil. Phil. You're hurt bad, huh? Uh, see, Father? It, it's good to see you. Oh. Here, water. What, my Farrell? Excuse me. Is there anything I can do? Oh, you. I'd like to help if I could. If you are here to look for Sergeant Victor, you need not look any longer. He, he's not coming back. What do you mean? You know something, mademoiselle? Yes, I do know. The commandant has sent him to a post of death. Sergeant Victor will stay there until he dies. Is, is this true? Yes, it is true. I know from the wounded. Now you can go back to your own country. You will never see him again. Why? Why do you tell me this? Because I love him as you could never love him. He does not belong with your kind. He's of the Legion, and they are my kind. Would you follow them into the desert, as I have done? Would you march with them and nurse them and close their eyes when they are dead? I have shot them. Do you hear? So that the Arabs could not take him alive. Could you do that? No. Oh, you poor child, you do love him. Yes, I... I love him. And I could save him, too. You could save him? How? In a way you could not understand. But why should I save him? Huh? For you? But you said that you love him. If you really love him, can you let him die? Can you? Go back to your hotel. Go back to your soft life. An easy way. What are you going to do, mademoiselle? I'm going to the commandant. At Ain Sufra. I'm going to save Sergeant Victor for you. Here, man. There's not much water. Go easy on it. Sergeant, how long are we going to be here? How long do we have to wait for help in this filthy hole? Easy, Baron. I can't stand it much longer, I tell you. I can't stand it. Quiet. They're out there waiting for us. Waiting for us to show ourselves. Waiting for us to go mad. Shut up. Oh. Sorry I had to do that, Baron. There were only eight men here. Eight out of twenty. We'll need our wits to get out of this. It's this blasted silence that's got me. The Arabs are out there all right. Why don't they attack? A wall ten feet high between us and a thousand Arabs. They could kill us both like that. Let them wait. The longer they wait, the more chance for the relief to come. Sure, if it ever does. We were put out here to hold this position. We're going to do it. We can't if they attack us. They'll swarm over us like flies. Quiet, I tell you. He's right, sir. We'd never hold out against another attack. We're too few. It's time we're working against now. 
Anything might happen if we had time. Time. I might be able to get some. Until dawn, anyway. How, sir? If I could borrow the robes from one of those dead Arabs outside, I might be able to sneak into Sidi Ben Yusuf's camp. What? Pay the Sheikh a little visit. You're mad, sir. Why, they'd call me to ribbons. <laughs> They'll do that anyway, Wake. I'm not too particular about where I die. And it's worth a chance. <laughs> Kaid, Ben Yosef. What is it? One of our horsemen, Kaid. He would talk with you. Send him to me. Well? Good evening, Sidi Ben Yosef. An Englishman. How did you get here? It's a pleasure to renew an old acquaintance. Old acquaintance? I don't seem to recall your face. Oxford. You were at Balliol. I was at Trinity. You haven't forgotten those afternoons at Professor York's? Oh. <laughs> Dear old Professor York. Oh, how well I remember. This is amazing. Old classmates meeting here in the heart of the desert as enemies. Why have you paid me this most unusual visit? To save my life. And possibly save yours. Really? A wise man is he who makes peace in time. Peace? Recently, a British commissioner arrived in Sida, as your spies no doubt have already advised you. Does that affect me, my friend? I make war on the French. You know best, of course. But if you are caught here... With the British troops behind you, it'll be a little awkward, won't it? British troops in French territory? That is utterly impossible. The secret was well kept. <laughs> Are you naive enough to think that I believe you? You have scouts, I suppose? Send them out. Learn for yourself. Well? I shall send them. If what you have told me is true, I shall be indebted to you for the rest of my life. If not, you will die, my friend. In a few hours, we shall know. A few hours? By dawn. Dawn. Thank you. Good morning, my friend. I trust you slept well. Excellently, thank you. And that you enjoyed your morning meal? I found it a delightful relief from hard tack. I am very glad, since it will be your last. Really? You lied to me. I have had scouts out all night. There are no British within 500 miles, and you knew it. Quite. And I was quite surprised that you believed me at all. And now it's my turn to amuse myself with you. Uh-huh. I'm curious. What do you intend to do with me? Remember the old soccer games? We are going to play it now. With horses. You will be the ball. It should be very amusing, Sheikh. For me, yes. But for you, I doubt that you're careful. What's that? Quiet, quiet, the Legion. The Legion, four squadron. They ride from the north. So, this is what you waited for, my friend. The relief, Sidi Ben Yusuf. We hope they might be here at dawn. And so they are. It's a pity you won't be there to greet them. I shall try my best. Stop him! Stop that man! Come on down! The men in the fort! Never mind them now! Open order! Extend the right wing and charge from the rear! Extend your right wing! Close formation on the left! Never mind the fort! Come on down! Come on down! Cigarette! I told you to stay behind! I'm right with you! I have a battle on my hand here. Get to the rear. Your promise was saving painful men to the fort. Get back, I tell you. You want to be hit? Turn your horse and go back. Oh, I'm riding with you. Oh, no. You said you're saving. Give up the bird. Turn your men. Turn the ball. Cigarette. Are you hit? Cigarette. Cigarette. <laughs> It was about here that she went down, Sergeant Victor. Why did she do it? The Commandant tried to make her stay behind, but she wouldn't. We saw her fall and we... But look, sir, there she is. She's lying over there. Call some men from the fort, quick. Yes, sir. Cigarette. Cigarette. 
Oh, Victor. You are safe. Let me lift you up. No. No, higher. I have seen so many men die. I know what this is. You can't do anything. There, there is something I, I must say. Yes, cigarette. She said, the English lady, if I love you, I would save you. Tell her I tried. I will tell her. Is the pain very bad? It, it's nothing with your arms about me. It's so funny. When I waited for you, you did not come. Now you have come. And I must go away. You will remember that day in the desert? I will always remember. Victor, shall we bet just once more? Cigarette. And that was the way she died, out there on the desert, in my arms. Poor Cigarette. She loved you too, darling. And she wanted to save you, for me. I shall always be grateful to her for that. Venetia, that day you spoke to her, did you tell, did you tell her who I am? No, darling. I'm glad now. She said that you were her kind. And wherever she is now, she'll be happier believing that. With the falling of the curtain on under two flags comes a promise from our stars to return to us before this hour is over. Standing beside me now is a woman known to theater goers for many years. First as a dancer, then as producer of the, mo of the famous uh, Fanchon and Marco stage shows. From among her performers have risen such stars as Myrna Loy, Janet Gaynor, Lita Roberti, Merth Martha Ray, and Mary Lewis. Her career reached a new high a few days ago when Paramount released Turn Off the Moon with Eleanor Whitney, Johnny Downs, and Charles Ruggles. It was produced by our guest and goes down in picture history as the first film ever produced by a woman at a major studio. Ladies and gentlemen, Miss Fanchon. For many years, ladies and gentlemen, the two names, Cecil B. DeMille and Lux, have meant a great deal to me. In fact, Mr. DeMille gave me my first chance to direct dances and pictures. Mm -hmm. Miss Fanchon staged the candy ball for me in a film called The Golden Bed back in 1925. But she didn't continue in pictures very long. Didn't you like them, or didn't you like the mill? I assure you that it was only the pictures. Today, however, with the best in stories, actors, and photography, and with men like you still at the helm, I'm sure there's no medium of entertainment like the screen. You also mentioned Lux a moment ago. I can't say too many nice things about Lux Flakes. Did you mean uh, you can think of something that you're... Former orchestra leader, Melville Ruick, hasn't already said? Well, I can say that at one time, Marco and I had as many as a thousand girls performing throughout the country in our stage shows. And do you know, Mr. DeMille, that a part of the equipment of each of those girls was a box of Lux Flakes? It's by far the best way of keeping costumes beautifully fresh, and it's especially good for silk stockings. I've used Lux countless times myself when Marco and I were starting out. It was more important to me to keep my costumes looking right than it was to eat. When it came to deciding between a hamburger and a box of Lux, my stomach was usually the loser. That's what I think about Lux. As, as the first woman to produce a major studio picture, what do you think makes a good film? Well, I hope to show that in my next two pictures, Summer Romance and Argentine Love. I believe in youthful romance and comedy, music and dancing. In other words, an entertaining, light, happy production. 
I found out that about 99% out of 100 people that step up to that box office to buy a ticket do so because they want to be amused. I'm going to try to satisfy them. Edu- education has some place on the screen, too. Yes, but a cheerful story can educate just as much as preaching. Such a story teaches everyday practical things like what new in clothes, in dances, and an appreciation of good music. It teaches good manners, how to talk honestly, and how to live honestly. Lots of people turn to pictures as an escape from ordinary and very often sordid circumstances. They need hope and a little cheering up, a little laugh. And that's what I'm going to remember as long as I'm producing pictures. And now, Mr. DeMille, and all of you, my thanks. Good philosophy, Madam Producer. A moment now with the evening stars. Herbert Marshall, Olivia de Havilland, Rupi Velez, and Lionel Atwell. Again, my gratitude, C.B., for inviting me back to the Lux Radio Theater. And mine, too. And while I have an opportunity, a word of appreciation to Louis van den Ecker for his splendid account of the French Legion. Yes, it interests me particularly, Lionel, because in our research in my, for my next picture, The Buccaneer, I discovered that one of the Legion's greatest battles was fought in Mexico. I can tell you about that. Oh, please do tell us, Louis. Well, Olivia, it took place in 1863 near Veracruz at the time when Napoleon had made Maximilian emperor of Mexico. Only seven French soldiers survived, but the Mexicans admired the courage of the legionnaires so much that they allowed the seven men to leave the battlefield with a rifle. Well, perhaps it inspired Louise de la Ramée, for she wrote the book Under Two Flags not long afterwards. Yes, and it may surprise you to know that she wasn't French but English. But why did she use the pen name of Ouida? Because as a child, that was the way she pronounced Louise. <laughs> she was a strange personality took a particular delight in insulting everyone, lived on a lavish scale for years, and died almost penniless in Italy. That should teach us all to save our money, like I do. <laughs> <laughs> I wish you'd tell us how you do it, Luffy. Oh, it's easy, and lots of fun, too. I cook all the meals, I paint the garden, the garden furniture and the swimming pool for Johnny, you know, my husband, Johnny Weiss Miller. <laughs> and I don't let anybody put anything over me. I'm Mexican, all right, but somewhere I think maybe there was a Scotchman. <laughs> Excellente. Uh, I'm pretty good now, Mr. Lemieux. Excellente. Lemire. Well, CB, the clock moves around. <laughs> <laughs> and I know you have an important announcement to make a little later. So we'll join the audience and say our adieu in a little verse from Tuba. You may remember it. It starts, a little work, a little play. To keep us going, and so good day. A little warmth, a little light. Of love bestowing, and so good night. A little trust that when we die, we reap our sowing, and so goodbye. <laughs> Mr. Marshall, Mr. Haviland, Miss Bellas, Miss Rattle, our thanks. The dramatic treat in store for us next Monday night will be revealed in just a moment by Mr. DeMille. This is your announcer, ladies and gentlemen, Melville Ruick. Assisting our stars tonight were Lionel Pape as Captain Mingus, Kenneth Hunter as Lord Seraph, Leonard Mudie as Rake, Michael Visseroff as Ivan, Lal Shan Mera as Sidi Ben Yusuf, James Eagles as Cascadi, Lou Merrill as Pierre, Frank Nelson as Baron, David Kerman as Officer, Warren McCullum as Grivon, Ross Forrester as Ferrol, Harold Daniels as Adjutant, and Charles Emerson as a Doctor. Mr. Marshall appeared through courtesy of Paramount and RKO Studios. Mr. Haviland, Warner Brothers. Mr. DeMille, Paramount, Lionel Atwell and Louis Silver's 20th Century Fox, where the latter was in charge of music for the new film, Café Metropole. May I remind you now that next week will be National Cotton Week. All over the country, leading stores are featuring smart cottons attractively priced. Stop at your favorite store to see these exciting new clothes. A multitude of glamorous luxables to choose from. Smart stores everywhere are recommending the easy lux way which banishes wardrobe worry. Back now to Mr. DeBille. A year ago at this time, I was up to my boot tops in preparation for my 63rd picture. In the marching panorama of events from 1865 to 1875, I hope to show the character of a group of great Americans, their mighty courage, and resounding struggles to open the western frontier to civilization. The picture is the plainsman, and it makes me happy to announce that next Monday night, the plainsman comes to you for the first time on the air in the Lux Radio Theater. 
heard in the roles of Wild Bill Hickok and Calamity Jane, will be the stars who contributed so much to the success of the picture, Gary Cooper and Gene Arthur. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Flakes, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents Gary Cooper and Gene Arthur in The Plainsman. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. KNX, the Columbia Station, Los Angeles. The Columbia Workshop, under the direction of Irving Reese. Ladies and gentlemen, Columbia takes pride in inaugurating tonight a new series of programs dedicated to you and to the magic of radio, the Columbia Workshop. The Columbia Workshop believes in radio, in its past accomplishments and in its promise for the future. Radio has reduced the area of the world to a split second of time for the transmission of human thought and feeling through man's literature, his music, his spoken word. In the five centuries that bridged the years since Gutenberg invented movable types and gave the world the store of man's knowledge through the printed word, no discovery has promised greater potentialities for shaping the world's culture than the slim, swift path of the electric wave. With the speed of light, it cuts through the barriers of boundary, class, race, and distance. While these words, electrically amplified 100 trillion times from the microphone to the transmitters which hurl them on the air, are being sent to you on broadcast bands, a hundred other bands in the radio spectrum are busily engaged performing useful functions for man. At this second somewhere, 20,000 feet above the Earth's surface, giant aerial transport planes are winging their way above clouds, through night and fog following the straight, invisible electric path of the radio beam signal, which guides them unerringly to their destination. On the high seas, or near treacherous shoals and reef-strewn waters, the signal of the radio compass station points the way for mariners when the stars are hidden and the sextant useless. In hospitals throughout the world, electrical surgery and shortwave artificial fever machines, radio's contribution to medicine, are helping scientists in their onslaught against disease and pain. The Columbia Workshop dedicates itself to the purposes of familiarizing you with the story behind radio, both in broadcasting as well as in aviation, shipping, communication, and pathology, and to experiment in new techniques with the hope of discovering or evolving new and better forms of radio presentation, with a special emphasis on radio drama, to encourage and present the work of new writers and artists who may have fresh and vital ideas to contribute. The workshop earnestly asks your participation in these and future experiments. Your response alone will enable us to judge our progress, and we shall appreciate your letters, your criticisms, and your suggestions. Now, tonight we wish to try an unusual experiment in dramatic presentation. We're going to present two well-known short plays, one has been written for the microphone and one for little theater presentation. In the radio play, A Comedy of Danger by Richard Hughes, first produced by the British Broadcasting Company, the author created his setting for radio's dimensions alone. It would be almost impossible to present this play properly on a stage or on a screen. We shall attempt to produce the play, giving it every advantage of radio technique. And after you hear A Comedy of Danger, we shall present Percival Wilde's one-act play, The Finger of God. This play will be presented with a technique never attempted in radio before. Mr. Myron Sattler, well-known director of the Little Theater, has been asked to stage this play in the studio exactly as if he were presenting it before a theater audience. The performers will pay no attention to the microphone. They'll move around as the stage business demands on a special set which we have erected in the studio. Through the cooperation of the Columbia Engineering Department, a parabolic microphone, which can be focused like a spotlight, will be trained on the actors from a distance of 20 feet and will follow their movements as they go through the business the play calls for. But first, the radio play, A Comedy of Danger. A 
A gallery in a Welsh coal mine, 1,000 feet below the surface of the earth. The lights have gone out. What's happened? Where are you? Here. Where? I can't find you. Here. I'm holding my hand up. I can't find you. Well, right here. Oh, what's that? <laughs> it's all right. It's only me. Oh, you did frighten me. Touching me suddenly like that. I had no idea you were so close. Get her in my hand. Whatever happens, we, we, we mustn't do these other. Oh, that's better. But the lights, why have they gone out? Oh, I don't know. I suppose something's gone wrong with the dining room. They'll, they'll turn them up again in a minute. Oh, Jack, I hate the dark. Cheer up, darling. It'll be all right in a minute or two. So frightfully dark down here. No wonder. There must be nearly a thousand feet of rock between us and the daylight. Not surprising, it's a bit dusky. I didn't know there could be such utter blackness as this ever. It's so dark, it's as if there was never such a thing as light anywhere. Oh, Jack, it's like being blind. They'll turn the lights up again soon. I wish we'd never come down to this beastly mine. I knew something would go wrong. It'll be all right, dear. It's, it's only the lights. Where are the others? Oh, we're just on ahead, not far. Suppose we get lost. We can't get lost, Mary, darling. The others will stand still, too, till the lights go up, and then we can easily overtake them. We've only got to wait patiently. I wish you hadn't wanted to drop behind the others. Oh, Jack, I'm afraid of the dark. Oh, my mistake. Buck up, Mary, old girl. It'll soon be over. Listen. Someone coming. Oh, you incompetent idiot. Turning the lights off just when the party visitors were seeing the place. Oh, it's Mr. Back. Hello. Hello. Who's there? Of all the stupid meddlesome idiots that I ever saw. Oh, Mr. Back, what's happened? Is it all right? Is it all right, indeed? Leaving us suddenly in the dark like this. But there has been an accident. Oh, goodness knows. I'd expect anything of a country like Wales. Wretched incompetent. Their houses are full of cockroaches. Ah. Well, I suppose the only thing to do is to sit and wait for the lights to go up again. There's no danger. <laughs> no danger, young lady, but it's dead unpleasant. <laughs> oh, I don't know. I'm beginning to think it's rather fun. Well, if you can find any fun in breaking your shins in the dark. Why I'll... don't you call it fun? Being in a mine disaster? Uh, but uh, this isn't a disaster. It's only the lights. <laughs> no, of course, eh? You don't think it would be fun if it were a real disaster, do you? But the light going out might have been a disaster. And think how thrilling it's going to be to talk about it afterwards. I say, Jack. Yes? Let's pretend it's serious. Uh, what do you mean? Well, let's pretend it's a real disaster. And we're cooped up here forever, and we'll never be able to get out. Well, don't joke about it. Well, no. There's no real danger, is there? Let's get all the thrills we can. Well, all the morbid ideas. Young people nowadays I'm are... I'm not thrilled. Let's pretend the roof's falling in. And they can't get at us. <laughs> All right. The baby you are. Uh, here we are, my dear. Very delight. Oh, Jack. Alas, they will never find us. Oh, Jack. Well? I'm so frightened. What else? About the roof having fallen in. But it hasn't. It's only pretend. Yes, but when I pretend, it seems so real. Well, then don't pretend. But I want to pretend. I want to be frightened. <laughs> only hold my hand tight, won't you? Go on. We shall suffocate or starve or both, my dear, in each other's arms. Oh, Jack. Even death shall not part us. Oh, Jack, don't. It's too awful. Our poor young life cut so short. Oh, don't. No. No. There'll be articles in all the newspapers. Oh, I wish I could read them. Well, you can't have your funeral and watch it, young lady. Oh, this is fun. I wouldn't miss it for anything. Jack! 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 Quiet. Let's go. You're proud of me. Leave go of me. No! Stop! Stop! Scream! Oh, Jack! Put yourself together. We're all right. We're not hurt. No, no, we're not hurt. But listen. Water. Oh, no. Uh, it's only an echo. Oh, Mr. Bag, can't we find the other? I, I don't think we could, young lady. It wouldn't um, be much use to us if we did. The echo's getting louder. Yes. It isn't an echo. It is water. The mine's flooding. We'll be drowned. Oh, it's an echo. Oh, Jack, I don't want to die. I won't. I won't. I won't. Oh, it, it's got to come sometime, young lady. Isn't it better for us that now in your lover's arms, both of you together? You old fool, it's very well with this stoical about death at your age, but we're young. We've got all life before us. Well, can't you keep quiet about it then, you young Japanese? Do you think I want to die either? But it isn't good manners to talk about it. 
Where would it be if we all started screaming about it, eh? We can at least die in that gentleman. Die in Indeed, I, I tell you, it's very well for an old chap like you who'll die anyhow in a year or two. But it's different for us way down. Well, if you want to make a scene, you shall have one, sir. Do you think it's any easier for the old to die than the young? I tell you, it's harder, sir, harder. Life is like a trusted friend. Girls more precious as the years go by. Ah, oh, what's your life worth to the world? Who's dependent on you? What good are you to anyone? Well, what, what good are you, young man? One person is dependent on me anyway. You mean that you're loved by this young lady? If you both die, what loss is that to the world? After this process is cancelling out. Oh, you base. You cruel I'm, I must speak, madam, in common justice to my age. Since that young cub has started the subject, the old all is being treated with her unwillingness to die. Look here, instead of talking like this, let's do something. Let, let's make some sort of an attempt to escape. What do you propose to do, young man? Why, look for some way out. We can't stay here and drown like rats in a cage. Oh, the dark. I do hate the dark. I think I could go more easily if I could see light. Just once what has happened. It's coming closer. Listen. Yes. It would be on us in another five minutes. Pray heaven the centuries are off quickly. Oh, think of dying somewhere out in the open, in the sunlight. Me able to see you, and you able to see me. What bliss that would be. It's strange. How little cats wonder what will happen to them after death. One hardly thinks about it. Yet I don't know. How thrilled we should be if, if we met a chap who really knew. Five minutes. We're going to know ourselves. All three of us. I've always wanted to travel. Now I'm going to. Oh, Jack. My <laughs> poor dear. You know, I'm beginning to feel as excited about it as a child going to the seaside for the first time. Aren't you? Jack, how queer you are. I never looked at it like that. Well, I, I wasn't in any hurry to die, but now it's coming up. I feel sort of proud of myself, as if it was a wonderful thing to manage to pull off. Oh, Jack, There's darling. only one thing I'm sorry about. What is it? My work. If it wasn't for that, I'd go to death without carrying a tuppenny damn. I'd die just for the fun of the thing, to see what it felt like. I shouldn't worry about that if I were you. The world would get on all right without you, never you fear. And what is your work? I write poetry, man. And you call that work? Jack, the water's coming. It's over my feet. Oh! Sorry, darling. Jack, I don't want to die. I hate it. I loathe it. I want to live. No, don't make fun of you. You don't think it's fun for me, do you, having to die? Jack, it's awful. Only for one more hour. Oh, I do want to live another hour. Oh, God, can't I be allowed to finish my work? And block oh. your work, sir. Do you think you're the only, the only one dying before his time? I tell you, every man dies before his time. Even if he lives till he's as old as must use it. Oh, it's don't touch at me like that, man. It, it, it won't do any good. Well, the water, the current, washing me away. Hold tight, then. Got you tight. Oh, if I could only see you. Just, just think of all the things I meant to do. Oh, shut up about the things you meant to do, you young cub. Will you realize we're all in the same boat? And it is hard for me to die as it is for you. Oh, worse, my dad. A thousand times worse. You hoary old sinner. Can't you prepare to get out of the world instead of cursing at me? Oh, Jack, let's play. Pray if you like, Mary. I can't. Oh, Jack, don't. Uh, uh, I can't die. I'm an old man. I won't. I won't. Oh, hold oh, yourself in, you old coward. Poor oh, Mr. Bat. I'm quite calm now. I don't mind dying. Yes. Why? Not so quick. Help me! Help me! Help! It's no good, Mr. Bat. No one can possibly hear us. The only thing is to keep calm. It won't be long now. Help! 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 What's that? Help! 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 They'll find us if they're quick enough. Fire along, still. That's right. They can't be quick enough. Besides, I don't want them to find me. Help! Be quick, you fools! Quick, we are drowning! Oh, why can't you behave sensibly? Yes, darling. I'll never leave you. How do you know they let you stay with him, you little fool? What do you know of death? Death means nothing. Not even the breath of the wind. 
for me a drop of the rain. Not even a dirty ghost dragging his chains on the staircase. It's up to my chin. Help me. Let me just do my arms, darling. If anyone gets up to my chin, we'll die together. Tell me, it isn't true what he's been saying. Oh, no, no, darling. Of course it's not true. Hurry up, you ghost! You blockhead! Smack your way in! We're drowning, I tell you! Drowning! Quick! Quick! Yes, yes. They must be nearly through. Oh, this, this suspense. How much longer before we know that we're going to live or die? I don't care which. But I do want to know. Look. There's a light. A hole in the roof. Wait. Wait. They're through. Quick. Right below there. Catch hold of the rope. Quick. I'm an old man. There's a girl here. My God, Jack. Let me see. Come along, young lady. I've got the rope. No, no, never mind. I'll shut up here. She'll be all right. I'll give you something to write about too, my boy. Oh, all right about there. Uh, have you got her? Right. Alba Nick. Up you go. Quick, Mr. Beck. The water's still in no, no, right. No, no, my boy. After you, you're more value in the world than I am. Nonsense, sir. After you, you're an older man than I am. Quick now. There won't be time. You, you, you've got nearly to think of now, Jack. All the way above there. No, no. No me. It's me you're holding up. You don't want to be back. Oh, we'll have you up first. There's no time to wait. Throw her away again. Below there. Hey, back! Catch her! Have you got it? Hi! Back! God. She's gone. And now we are about to present Percival Wilde's play, The Finger of God, with a technique heretofore untried in radio. An engineer is stationed about 20 feet from the performers, focusing a parabolic microphone on them as they move around the especially set stage. This will allow them an unrestricted movement, which ordinarily cannot be done in present radio production. Percival Wilde's The Finger of God. The living room of Strickland's apartment. As the curtain rises, he is kneeling and burning some papers in a grate near the main door. Benson, his valet, is packing a suitcase which lies open on the writing desk. Benson? Yes, sir? Close the window. It's cold. Yes, sir. Why, sir, the window's closed. It's been closed all evening. Benson? Yes, sir? Don't forget a heavy overcoat. I've put it in already, sir. Plenty of fresh linen? Yes, sir. Colors and ties? I've looked out for everything, sir. You sent off the trunks this afternoon? Yes, sir. You're sure they can't be traced? I had one wagon taken to a vacant lot. And another wagon taken to the station. Good. I checked them through to Chicago. Here are the checks. What train do we take, sir? I take the midnight. You follow me sometime next week. We mustn't be seen leaving town together. How will I find you in Chicago? You won't. You'll take room somewhere, and I'll take room somewhere else till it's all blown over. When I want you, I'll put an ad in the Tribune. You, uh, you don't know when that will be, sir. As soon as I think it's safe. Maybe two weeks, it may be a couple of months. But you'll stay in Chicago till you hear from me one way or the other, you understand? Yes, sir. Have you plenty of money? Not enough to last a couple of months. Well, how much do you want? Five or six hundred. Wait a minute. I left that much in my bureau drawer. Oh, uh, uh Mr. Strickland. Yes? It's the midnight train for Chicago, isn't it? Yes. Hello? Hello. Hello, this is Finley. This is Benson. He's going to take the midnight train for Chicago, Pennsylvania. You'd better arrest him at the station. If he wants to get to Chicago, you'll never find him. And, uh, uh, Finney, you won't forget me, will you? I want $5,000 for it. Yes, yes, 5000 Well, that's little enough. He's got almost 300000 on him. You won't turn in all of that to headquarters, will you? Yes, 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 it's cash. Large bill. Uh, midnight to Chicago.
Here's your money, Benson. Thank you, sir. Uh, shall I go now? No, wait a minute. Hello, Pennsylvania? I want a compartment for Chicago, midnight train. Yes, tonight. Don't give your own name. No. The name is Stephen. Oh, you have one reserved in that name already? Well, this is Alfred Stephen. You have it reserved in that name? Then give me another compartment. What? You haven't any other? Never mind, then. Goodbye. Benson, go right down to the Pennsylvania and get the compartment reserved for Alfred Stephen. You've got to get there before he does. Wait for me at the train gate. Yes, sir. Now, don't waste any time. I'll see you later. Very well, sir. Who's there? I, sir. Who are you? Why, don't you remember me, sir? No. I'm from the office, sir. The office? Your office. I'm one of your personal stenographers, sir. Oh, I suppose I didn't recognize you on account of the hat. Well, what do you want? There were some letters which came late this afternoon. You're bothering me with them now. I've got no time for that. You'd better go. I thought you'd want to see these letters. Plenty of time tomorrow. But you won't be here tomorrow, will you? Won't be here? What do you mean? You're taking the train to Chicago tonight. But how did you know... Taking a train to Chicago? Of course not. What put that into your head? Why, you told me, sir. I told you? You said so this afternoon. I didn't see you this afternoon. No, sir. Then I found this timetable. Where did you find it? On your desk, sir. On my desk? Yes, sir. You're lying. Mr. Strick. That timetable never reached my desk. I lost it between the railroad station and my office. Did you, sir? But it's the same timetable you see. You checked the midnight train. I reserved a compartment for you. You reserved a compartment? I knew you'd forget it. You have your head so full of other things. So I telephoned as soon as you left the office. I suppose you made the reservation in my own name? No, sir. What? I thought you'd prefer some other name. You didn't want your trip to be known. No, I didn't. What name did you give? Stephen, sir. Stephen? Alfred Stevens. What made you choose that name? I don't know, sir. You don't know? No, sir. It was just the first name that popped into my head. I said Stevens, and when the clerk asked for the first name, I said Alfred. Have you ever known anybody of that name? No, sir. You're sure you never knew anybody of that name? How can I be sure? I may have. I don't remember it. How old are you? You're not 20, are you? You think so. And I'm 47. It was more than 25 years ago. You couldn't have known. No, sir. What is your name? Does it matter? You didn't recognize my face a few minutes ago. My name can't mean much to you. I'm just one of the office force. I'm the girl who answers when you push the button three times. These are the letters I brought with me. Well, what are they about? Well, this one's from a woman who wants to invest some money. How much? Only a thousand dollars. Why didn't you turn it over to the clerk? The savings of a lifetime, she says. Well, what of it? Well, she wrote that she had confidence in you. She says she wants you to invest it for her yourself. You shouldn't have bothered me with that. Did she enclose the money? Yes, a certified check. Well, write her that. Oh, you know what to write. But I'll give the matter my own attention. Yes, sir. She says she doesn't want a big return on her investment. She wants something that will be perfectly safe. And she knows you'll take care of her. Yes, of course. Well, what else have you? A dozen other letters like it. All from old women? Some of them. Why did you bring them here? Every one of these letters asks you to do the investing yourself. Oh. And you're leaving town tonight. Here are the checks. Every one of them's made out to you personally, not to the firm. Well, you shouldn't have come here. I haven't time to bother with that sort of thing. Every man who has five dollars to invest asks the head of the firm to attend to it himself means nothing. I get hundreds of letters like those. Still. Well, what? You must do something to deserve such letters or they wouldn't keep on coming in. It's wonderful to inspire such confidence in people. Do you really think so? Oh, it's more than wonderful. It's magnificent. These people don't know you from Adam. Not one in a hundred has seen you. But they've all heard of you. And what's even more real than you is your reputation. Something in which they rest their absolute confidence. So you think there are few honest men? No, there are many of them. But there's something about you that's different. Something in the tone of your voice and the way you shake hands. Something in the look of your eye that's reassuring. 
Oh, there's never a doubt, never a question about you. It's splendid, simply splendid. What a satisfaction it must be to you to walk along the street and know that everyone you meet must say to himself, there goes an honest man. It's been an inspiration to me. To you? Oh, I, I know you don't remember who I am. But you don't imagine that anyone can see you as I've seen you, work with you as I've worked with you, without there being some kind of an effect. You know, in my own trouble... Oh, you have trouble. Oh, you don't pay me a very big salary, and there are others whom I'm he I must help. But I'm not complaining. I used to be like the other girls. I used to watch the clock and count the hours and the minutes till the day's work was over. But it's different now. How different? I thought it over. Made up my mind that it wasn't right to count the minutes you worked for an honest man. Are you sure I'm an honest man? Don't you know it yourself, Mr. Strickland? You remember a few minutes ago you spoke the name of Alfred Stevens? Yes. Suppose I told you there once was an Alfred Stevens. Suppose I told you that Stevens, whom I knew, stole money. Stole it when there was no excuse for it, when he didn't need it. His people had plenty and they gave him plenty. But the chance came and he couldn't resist the temptation. He was 18 years old then. He didn't even know what to do with the money when he had stolen it. They caught him in less than 24 hours. It was almost funny. He was punished. He served a year in jail. And what a year. His folks wouldn't do a thing for him. They said such a thing had never happened in their family. He told his family that he never wanted to see them again. He changed his name so they couldn't find him. He left his hometown. He came here. And he's been honest ever since. Ever since. For 28 years. It was hard at times, terribly hard. It managed to live. It wasn't pleasant living. It wasn't even decent living, but he stayed alive. I don't like to think of what he did to stay alive. He thought the year in jail was terrible. The first year he was free was worse. He'd never been hungry in jail. Then his chance came. Yes, it was a chance. He found a purse in the gutter, and he returned it to the owner before he made up his mind whether to keep it or not. The man who owned the purse gave him a job. Then they said he was a hard worker. And they promoted him. They made him manager. They gave him more chances to steal. But there were so many men watching him, so many men anxious for him to make a slip so that they might climb over him that he didn't dare. And then? Well, the rest was easy. Nothing succeeds like a good reputation. And he didn't steal because he knew they'd catch him. But he wasn't honest at bottom. The rotten streak was still there. After 28 years, things began to be bad. He speculated, lost all his money and made up his mind to take other money that wasn't his. It was wrong. It was the work of a lifetime gone. But it was the rottenness in him coming to the surface. It was the thief he thought dead coming to life again. What a pity. He'd been honest so long, he'd made other people think he was honest. Was he wrong, Mr. Strickland? Stephen, please. Look, I don't know what sent you, who sent you, but you've come here tonight as I'm running away. Well, you're too late. You can't stop me. Not even the finger of God himself could stop me. I've gone too far. Look, here's money. Hundreds of thousands of it, not a cent of it mine. And I'm stealing it, do you understand me? Stealing it. Tomorrow the firm will be bankrupt and there'll be a reward out for me. Here, if you please, is your honest man. What have you to say to him now? The man has been honest so long that he's made himself think he's honest. Can't steal. Do you believe that? I was left a little money this week, only a few hundred dollars, hardly enough to bother you with. Will you take care of it for me, Alfred Stephen? Good God. What a beautiful night. Thousands of sleeping houses, millions of shining stars, and the lights beneath. And in the distance, how the stars and the lights meet so that one cannot say, here God ends, here man begins. Yes? You're afraid I'm going to miss the train? Well, I am going to miss it. I'm going to stay here and face the music. I'm an honest man, do you hear me? I'm an honest man. There! Did you hear what I told him? Did you hear what I... Why, where are you? Where are you? Why, she's gone. She was never here at all. The 
the Columbia Workshop has presented as its first program a demonstration of radio and stage technique. Will you write and tell us how you liked the demonstrations and whether or not the illusion in the stage play had any advantages or disadvantages over the radio presentation? The Columbia Workshop's presentation was conceived and directed by Irving Reese. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. The National Broadcasting Company presents Radio City Playhouse, Attraction 27. gentlemen, here is your director, Harry W. Duncan. Thank you, Bob Warren. Friends, it is always a pleasure, uh, even an honor, to welcome Jan Miner and John Larkin to Radio City Playhouse. It is a pleasure because they are fine people and an honor because they are very talented artists indeed. Their joint appearance invariably results in an exciting broadcast, as all of you know who are regular listeners, and we feel that our play tonight is no exception. Also with us this evening, Mr. Stefan Schnabel, whom we welcome to the Playhouse most heartily. Here, then, our two favorite performers, Jan Miner and John Larkin, with Stefan Schnabel in One from Three Leaves Two, Attraction 27 on Radio City Playhouse. <laughs> September in the Swiss Alps. A party of 12 has set out to climb the Matterhorn, one of the most exciting and romantic mountains in the world. There are 12 in the party, but our story concerns only the leading three people in the winding, straggling line. By four o'clock of the first day out, the group had arrived at the hut shelter which overlooks the sea of glaciers around Mount Rosa. At five the next morning, they were again on the climb. The air is clear, but the wind chips needle points of ice from the mountainside and hurls them against the upward struggling faces. 13,000 feet, and still up. Up, up, up. Slowly, painfully, gaspingly, for the air has thinned. Suddenly, one of the party stumbles and grabs at a large rock which loosens from its bed. The rock rolls and the climber screams. Suddenly, there is consternation. The third man from the front of the line steps against the wall of the mountain and twists his rope three times around a jutting crag of stone, hangs on, and prays. But the rolling rock becomes two, the two become four, and the four become a thousand. The dread call is heard. deafening. The avalanche gained in momentum. Millions of tons of rock and ice and snow flowed like a gigantic wave of water down, 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 down. Until at last there was silence. Except for the wind. Less than 30 feet above the three survivors is the last hut shelter before the summit. In silent, shaking terror, the three finally reach the hut and stumble in. The first is a woman, Stella Wainwright. I can't stand it. I can't stand it. The second is Dr. John Drebel. Oh, stop it for goodness sakes. Crying won't get us anywhere. The third is the guide, a young man known simply as Rudolph. Will you please stop crying? I can't. I can't. All of them gone. Swept away like... Please don't. Like, I, 
I, I think I'm going, going to be sick. No, you're not. Here. Here. Take a swig of this. Well, that's better. Please try to control yourself. Here, Rudolph, you want a drink? Thanks, Dr. Graver. Yes, I, I'm sick. I'm so cold. Sit down. That's it. Now try to hang on to yourself. Are you all right, Rudolph? Yes, Dr. Graver. I'm all right. I, 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 I'm so sorry. For heaven's sakes, control yourself. Just let me alone for a minute. Please. All right. Well, Rudolph, what do we do first? First, Dr. Greville, we make a fire. story. At 38, I feel like an old man. Ever since medical school, I've been chasing this cancer thing. You work for a year, then scrap it. Start all over again. I haven't had a holiday for ten years. That's why I came Will out... you stop he- playing with those keys? Well, it makes me nervous, jingling them all the time. You were rather easily made nervous, aren't you? I'm sorry. Please go on. Do you uh, really think you can cure cancer? Not cure it. But stop it irrevocably if it's caught early enough. It must be very rewarding. Clinic and everything. Helping people like that. Yes, it is. I uh, wish I could stop thinking Please. about... Please. The Hendricksons and Mrs. Bobian, all of them just swept away like... Just like... Like that. Dead. Oh, there's no use trying, Mrs. Wainwright. Please, please, well, You're I... a doctor. You're used to seeing people die. I've never seen anyone die. What's Rudolph doing? He said he would try to find a way down. Well, he's been gone almost half an hour. He'll be back. Well, I don't relish being left up here alone. Rudolph will be back. It's getting cold again. Can't you do something with that stove? Well, I think we should conserve the wood. Why? Well, I... Don't you think we'll get back down? Of course we'll get back down. Then it's... why are you saving the wood? I think it's only sensible to be careful. You're afraid, aren't you? You're just as afraid as I am, but you don't dare show it. We'll get back down. How long will the wood last? Well, how long will it last? You don't think we'll get back down, do you? We're going to have to stay here, aren't we? We're going to have to stay here and wait for someone to come after us. Maybe for days. Aren't we? Please, Mrs. Wainwright, for goodness sakes, control yourself and stop thinking about the mountain, about getting down. Now, tell me about yourself. I've told you my life story. Let's have yours. All right. I was a thing called a New York debutante. Highly decorative, but very useless type of female that dances well, plays bridge well, rides, shoots, skis, climbs mountains. And finally married somebody from Wall Street. Is that what you did? Yes. And then what? Then I couldn't take the ordinary responsibilities of marriage, and I divorced him. I see. Don't you approve? Am I supposed to? Not necessarily. Go on. I am also considered one of the ten best-dressed women in the world. I have quite a lot of money and very good teeth. I weigh 120 pounds. I almost got a B.A., but didn't quite make it. I almost had a baby and didn't quite make that either. I joined the wax because I thought it was the thing to do, and... Was discharged as emotionally unstable. I was rather ashamed of that because if Rudolph just went out to reconnoiter, why isn't he back? Now go on with your story. Oh, it's no story, Dr. Greville. I've never given anything of myself to anything. I'm selfish and I'm spoiled and... Am I embarrassing you? Just a little. Why? Because I want to like you. And the way you talk makes it very difficult. Well, that's certainly an honest comment. You're a very beautiful girl. Thank you, sir. If you'd relax. This is hardly the place to quarrel. It might be a place for you to grow up. Have we any cigarettes left? Yes, yes, we have three. Then I'll have one. Oh, madame has spoken. Well, you said there were three. Yes, and I can see you giving myself mine after you've had your share. I think I'll be able to manage. You'll probably smoke all three. Why have you suddenly become patronizing and rude? I... I'm sorry, Hugh. Never mind. Go on, take it. I don't want it. Well, make up your mind. Please, Dr. Greville, let's not snap at each other. Oh, Rudolph, we've almost given you up. Dr. Greville, we are in a very dangerous position. I I think we realize that, Rudolph. Well, perhaps not how dangerous, Dr. Greville. Will you both come to the window, please? We looked before, but we couldn't see anything. Fog has cleared now. Uh, How unbelievably beautiful. Yes, isn't it? Not to me. 
Well, you're used to it, Rudolph. Over there is Mont Blanc. To the north is the Jungfrau. Italy is there to the south. What's that one? Monte Rosa. The avalanche has swept away all the formation between the hut here and the hangover. You mean where the shoulder sticks out over the rest of the mountain? Yes. I don't uh, quite understand. If you will look straight down, Mrs. Wainwright. The hut is perched on the edge of a 6,000-foot drop. I am of the opinion it is not safe to stay here. You mean we're liable to topple over? The least jar would dislodge us. Well, then, uh, why don't we start down? Uh, that's just it, uh... What is it, Rudolph? It is a very difficult descent. Very difficult. I've been climbing mountains since I was a child. I've never seen anything like it. Well, we'll just have to be extra careful. I will go out now and try to cut steps in the ice to the first hangover. If I go beyond that, I cannot get back. From where the steps will stop, there will be 300 feet that... Uh... Come on, Rudolph. What are you trying to say? It, it is a very difficult situation. Well, being coy about it won't help. It is a question of the rope. Rope? Yes, there is not enough for three. What do you mean? I mean that there is not enough rope for three people to get down. Well, then one of us will have to get along without rope. Have you ever climbed a mountain before, Mrs. Wainwright? Once in Banff in Canada. There but I is don't... not enough rope for three people. Well, that's ridiculous. I don't see why if there's enough rope for one... Wait a minute, enough... Mrs. Wainwright. Just what do you mean, Rudolph? I mean that only two of us can make the descent. Well, you're the experienced one. You know this mountain backwards. You'll Mrs. Have... Wainwright... Without me, you and Dr. Greville would not progress 30 feet beyond the point where the steps would stop. Oh, nonsense. No, Mrs. Wainwright. It's better for one to stay behind and for you and Dr. Greville both to die. Oh, I don't believe it. I just don't believe it. We managed to get up and surely we can manage it. Rudolph. Get... Are you sure about this? Yes, Dr. Greville, I'm sure. I will be glad to give you and Mrs. Wainwright the rope, but you're inexperienced climbers. I would not let my worst enemy attempt this descent without me. There is nothing left to the overhang. It's as smooth as, as glass. The avalanche has removed every foothold. The only way we can get down is for, for one of you to be tied to me. I'm sorry. There is no other way. Well, then one of us can stay here. Yes, Mrs. Wainwright. One of us can stay here. Why do you say it like that? One of us can stay here, Mrs. Wainwright, but not inside this hut. I told you that. Every moment it is liable to go over the edge, even a strong wind would dislodge it. Well, nobody can stay outside in this weather. It's impossible. That is very true, Mrs. Wainwright. When do you and Mrs. Wainwright propose to start, Rudolph? Well, I will not leave Dr. Greville here by himself. We'll have to stay and wait for a rescue party. He'll never be Mrs. able to make... Mrs. Wainwright! I would suggest that you do as you're told and talk as little as possible. Oh, you would, would you? Why, you impudent, ill-mannered... That'll little... do, Mrs. Wainwright. Why does he think he is ordering me what to do and when to talk? The minute we get back, I'll have him discharged. I never... Thank you, Mrs. Wainwright. I see the idea has occurred to you. However, I shall repeat it. Without me, you will never get back at all. You will die of cold and exposure. I shall go out now and cut steps in the ice to the first shoulder. We must start in half an hour. Will you be ready, please, when I get back, Mrs. Wainwright? Yes, Rudolph, I'll be ready. And I'm sorry if I, if I was rude. I'd, I'd... I'll be as quick as I can. Can we uh, have one of those cigarettes now? Why not? Thanks. I have a cigarette lighter somewhere. Oh, here. Ah, that's some gadget. It works. Are those diamonds real? All 85 of them. Thanks. You're welcome. So cold. Horrible, stinking mountain. Well, I'll fix the fire. Oh, don't. Please, please don't. Why not? You're cold, aren't you? But you'll need the wood. I always say there's nothing like a good fire to keep the party going. Keep everybody warm and comfortable. I'm sure you'll be warmer soon. Why do you treat me like this? No, oh, I thought I was doing the right thing. Keeping you warm, comfortable, protected. Never let it be said that John Greville didn't Duncan. take it. A... Look, Dr. Greville, let's not get hammy. I may be a little thoughtless, but I'm not entirely callous. Aren't you? No, I'm not. 
I'll be all right. You won't be all right. The hut will stand. The hut won't stand. It's shaking now. I'll be the only one that's inconvenient. We can't leave you. We simply can't leave you. We'll all have to try to make it together. That means none of us will make it. Well, then we'll take that chance. Rudolph won't. Rudolph will do as he's told. Why don't you grow up, Mrs. Wainwright? we can't leave you here. We just can't leave you here to freeze. Look, which is it to be? Three of us for sure or me taking my chances? Rudolph has to go. He knows the way. He's experienced. He's a professional climber. We're not. We're frightened and green. There's only enough rope for two. Now, will you shut up and relax? I appreciate your concern, but there's no use having an emotional binge about it. You can't do it. Can't do what? Lose that clinic. Oh. But you've just raised the money. We Let's just... not talk about I it. I want to talk about it. If you stay up here, it means you'll die. Almost without any doubt, you'll be dead in a couple of days. Even if the hut does stand, there's nothing much to eat. A few crackers, a couple of cans If you of don't soup. mind, I'd rather not talk well, about it. Well, if you don't mind, I would. Since it's me that's staying behind, I think I deserve some consideration. John! May I call you John? Yes, if you wish. Well, I wish you'd just keep very still and listen to me for a moment. I Please have... don't interrupt. I know that the way you've been brought up, the way you've been taught to act, makes it, well, in fact, compels you to insist that I go with Rudolph. Mrs. Wayne... please. You promise not to interrupt. I know what you you're... You promise not to interrupt. You see, John, I... I haven't been a very happy woman. And I haven't been very... Well, I haven't been worthwhile. I'm trying not to make this sound melodramatic. I don't mean it to be, but... Well, then stop. It... it is melodramatic. Why can't you keep quiet a moment? Because I know what you're going to say, and it's ridiculous. Ridiculous? Dear God in heaven, why do men think that no woman can ever mean anything? Don't you suppose that I envy you? Don't you suppose that I'd like to be doing what you're doing? Do you think I'm happy the way I'm living? Do you think I enjoy going around with the dancing boys? Don't you think that I'm so bored most of the time I could throw up? I'm not interested in whether you're bored or not. Can't you possibly believe that I want to stay? That I honestly believe your life means more to the world than mine does? Can't you treat me as if I were, were a fellow human being instead of a... Of a... Instead of a what? What do you think I am? And what do I think you are? Come on, let's hear you say it. Forgive me, Dr. Greville. I apparently thought you were more of a man than you are. You know, if by any strange chance you've meant all this, then I'm sorry. You see, I don't have much to do with women like you. Most of my patients aren't anywhere near the ten best-dressed women in the world, and I'm afraid I don't think it's a very worthwhile distinction. I'm sorry if I've been rude. I don't want to stay here. I don't think your life is as valuable as mine. In fact, I don't think your life is valuable at all. I'm quite aware that looking at our plight philosophically, I'm perhaps doing the wrong thing by letting you go and staying here. Unfortunately, I just can't imagine doing anything else. <sighs> well, I guess that's settled. And it isn't because of what people would say. Nobody in New York would know that I just left you here. And even if they did, I don't know that I care. I think that my work is more important than my reputation. If people want to say I'm the kind of man who leaves women to fend for themselves on top of a mountain, so what? Now, it isn't any of the reasons you think, Mrs. Wainwright. It's just that all my life, I've worked to try to save lives. And I can't get out of the habit. Oh, this isn't happening. It's... The first time you face reality, it's a good thing. Do you want me to face it all out? Yes, if you like. I wonder if knowing all about a person makes you like that person more or... Or less. I don't intend to have a mutual confession period, if that's what you're driving Why at. Why can't you treat me as if I were adult? Because I don't think you oh, are. I would be if you give me the chance. Maybe I don't deserve it. Maybe I have been pretty giddy up to now, but I'm not exactly no good all the way through. Oh, I know you're not. Sometimes I've had moments when I was really quite proud of myself. Mm, what were they? Oh, at Khan once, I pulled a kid out of the Mediterranean. A scrawny little French kid that looked like he'd never had enough to eat. His mother saw it all happen. When I finally got him back to the beach, she put her arms around me, kissed me. I could taste the tears. She didn't say anything, just kissed me. And then started in to give the kid the wailing of his life. But I never forgot the feeling at that moment. Of... You think I'm being corny, don't you? No. No, I don't think you're being corny. Well, it's the only time I ever felt... Felt really good. Really good inside. I know. You've had many of those moments, haven't you? I've had a few. Can't we be very honest with each other, please? All right. I'd like you to kiss me. And I'd like you to call me Stella. All right. Stella. 
You're very different from the men I've known. Probably a lot poorer. No, well, maybe that, but that isn't what I meant. How am I different? If I knew exactly, maybe I could be more like you. It's a very nice thing to say. I don't deserve it. John, can't you feel it? This, or is it just this stinking, rotten mountain? Is it just that maybe you're going to have a hard time getting down and that... What is it? You can feel it, too? Can't you? Yes. Yes, I can feel it. The way I feel it? I think maybe the way you feel it, yes. But why? Why should it be this way? I don't know. Uh, can, um, can we split that last cigarette? I don't see why not. Here. Thanks. Ah, yes. The lighter again. Complete with 85 diamonds. And it worked. Thank you. Uh, what, uh, what do you really think your chances are? Oh, I don't know. But what do you think? I've been in some pretty tight places before. Well, do you think that... Oh, John, I'll get every rescue party in the country. I'll, I'll hire an airplane and drop you food. I'll, you get off. Sure, I'll get off. When you do, can we... Can we see something of each other? Oh, yes. A lot? Yes, a lot. What isn't the mountain, is it? It isn't the snow and danger and the cold. No, it isn't the mountain. Well, then what is it? I think we've... I think we've done what you said a while back. We've gotten to know all about each other. In a matter of a few moments. And what do you know about me? I know that... I know that you're not what you seem. That you're... You're very different from the other nine best-dressed women. In fact, I know that you don't belong here at all. All you need is a chance to... To give. And then? And then you'd become... A very wonderful person. Will you help me? I'll try. I'm going to get very silly in a minute. Not I... now, Stella. No. Let's save that for later. All right. But that's the way you want it. That's the way I want it. Would you kiss me once more? Rudolph will be back in a moment. I... I think we should save that for later, too. All right. Isn't it silly the way every time I look at that ladder I hate the rich? I don't think it's silly. Not at all. Do you remember how much it cost? Yes. But I'd rather not say. No, I'm curious. Tell me. Well, something over sixteen hundred dollars. To light cigarettes. Yes. To light cigarettes. And here's Rudolph. John, I love you. I've got to say it. I love you. Please tell me. Shh, not now. All ready, Rudolph? Yes, Dr. Grevy. Get your jacket on, Stella. Yes. Here, I'll help you. I love you. I love you. There we are. I'll see you safely off. Oh, what did I do with those mitts? On the floor. Oh, yes. Good. All right. Let's start, shall we? I'd like to speak to you, Dr. Greville. Oh? What is it, Rudolph? If Mrs. Wainwright wouldn't mind waiting outside. Well, Mrs. Wainwright minds very much. I haven't time to argue, Mrs. Wainwright. Will you please step outside, or do I have to... I don't to... think that would be a good idea at all, Rudolph. What do you want to say to Dr. Greville? Probably that Americans are crazy. I would prefer to speak to you alone, Dr. Greville. Would you mind, Stella? I most certainly would. I think we established the fact earlier that I was not a child. What do you want to say, Rudolph? Dr. Greville... I will leave you my over jacket and parka. I have very heavy underclothes. I will be warm enough so long as I keep moving. I think it is dangerous to sleep in this hut all night. I examined it before I came in. It can't possibly stand much longer. But he can't possibly sleep outside. He'd freeze stiff. We... Well, can't we fix this thing so it'll be safer? Mrs. And... Wainwright, you're a very nice woman. But you're not intelligent at all. There is very little chance that Dr. Greville will get out of this alive. The hut will not stand all night. He cannot get down off the mountain. It is 21 degrees below zero. I am sorry to upset your delicate, sensitive mind. But Dr. Grebel is probably going to die within a few hours, whether he stays in the hut or not. Now, well, that's quite clear. I suggest that we get started. There is my jacket and parka, Dr. Grebel. And now, Mrs. Wainwright, if you don't mind... I'm not going. I'm not going, I tell you. Stella. I'm not going. I'm not going to leave you here to certain death, and there's no use your saying anything about it, because I'm not going... Rudolph! I am sorry to do that to Mrs. Wainwright. I think you understand, Dr. Greville. I, I do not make a habit of striking women. But I do not make a habit either of arguing with hysterical American tourists on the top of the most dangerous mountain in the Alps. How shall we start? He's right, Stella. Now, just go quietly. All right. We will tie the rope now. Excuse me, Mrs. Wainwright. Go ahead. Is that too tight? No. That's all right. Yeah. 
Test the knot every once in a while. The rope gets hard when it's frozen. If the knot gets loose, call me. I'll tighten it. All right. Are you sure it's not too tight? No, that's fine. Dr. Greville, I am very sorry. I am very sorry about this whole afternoon. Goodbye. Come with us as far as the steps go. I am. The wind has gone down a little. It always does before sunset. You should make the lower shelter in a couple of hours. Dr. Greville, if you and Mrs. Wainwright want the rope, I will be glad to give it no, to no, you. No, 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 Rudolph. I, I think we've been through that. Then will you please go back to the cabin? I do not like this. It's goodbye. enough I... rope that you don't have to stand beside me. Walk on ahead a little. We'll do the best we can with the rescue party. Goodbye, Dr. Greville. Can't you say it? Even once. Oh, what's the use? Let's save it for later. Please. I'll get down all right, Stella. These people are used to mountains. They'll get up for me. They won't. No. No, they won't. Wait a minute, Rudolph. Just one second, please. Well, hurry, Mrs. Wainwright. Hurry. I love you, John Greville. I love you, John Greville. And you love me. Don't you? Stella, what's the use of trying to... Don't you? Please, Stella, let's not... Don't you? Rudolph is waiting. He... Say it! Yes. Yes, I love you. Oh, so help me, I love you. Then, kiss me goodbye. Oh, Stella. Goodbye, John. Goodbye, Stella. Stella! Stella, what are you... Stella! Rudolph, stop her! Stop her! She undid the rope! She undid the rope! I felt her, Rudolph, when she was... When I was kissing her, I felt her hands move. I didn't... Be careful, Dr. I didn't... Greville. Not near the edge. Oh, can you see? Can we do something? It is nearly a mile down the there. The fool! A crazy man, little fool! should have known it. Oh, God! <laughs> All day in my talk about... Dr. Greville, <laughs> please. That was a very brave thing she did. She is not what I thought. That woman. No. She's not... what I thought either. <laughs> Take the rope, Dr. Greville. Must get started. The rope. One from three, Dr. Greville. Leaves two. just heard Radio City Playhouse, Attraction 27, One from Three Leaves Two, as directed by Harry W. Junkin and written by Carrie Shaw and Emil Zubrin. Jan Miner was Stella Wainwright. John Larkin was Dr. John Greville. Stefan Schnabel played Rudolph. The music was specially composed and conducted by Dr. Roy Shields. Radio City Playhouse is supervised for the National Broadcasting Company by Richard P. McDonough. This is Harry Junkin again. Next week on Radio City Playhouse, a story about a drama critic. <laughs>
a very unpleasant man whose egomania made a great many people, including himself, very unhappy indeed. Please join us next week for Deadline, Attraction 28 on Radio City Playhouse. Good night, everybody. Speaking, this is NBC, the National Broadcasting Company. Lux presents Hollywood. Lever Brothers Company, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, bring you the Lux Radio Theater, starring Barbara Stanwyck and Fred McMurray in Double Indemnity. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. William Keel. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. A few years ago, I began a serial in a weekly magazine called Double Indemnity. And believe me, thereafter, I eagerly awaited each new installment. It was one of the most thrilling of James M. Cain's novels, and when Paramount Pictures brought it to the screen, I found the film even more exciting. My renewed enthusiasm was due to our stars, Barbara Stanwyck and Fred McMurray, who created two of the most electrifying characterizations of their careers. Double Indemnity is a drama of intense emotion between two people whose infatuation leads them to murder and revenge. And as a study in suspense, I'm sure you'll find it entirely satisfying. Just as the ladies of our listening audience find our product, Lux Toilet Soap, entirely satisfying for beauty care, especially these fall days. For throughout all the changes of weather, Lux Soap remains a favorite complexion care. Here's Double Indemnity, starring Barbara Stanwyck as Phyllis and Fred McMurray as Walter. Downtown Los Angeles. The night watchman of an insurance company has just opened the door for one of the employees. Working pretty late, aren't you, Mr. Neff? Yeah. yeah this can't wait till morning. Nothing wrong, is there, Mr. Neff? You, you look kind of funny. No, no, I'm fine. Thanks for letting me in. That's okay, Mr. Neff. Walter Neff walks unsteadily to his office. He wets a towel at the water cooler, presses it inside his coat to staunch a bullet wound, and slumps at his desk. His hand reaches to a dictaphone transcribing machine and turns on the switch. Memorandum to Barton Keyes, claims manager. Pacific All Risk Insurance Company. Dear Keyes, I suppose you'll call this a confession. I just want to set you right about... about the Diedrichson case. You said it wasn't an accident. Check. You said it wasn't suicide. Check. You said it was murder. Check. But you made one mistake, Keys. Just one little mistake. You want to know who killed Dietrichson? Hold tight to that cheap cigar of yours, Keys. I killed Dietrichson. Yes, I killed him. I killed him for money and a... and a woman... I didn't get the money, and I... I didn't get the woman. Pretty, isn't it? Let me light a cigarette. It all began last May. Around the end of May, it was. I had a call to make. A renewal on an automobile policy. 
door, Nettie. What is it? It's an insurance man. He wants Mr. Dietrichson. Well, how do you do? I'm Walter Neff, the Pacific All Risk Insurance Company. Well. Well, how do you do, Mr. Neff? I'm Mrs. Dietrichson. Oh. How do you do, Mrs. Dietrichson? That's all, Nettie. Yes, ma'am. It's, uh. It's about the renewal of automobiles. I can't seem to contact your husband at his office. And well, I... suppose we sit down and you tell me about it. My husband never tells me anything. I guess he's been too busy down at the Long Beach oil field. Uh-huh. Well, uh, maybe I could catch him at home some evening. Wouldn't take him to clear up. We've got a new kind of 50% retention feature in the colli- collision coverage. And... You're a pretty smart insurance man, aren't you? I think so. Doing pretty well? That's a living. Do you handle just automobile insurance or all kinds? Well, just name it and I'll write it, Mrs. Dietrichson. Accident insurance? Accident insurance? I should say so. Uh, that's a honey of an anklet you're wearing, Mrs. I'm Dietrichson. I'm glad you like it. There's something engraved on it, huh? Just my name. Phyllis. Phyllis, huh? I think I like that. But you're not sure? No, I'd have to drive it around the block a couple of times. We're getting away from insurance, aren't we, Mr. Neff? <laughs> Now, why don't you drop around tomorrow night about 8.30? He'll be home then. Who? My husband. You were anxious to talk to him, weren't you? Yeah, I was, but uh, I'm sort of getting over the idea, if you know what I mean. (laughs) There's a speed limit in this state, Mr. Neff, 45 miles an hour. How fast was I going? I'd say around 90. Now, tomorrow night at 8.30, then, huh? Will uh, you be here, too? I usually am. Same chair, same perfume, same anchor? I wonder if I know what you mean. I wonder if you wonder. Good afternoon, Mr. Dickinson. I can still remember the smell of honeysuckle all along the street. How could I have known that murder can sometimes smell like honeysuckle? Maybe you would have known, Keys, the minute she mentioned accident insurance. Well, I went back to the office. They said you'd been yelling for me all afternoon. Oh, come on in, Walter. Come on in. Don't you like to know about that Phillips case? Phillips? Yeah, you wrote a policy on his truck. His truck burned up. Oh, yeah, yeah. Look at this. Oh, claim waiver, huh? Yeah. Mr. Phillips suddenly decides to withdraw his claim. Mm-hmm. You knew all along it was a thorny, huh? My little man knew. My little man inside of me here. Every time one of those phonies comes along, he ties nuts on stomach. <laughs> what kind of amateurs are we? Well, now, wait a minute, Keys. Sure, I wrote that policy, but I said to have him thoroughly checked first. Oh, who's blaming you, sweetheart? I'm, I'm sick and tired of trying to pick up after you fast-talking stuff. Oh, you worry too much, Keys. You're too suspicious. No? <laughs> well, you wouldn't even say today's Tuesday unless you looked at the calendar, and then you'd check to see if it was this year's calendar, and then just to make sure, you'd get a copy of the all Get right? out of here before <laughs> I throw my desk at you. I love you, too. Yeah? <laughs> just thought you'd like to know we nailed another phony. Back in my office was a message from Mrs. Dietrichson. My appointment had been canceled. She wanted me to stop by on Thursday afternoon instead. Phyllis. Phyllis Dietrichson. I was there, all right. Oh, come in, Mr. Neff. I hope you didn't mind changing the appointment. Last night was inconvenient. No, no, I was working on my stamp collection anyway. I was just fixing some iced tea. Would you like a glass? Well, yeah, unless you've got a bottle of beer that's not working. Well, there might be some. Nettie! Oh, about those renewals, Mr. Neff. I talked to my husband. Oh, good. He'll renew all right. As a matter of fact, I thought he'd be here this afternoon. No, but uh, he's not. No. Uh, It's terrible. Nettie! Nettie, can't you hear... Oh, I forgot. It's Thursday. It's her day off. Uh Well, uh, iced tea will be fine. Lemon? Sugar? Fix it your way. As long as it's the maid's day off, maybe there's uh, something I can do for you. Like uh, running the vacuum cleaner. Fresh. You know, I used to peddle vacuum cleaners. Not much money, but you learn a lot about life. I didn't think you learned it from a correspondence course, Mr. Neff. <laughs> Make it Walter, huh? All right. Walter. Tell me, how much commission do you make on this insurance? Twenty percent. Why? Oh, I thought perhaps I could throw a little more business your way. Uh, my husband. I worry a lot about him in those oil fields. It can be very dangerous. Dangerous? For an executive? Oh, you don't know him. He's right down there with the drilling crews. It, oh. it, it's got me worried sick. Well, you mean some dark night a derrick might fall? Oh, talk of that. But that's the idea. Well, accidents happen all the time. Don't you think he should be insured? Well, sure. Well, what kind could he have? Well, enough to cover doctor and hospital bills. Say 125 a week cash benefit, and he'd rate about 50,000 capital sum. Capital sum? What does that mean? Well, in case the accident is fatal. No, 
Maybe I shouldn't have said that. Oh, I, I suppose you have to think of everything in your business. Well, why don't I talk to him about it? Well, you could try, but he's pretty tough going. <laughs> They're all tough at first. He has a lot on his mind. He, he doesn't seem to want to listen to anything except maybe a baseball game on the radio. Sometimes we sit here all evening and never say a word to each other. Hmm. Sounds pretty dull. Walter, I, uh, I want to ask you something. Could I get an accident policy without bothering him at all? How's that? Well, it would make it easier for you, too. You wouldn't even have to talk to him. I could pay for it, and he needn't know anything about it. Why shouldn't he know? Well, because he doesn't want accident insurance. He's uh, superstitious about it. A lot of people are. It's funny, isn't it? If there were a way to get it like that, all the worry would be over. See what I mean, Walter? I think it's lovely. And then if some dark, wet night the Derek did fall what on Derek? him... What, Derek? I don't know what you're talking about. Or maybe about. a car backing over him, or he could fall out of the upstairs Are window. Are you crazy? Even... Not that crazy, Mrs. Dietrich. What's the matter? Look, baby. You can't get away with it. You want him to die, don't That's you? That's a horrible thing to say. What do you take me for? A guy that walks into a good-looking dame's front parlor and says, Good afternoon, I sell accident insurance on husbands. Have you got one that's been around too long? Just give me a smile and I'll help you collect. I think you're rotten. I think you're swell. As long as I'm not your husband. Get out of here. You bet I'll get out of here. I'll get out of here, but quick, baby. I'd let her have it, Keys, straight between the eyes. I got hold of a red-hot poker, and the time to drop it was now before it burned my hands. But all the time I knew that I hadn't walked out on anything. That this wasn't the end. I knew that sooner or later my doorbell would ring, and I'd know who it was without even having to think. Hello. You forgot your hat this afternoon. Did I? How'd you know where I lived? The telephone book. It's raining. Yeah. Sit down. Your husband go out tonight? The oil fields. He phoned he'd be late. Oh, Walter, I must have said something that gave you a terribly wrong impression. You must never think anything like that about me. Okay. No, it's not okay. Not if you don't believe me. Well, what do you want me to do? I want you to be nice to me. Like you were at first. Something's happened. I know it has. It's happened to us. I feel as if he were watching me. Oh, not that he cares, but he keeps me on a leash so tight I can't breathe. Well, he's in Long Beach, isn't he? Relax. <laughs> you have a nice place here. Who takes care of it? A cleaning woman comes in now and then. You cook your own breakfast? I squeeze a grapefruit once in a while. You're alone, huh? Oh, that sounds wonderful. You don't have to sit across the table and smile at him and that daughter of his every morning of your life. Daughter? That's right. You didn't meet Lola, did you? He thinks a lot more of her than he does of me. Ever think about a divorce? Oh, he'd never give me one. Well, why'd you marry him? I wanted a home. Why not? Is that so wrong? But that's not the only reason. His first wife was sick a long time. I was her nurse. When she died, he was terribly broken up. I, I, I pitied him so. But now you hate him? Yes. Yes, he's just awful to me. Every time I buy a dress or a pair of shoes, he yells his head off. He's always been mean to me. So you lie awake in the dark and listen to him snore and get oh, ideas. Walter, I don't want to kill him. I never did, not even when he gets drunk and slaps my face. Only sometimes you wish he were dead. Perhaps I do. When you wish it was an accident and you had that policy for $50,000, is that it? Perhaps that, too. The other night we drove home from a party. He was drunk again. When we drove into the garage, he sat there, had a steering wheel and the motor still running. And I thought what it would be like if I didn't turn it off. Just closed the door and left him there. I'll tell you what it would be like. We've got a guy in our office named Keyes. In three minutes, he'd know it wasn't an accident. In ten minutes, you'd be sitting under hot lights. In 30 minutes, you'd be signing your name to a confession. Walter, I didn't do it. I'm not going to do it. Not if there's an insurance company in the picture. They know more tricks than a carload of monkeys. And if there's a death mixed on it, you haven't got a prayer. They'll hang you just as sure as ten dimes will buy a dollar, baby. And I don't want you to hang, baby. So stop thinking about it, will you? Oh, why did I come here? So we just sat there, Keys. And she started crying, softly, like the rain on the window. Maybe she'd stop thinking about it, but not me. I couldn't. It was all tied up with something I'd been thinking about for years. You know how it is, Keys. In this business, you can't sleep for trying to figure out all the angles they could pull on you. And then one night, you get to thinking how you could crook the house yourself and do it smart because you know every trick in the book. And then suddenly, the doorbell rings and the, the whole setup is right there in the room with you. 
Walter, I... I better leave. Will you phone me? Oh, I hate him. I loathe going back to him. You believe me, don't you? Sure. Sure, I believe I you. can't stand it anymore. What if they did hang me? They're not going to hang you. It's better than going on this way. They're not going to hang you because I'm going to help you do it. Do you know what you're saying? Come here. I'm saying we're going to do it, and we're going to do it right. And I'm the guy that knows how. Walter, you're hurting me. There's not going to be any slip-up, nothing sloppy, nothing weak. It's got to be perfect. Yes. Now, call me tomorrow, but not from your house. And watch your step every minute. This has got to be perfect, do you understand? Straight down the line, baby. Straight down the line. Good night, Walter. That was it, Keys. The machinery had started to move. Nothing could stop it now. The first thing to do was fix Dietrichs and that accident policy. Oh, I knew he wouldn't buy, but all I wanted was his signature on an application. That meant I'd have to get him to sign without his knowing what he was signing. And I wanted another witness besides Phyllis to hear, hear me giving him a sales talk. A couple of nights later, I went to the house. Everything looked fine, except I didn't like the witness Phyllis had brought in. Dietrichson's daughter, Lola. Didn't you hear me now if I just told you I don't want any accident? Well, now, look, course. Mr. Dietrichson, the only way you can protect yourself... Yeah, is yeah, to... yeah. Next thing you'll tell me is I need earthquake insurance or lightning That's insurance. That's right, honey. Why, if we bought all the insurance they'd tell us we need, we'd be broke all the time. Look... What keeps us broke is you're going out and buying five hats at a crack. But, Mr. Dietrichson, dollar for dollar accident insurance is the cheapest coverage you can buy. All I want is a renewal on that automobile insurance. Well, just as you say. Phyllis, do you mind if I go out? Got something better to do, Lola? Yes, I have. Father, is it all right if I run along? I'm going skating with Anne. Anne, huh? Or is it really that Nino Zacchetti again? Oh, Father, please. Better not be. If I ever catch you with that Zacchetti guy... It's Anne Matthews, Father. We're going ice skating. And if you don't mind, I'd rather not keep her waiting. Okay, go on. Good night, Father. Good night, Phyllis. Uh, Good night, Miss Edrickson. Glad I've met you. Thank you. A great little fighter for a wait. Well, uh, now if you'll just sign these papers, Mr. Dietrichson, you'll be covered till the new policies are issued. Just so I'm protected when I drive up north. He was a Stanford man, Mr. Neff. He still goes to his class reunion at Palo Alto. What's wrong with that? Can I have a little fun even once a year? What do I sign? The, uh, the bottom line. But both copies, please. How much are you taking me for? Well, I'll, uh, I'll figure it up later. I can pick up your check at the office. I think that's enough insurance for one evening, Neff. Yeah. I'm going upstairs, fellas. Bring me a drink when you come up. Now, good night, Mr. Dietrichson, and thank you. All right, Walter. It's fine. He signed, didn't he? Sure, he signed. Of a trip to Palo Alto. When? The end of the month. He drives. He huh? always drives. Well, not this time. You're going to make him take the train. Why? Because it's all worked out for a train. Now, listen, baby. There's a clause in every accident policy, a little thing called double indemnity. That means they'll pay double on certain accidents, the kind that almost never happen. Like, for instance, if a guy is killed on a train, they'll pay 100000 instead of 50000 I see we're hitting it for the limit, baby. That's why it's got to be the train. It'll be a train, Walter, just the way you want it. Straight down the line. In a few moments, we'll bring you the second act of Double Indemnity. Now, our producer, Mr. William Keeley. Act Two of Double Indemnity, starring Barbara Stanwyck as Phyllis and Fred McMurray as Walter. Earlier tonight, Walter Neff, insurance salesman, was shot and wounded. He was able to reach his office. There, at his desk, he continues to talk into the office recorder. A message for a man named Keyes. Well, Keyes, the first step was over. Phyllis and I had Dietrichson's signature on that application for accident insurance. I went out to my car. Waiting for me was Dietrichson's daughter, Lola. I thought you might give me a lift, Mr. Neff. Oh, oh, sure. (laughs) You like ice skating, huh? I can take it or leave it. Only tonight you're leaving it? Yes. Yes, I am. Could you take me as far as Franklin and Vermont? Yeah, I'd be glad to. Who's waiting on the corner there? His name is Nino Zacchetti. Well, that the fellow your father doesn't want you to meet? Nino's not what my father thinks at all. If Nino just weren't so darn hot-headed, if he'd only... I don't know why I'm telling you all this. 
Please, you won't say anything. I haven't heard a word, Mrs. Dietrichson. Miss Dietrichson. <laughs> Thanks, Mr. Ness. You're nice. I saw her run up to her boyfriend. I found myself hoping he was right for her. She'd be needing somebody now because... because her father was a dead pigeon. Only a question of time and not much time at that. Phyllis and I had to pick a place where we could meet, a safe place. We decided on that supermarket on Los Feliz Boulevard. She was to be there every morning around 11 o'clock, shopping. And I could run into her there, sort of accidentally on purpose. I've wanted to talk to you ever since yesterday, Not Walter. so loud. Move over to the shelves. Well, it's all set. The policy came through. Give it to me. Nobody's watching us. Can you get it in his safety deposit yes, box? Yes, we both have keys. You turn your head. Take something off of the shelf. Put it in the cart. You're nervous, Walter. I'm very calm. Remember, you never saw that policy. You never even touched oh, it. Oh, I'm not a fool, Walter. No. When is he leaving? You talk him into taking the train. You mean you? I can say something now? I've been trying to tell you the trip to Palo Alto is off. He isn't going. What happened? He had an accident at the oil field. His leg is broken. It's in a cast. He broke his leg. What do we do now, Walter? Nothing. Nothing. We just wait. Walk around, will you? We're supposed to be shot. But we can't wait. I can't go on like this. What do you suppose would happen if he found out about the policy? Nothing as bad as sitting in that death house. Don't ever talk like that. Well, don't let's start losing our heads, that's it's all. It's not our heads. It's our nerve we're losing. Oh, it's so awful without you, Walter. It's like a wall between us. I'm thinking of you every minute, baby. Don't ever stop, Walter. Don't ever. I let a full week go by, Keys, and I didn't even try to see Phyllis again. I kept telling myself that maybe those fates they say watch over you had broken his leg to give me a way out. And then it was the 15th of June. You may remember the date, Keys. You were in my office. I'll get it, Walter. Probably Norton looking for me. Mello. Yeah, 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 just a minute. It's for you, Dame. Oh. Hello. Is this Mr. Ness? Uh, Yes. Walter, I have to call you. It's urgent. Well, I'm busy, Margie. Uh, I'll have to call you back. You can't. I've only got a minute. Walter, he's going away tonight on the train. He's on crutches. The doctor says he can go if he's careful. Oh, it's wonderful, Walter, just the way you wanted it. On a train. Only with crutches, it makes it much better, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Keys, uh, suppose I join you in your office, huh? Oh, that's okay. I'll wait. Only tell the dame not to take all day, huh? Uh, Go ahead, Margie. Uh, Make it snappy. It's the 1015 from Glendale. I'm driving him there. It's still the same dark street, isn't it? And the signal is three honks on the horn. Anything else? Uh, oh, uh, what color did you pick? Uh, blue. Navy blue. And the cast is on his left leg. Yeah, that suits me fine. This is it, Walter. I'm shaking like a leaf, but it's straight down the line for both of us. I love you, Walter. I'll take care of everything. Goodbye, Margie. The dame's chasing you again? Or is it none of my business? Well, if I told you she was a customer, you... Margie, yeah? Customer? I bet she drinks from the bottle. (laughs) I better see what Norton wants. There you were, Keys, right there when Phyllis called me. And those fates I was talking about had only been stalling. Now they'd thrown the switch and the time for thinking had all run out. I wanted my movements accounted for up to the last possible second foolproof alibis. I drove my car into the garage in the basement of my apartment house. Wash job, Mr. Neff? Sure. Only have a couple of other cars ahead of you. Well, that's okay, Charlie. I'm not going out. I won't be needing it till morning. Okay, Mr. Neff. That'll give me time to do a good job on it. Then I called Mr. Norton, asked him to give me, ask him some phony questions about liability rates. He lives in Westwood Keys, a toll call. That meant there'd be a record of it. I changed into a blue suit, the same color Dietrichson would be wearing, and waited for Norton to call me back with the figures. Then I stuffed a hand towel and a roll of adhesive in my pocket so I could fake something that looked like a cast on a broken leg. Next, I stuck a card inside the telephone box. If somebody called me, the card would fall down when the bell rang. That way I'd know if anyone tried to get me while I was away. I did the same thing with the doorbell. I left my apartment by the service stairs and walked all the way to the Dietrichson house. It was easy getting into the garage. I got in the back of the car and lay there on the floor and waited. Finally, they came out. The car started. For a long time, they didn't say a word. You're pretty quiet. Leg bothering you? No more than usual. Remember what the doctor said. If you get careless, you might wind up with a shorter leg. So what? Makes you feel pretty good to get away from me, doesn't it? 
For three days. Hey, how come you're taking this street? What's wrong with it? You shouldn't have turned. This is the wrong street. What'd you turn here for? Why are you blowing that horn? Answer me. I said, why are you... Dietrichson was dead. That part was over. She kept driving around till I told her to head for the station. Everything all right, Walter? Did you cover him with a robe? Yeah, we can get out. Yeah, the crutches. I'll take care of the red cap and the conductor. I'll tell them to let you alone that you don't like to be helped. Ready? Yeah. Don't worry, Walter. I'll go as soon as the train leaves, straight down the highway as far as that refinery. Then I turn left onto the dirt road to the railroad track. You've got plenty of time, but watch your driving. You don't want any cops stopping you with him in the back. Oh, Walter, we've been through this so many times. I'll drop off the train as close to the spot as I can. There's a red cap coming. Car 9, Section 11. Just my husband is going. Oh, no, no, thank you. He doesn't like to be helped. Yes, ma'am. This way, please. The train was a few minutes out of Glendale. I hobbled back to the observation platform. I didn't have much time. Only I found that I wasn't alone. Can I help you, mister? Broken leg, huh? Yeah, I, uh, I just thought I'd like to see what it's like out here. No, no, thanks. I can manage fine. Going fine? Uh, Palo Alto. I'm going all the way to Medford, Oregon. My name's Jackson. Uh, how do you do? You uh, looking for something, uh, Mr... Dietrichson. It's just my cigar case. I, I guess I left it in my coat back in the car. Maybe I can find a port. Oh, you just stay where you are, Mr. Dickerson. Oh, thanks. I'll be glad to get him for you. Hey, what car? Well, it's car 9, section 11. A dark gray top coat. Be right back, Mr. Dickerson. I had stayed in the shadows. Jackson never did get a good look at my face. But there was no time to think about him. I climbed over the railing and dropped off. Walter, you're all right. You're yeah. not hurt. No, no, not a scratch. Can you see the cart down there? Yeah, I can see it. Can you manage him alone? Yes. What do you want me to do? Nothing. I'll walk down the road a little, just in case. I'll wait for you. I carried the body to the tracks. As we drove back, we went over once more what she was to do at the inquest and about the insurance when that came up. Yes, Walter, yes, I know just what to do. Did you think I'd go all to pieces now that it's over? I said I'd help you, Walter. Maybe now you'll believe. Not a nerve, Keys. Not even a tear. Not even a blink of the eyes. She dropped me off a block away from my apartment house. We'd better not see each other for a while, darling. Oh, it's going to be awful. We can meet in the market, say, on Thursday. Walter. Well? You're going to leave me, just like that? Aren't you going to kiss me? Straight down the line, isn't it? I love you, Walter. That's all there was to it, Keys. Perfect. Every detail. And yet, as I walked down the street, suddenly it came over me that everything would go wrong. It sounds crazy, Keys, but it, it was true, so help me. I couldn't hear my own footsteps. It was the walk of a dead man. The next day, it was worse when the story broke in the newspapers. And the day after that, when I knew you'd start digging into it. Then Norton, the supervisor, said he wanted to see me. Sit down, Walter. About that Dietrichson case. Yes, Mr. Norton. Anything wrong? We had him insured, Walter. It's going to cost us a lot of money. That's always wrong. Uh-huh. Uh huh. What about the inquest? His wife and daughter made the identification. Verdict: accidental death. What do the police figure? He got tangled up in his crutches and fell off the train. They're satisfied. It's not their money. Can I come in? Well, did you find him, Keys? That Jackson fellow? 
Yeah, I just talked to him in Medford. Oh, hello, Walter. Who's Jackson? The last man who saw Dietrichson alive. There's not much he can tell us either. Well, that's fine, isn't it? And a great piece of salesmanship when we sold Dietrichson that policy. Oh, no, there's no use pushing Walter around. Is he supposed to know when a guy's going to fall off a train? Fall off? Are you sure Dietrichson fell off? Yes. Yes, I am. Not even one of those interesting little hunches of yours? I'm surprised, Keys, because I formed a very definite opinion. I know that it wasn't an accident. Not an accident? Well, you seem surprised, Walter. But what about you? Me? You've got the ball, Mr. Norton. Let's see you run with it. All right. Watch. Yes, Mr. Norton? You can send her in now. There's a widespread feeling that just because a man has a big office, he's an idiot. I'm having a visitor. I want you both to stay and watch me handle this. Mr. Norton, this is Mrs. Dietrichson. This was it. How do you do, Mrs. Dietrichson? This was a finish. Won't you be seated, please? My hand shook so I had to put them in my pockets. Is it Mr. Keyes? Who would give it away first? Department. Phyllis? How do you do? Or do you do? I. And, uh, he knew. Mr. Neff. How do you do? Norton said he knew. You know why we asked you to come here, Mrs. Dietrichson? All I know is that your secretary made it sound very urgent. Something about uh, accident. Yes, Mrs. Dietrichson. Your husband was insured. You'll probably find the policy among his personal papers. His safe deposit box hasn't been opened yet. Meanwhile, I'm afraid we're not at all satisfied with the report of the inquest. I don't know what you mean. Frankly, we suspect suicide. Now, you said at the inquest that your husband had no worries of any kind. Yes, yes, I said that. Yet only a short time ago, he takes out an accident policy and tells you nothing about it. Why? Because he doesn't want his family to suspect what he intends to do. Do what, Mr. Norton? Commit suicide. In which case, Mrs. Dietrichson, this company is not liable. Now, we could go to court, you know. No, I don't know anything. I don't even know why I came here. I didn't say we want to go to court. What I suggest is a, a settlement of some Don't sort. bother, Mr. Norton. When I came in here, I had no idea your company owed me money. You told me you did, and then you told me you didn't. Now you tell me you want to pay a part of it, whatever it is. You want to bargain with me at a time like this. I don't like your insinuations about my husband, and I don't like your methods. In fact, I don't like you, Mr. Norton. Goodbye. Yes, sir, you sure carried the ball, Mr. Norton. Let her go to court. We'll prove it was suicide. We will? The first thing that struck me was that suicide angle, only I dumped it in the waste paper basket three seconds later. You ought to take a look at the statistics on suicide sometime. You might learn a little something about the insurance business. Mr. Keyes, I was raised in the insurance business. Then it's time you realize this company's got to pay Mrs. Dietrichson $100,000. Come on, Walter, let's get back to work. I could have hugged you right then and there, Keyes. You were the only one we were really scared of. And instead, you were almost playing on our team. That night, I could feel the floor under my feet again. That hundred thousand bucks was as safe for Phyllis and me as if we had it in the bank. Hello? I was paying you a home, darling. Uh, hello, baby. Everything all right? Sure, sure, it's fine. You were wonderful in Norton's office. I felt so funny. I wanted to look at you all the time. How do you think I felt? Where are you now? Okay, but be careful. Don't let anybody see you. Hello, Walter. Keys. What's the matter? Oh, I know you weren't expecting no, me. No, but... no, I wasn't. Uh, what's on your mind? <laughs> what are you so nervous about? Who says I'm nervous? Oh, forget it, forget it. It's me, I guess. I got the jumps. Eh, that Dietrichson case. You know, Walter, there's something fishy about that. Like what? I don't know. But right now, I'll swear that it wasn't suicide and it wasn't an accident either. Well, what else is left? You mean somebody... What, what, are, you, what are you trying to tell me, Keyes? Go to the door. You got company. Well, what about Dietrichson? If it wasn't an accident... What are you yelling for? You want me to go to the door? Keyes, wait. Wait, I'll get it. Keyes! In a few moments, we'll continue with Act Three of Double Indemnity. The 
curtain rises on Act Three of Double Indemnity, starring Barbara Sandwichillis and Fred McMurray as Walter. Late at night, alone in his office, Walter Neff struggles against the pain of his wound as he tries desperately to finish relating a sordid procession of facts into the office recorder. A memorandum to Mr. Keyes. You went to the door, didn't you, Keyes? You opened it. And I stood there a few feet behind you on, a, on the edge of a cliff. You were pushing me over. Huh. That's funny. Nobody here. Nobody's... Well, look for yourself. Must have come to the wrong door, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Now, uh, what were you trying to tell me about Dietrichson? Huh? Oh. Well, Dietrichson had accident insurance, right? Now, he broke his leg. Now, why didn't he put in a claim? Why? Well, maybe he just didn't have time to... Or maybe he just didn't know he was insured. No, 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 no. That, that couldn't be. You delivered the policy to him, didn't you? Sure. Down at the oil field. Yeah. Uh... Guy takes out an accident policy. It's worth $100,000. Two weeks later, he's killed by falling off an observation platform. Do you know what the mathematical chances are of that happening? About one in a billion. I'm telling you, Walter, something has been worked on us. Murder? All right, who? That wide-eyed dame who just doesn't know anything about anything, Mrs. Diedrichson. Oh, you're crazy, Key. She wasn't even on the train. Oh, I don't claim to know how it was worked or who worked it. <laughs> Well, you're no help to me, are you? Well, give me some time to think it over. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry I bothered you, Walter. I don't make much sense, do I? You just don't seem to have anything to go on. No, you? no, nothing at all. Well, I'll see you in the morning, yeah. Walter. Five minutes later, Phyllis Dietrichson was in my apartment. It was Phyllis, all right, who'd come to the door while you were there. But she'd heard us talking. She ducked back in the elevator before you opened the door. Luck and brains, keys. Pretty tough combination to beat. I mustn't stay long, Walter. How do we know he won't decide to come back? Just tell me how much he knows. Nothing, just a hunch. But he can't prove a thing, can he? Not if we're careful. Not if we don't see each other for a while. How long a while? Until this dies down. You afraid, baby? Yes, I'm afraid, but not of keys. I'm afraid of us. We're not the same anymore. We did it so we could be together. Instead of that, it's pulling us apart, isn't it, Walter? And you don't really care whether we see each other or not. Shut up, baby. Shut up and come here. You still think I don't care? No, oh, darling. Darling. The next day at the office, I had a visitor, Keys. Remember Diedrichson's daughter? Well, here she was again with something big on her mind. You think I'm crazy, Mr. Neff, but I'm not. Honestly, it's the same awful feeling I had once before when my mother died. When your mother died? We were at Lake Arrowhead six years ago last winter. My mother was very sick with pneumonia. One night I found her delirious with fever. All the blankets were on the floor and the windows were wide open. Then the nurse came into the room. She didn't say a word, but there was a look in her eyes I'll never forget. Two days later, my mother was dead. Do you know who that nurse was? Who? Phyllis. I tried to tell my father, but he wouldn't listen to me. Five months later, she married him. I, I tried to forget about it. But now it's all back again. Now that something's happened to my father, too. Oh, you're not talking sense, Lola. Your father fell off a train. And two days before, Phyllis was in a room in front of a mirror, planning a black veil to her hat as if she couldn't wait to see how she'd look in morning. You've got a pretty bad shock. Aren't you imagining things? She did it. She did it for the money. Only she's not going to get away with it because I'm going to tell everything I know. Lola, who else have you told this to? No one. Phyllis? Of course not. I, I've moved out of the house. I, I've taken a little apartment. You haven't told that boyfriend? Nino. No, I'm not seeing him anymore. We had a fight. Uh, so you just sit in that little apartment of yours and look at the four walls, huh? Yes, Mr. Neff. But I do a lot of thinking. About Phyllis. I took Lola out for dinner. I'd have to cheer her up. I'd have to make sure she wouldn't drop that dynamite about Phyllis to anyone else. I had no chance to talk to Phyllis. You were watching her like a hawk, Keys. The next day, you sent for me. I've got it, Walter. I've got it. All wrapped up in tissue paper. Dietrichson was murdered, and I can tell you how. 
Go ahead, Keyes. I'm listening. First of all, Dietrichson was never on the train. He was killed somewhere else and then put near the tracks by the wife and somebody else. Then the somebody else took the crutches and went aboard the train posing as Dietrichson. Oh, no, no. Wait a minute. How, how can you be sure? Now, let's see what we've got in the way of proof. The only one who really got a good look at this supposed Dietrichson is that Jackson guy from Oregon. Open the door, Walter, and tell Jackson to come in, will you? Jackson's here? Yeah, come on. Tell him to come in, will you? Uh, uh, Mr. Jackson, would you come in, please? Yeah, Mr. Jackson, please. Uh, take a chair. Yeah. Take a chair. Mm-hmm. Now, Mr. Jackson, did you study those photographs of Dietrichson? Not the same man, Mr. Keyes. No, sir, really. The man in these photographs is not the same man I saw on that train. Uh, there you are, Walter. There's your proof. Oh, uh, this is Mr. Neff, one of our salesmen, Mr. Jackson. Mm, pleased to meet you, Mr. Neff. Now, I'd like you to describe the man you saw on the train. Oh, 10 or 15 years younger than the man in these photos. Uh-huh. Of course, it was pretty dark, and he kind of kept turning his back to me, but just the same, I am positive. Well, thank you, thank you. Now, uh, we may need you again if the case comes to court, you uh, understand. Expenses paid again? Of oh, yes, 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 of course. I'll sign a voucher now. It'll only take a moment. Uh, you ever been up in Oregon, Mr. Neff? What? No, no, I never have. It's funny. I keep looking at you like I met you somewhere. Yeah, that's ought to cover everything for you. Oh, well, that's mighty what of you, Mr. Keith. And any time you need me, you know. Yeah, thanks a lot. Goodbye. Well, there it is, Walter. And pretty soon we'll know who the somebody else is. Will we? Oh, they've got to meet. They've committed a murder. They're stuck with each other. They're on a trolley ride. Only it's a one-way trip, Walter, and the last stop's the cemetery. Yeah, you see this, this policy? Dietrichson's? Yeah, the wife just put in a claim. Well, I'm going to throw it right back at her. I left the office and phoned Phyllis from a public booth. We met in the market an hour later. Why did you call, Walter? What's the matter? Everything. Keyes is rejecting your claim. He's sitting back with his mouth watering, waiting for you to sue. But you're not going to. What's he got to stop me? Plenty. He's got it all figured out. But if he rejects the claim, I'll have to sue. Then you'll be in court and a lot of other things are going to come up. Such as you and the first Mrs. Dietrichson. What about me and the first Mrs. Dietrichson? The way she died. And about that morning veil you were trying on two days before you needed it. You've seen Lola. Sure, I've seen her. Trying to make sure she won't yell her head off about what she knows. She's putting on an act for you, crying all over your shoulder, that lying Keep it out of this, Phyllis. Remember, you're not going to sue. Because you don't want the money anymore, even if you could have it. Because Lola's made you feel like a heel all of a sudden. It isn't the money now, it's our next. Oh, you're not fooling me, Walter. It's because of Lola, what you did to her father. You're afraid she might find out someday and you can't take it, I can said you? leave her out of this. It's me I'm talking about. I don't want to be left out of I it. It's just we can't go through with it that We long. have gone through with it. The tough part is all behind us. We just have to hold on now and not go soft, sit close to together the way we started out. But the police may be watching us Then right let now. them get an eyeful. I loved you, Walter, and I hated him. But I wasn't going to do anything about it, not until I met you. You planned the whole thing. I only wanted him dead. And I'm the one that was dead. Is that what you're telling me? I'm telling you that nobody is pulling out. We went into it together, and we're coming out together. It's straight down the line for both of us. Remember? Yes, I remembered. Just like I remembered what you told me, Keyes. The last stop's the cemetery. I guess that was the first time I ever thought of Phyllis that way. Dead, I mean. And how it would be if she were dead. I saw Lola a lot that week. One night we drove down to the beach and all of a sudden she started to cry. (laughs) It's Nino, Walter. Nino. I thought you weren't seeing him. I wouldn't tell anyone else but you. They killed my father together. Nino and Phyllis. He helped you do it. I know he did. What makes you so sure? I've been following him. He's been to the house to see her night after night. Maybe he was just going with me as a blind in the night of the murder. You promised me you weren't going to talk like this anymore. Oh, maybe I'm just crazy. Maybe it's all in my mind. Sure, sure, it's all in your mind. I still love him, Walter. I do love him, I do. Zacchetti. Phyllis and Zacchetti. This was one I couldn't figure out. I couldn't come close to it. But the real brain twister came today. You sprung it on me keys after hours when you caught me in the lobby of the building. 
Hold on to your hat, Walter. Yeah, what for? The Dietrichson case just busted right up, and the guy showed up, the guy who helped her do it. So you were right all along, huh? Yeah, yeah. She just filed suit against us to collect a hundred grand. Well, that's okay by me. When we get her into that courtroom, I'm going to tear her to pieces. Come on, I'll buy you a drink. Well, I'd sure like one, Keith, but uh, I've got a date. Huh? Somebody better looking than me? <laughs> that was your dame, huh? Yeah, well, I'll bet she still drinks from the bottle. I went back to the office. I was scared stiff. Maybe you were playing cat and mouse with me. Maybe you knew all along that I was the somebody else. I had to find out. And I knew where to look. Your desk. The cylinder from the office recorder. The confidential message you dictated to the boss all ready for the girl to type out in the morning. I put the cylinder on the machine. And listened. Dear Mr. Norton, with regard to your proposal to place Walter Neff under surveillance, I disagree, absolutely. I've known Neff intimately for 11 years and personally vouch for him without reservation. The man we want is Nino Zacchetti. We've definitely established a connection between Zacchetti and Phyllis Dietrichson as indicated in detail in the attached file. I strongly urge that this whole matter be turned over to the district attorney. I telephoned Phyllis. I told her I'd have to see her that night. It was a hard sale. She was scared of your keys. How do you know nobody's watching the house? I know, that's all. I'll tell you when I see you. 11 o'clock? 11 o'clock. The lights will all be out. I'll leave the front door unlocked. Okay. Goodbye, Walter. And then, for the first time, I saw a way to get clear of the whole mess I was in. And of Phyllis, too. What I didn't know was that she had plans of her own. In here, Walter. Can you see? Yeah. Hello, baby. Anybody else in the house? No, nobody. We're all alone, huh? I just came to say goodbye. Goodbye? Where are you going? You're the one that's going. Suppose you stop being funny. Let's have it, whatever it is. A friend of mine's got a theory. He says when two people commit a murder, they have to go on riding together to the end of the line. And the last stop is the cemetery. Maybe he's got something there, Walter. Only I've got another guy to finish my ride for me. Nino Zacchetti. Really? It's been you and that Zacchetti guy all along. No, no, that's not so. Well, it doesn't matter now. The point is, Tease believes Zacchetti's the one he's been looking for. in the last chamber before he knows what's happening. And to me, him. Walter? What's happening to me all this time? Don't be silly, baby. You helped him do the murder. That's what Keyes thinks, and what Keyes thinks is good enough for me. Maybe it's not good enough for me, Walter. Maybe I don't go for the idea. Maybe I've had Zacchetti here so they won't get a chance to trip me up. So we can get the money and be together. That's cute, baby. Say it again. He came here first to ask where Lola was. I made him come back. I was working on him. I kept hammering into him that she was going out with another man so he'd go into one of his jealous rages and then I'd tell him where she was. And you know what he would have done to her. Yes. I believe he has just rotten enough. We're both rotten. Is what you've got cooked up for tonight any better? The window's open. Do you mind if I close it? Why don't you? Yes, Walter. It's you or me, isn't it? What else can I do? So you had a gun all the time. You'd better try it again. Now take it. Take the gun. I think I will. Why didn't you shoot me again? Don't tell me it's because you've been in love with me all this time. No. No, I never loved you, Walter. Not you or anybody else. I used you just as you said. That's all you ever meant to me. Until now when I... I couldn't fire that second shot. I... I never thought that could happen to me. Sorry, baby. I'm not buying... I'm not asking you to buy. Just hold me close like this, Walter. Hold me close. Goodbye, baby. Oh, no! I killed her, Keys. I killed Phyllis. But maybe her aim hadn't been so bad after all. I, I felt funny, lightheaded and, and blurry. But I made it keys all the way here to the office. It's almost 4.30 now. It's cold. And keys, I... I want you to do me a favor. I want you to be the one to tell Lola... 
kind of gently, but before it breaks wide open. I want you to take care of him. That guy's a kitty. So he doesn't get pushed around too much. As for me, I... Yo, what, I, Walter? Uh, hello, Keys. You're up pretty early, aren't you? What are you doing here? The night watchman phoned me, Walter. Seems you left a trail. Blood. Yeah, I, I wouldn't be surprised. How long have you been standing over there? Long enough. Well, now I suppose I get the big speech. Go ahead, Keys. Let's let's have it. You're all washed up, Walter. <sighs> oh, thanks. That was short, anyway. I'm going to call a doctor. What for? So I, so I can walk all the way to the gas chamber under my own power? Something like that, Walter. Look, Keys. Keys, I, I've got a different idea. Yeah? Suppose you went back to bed and, and didn't find out anything until the morning. Would you do that for me, Keys? Give me one good reason. Because I... I need four hours to get where I'm going. You're not going anywhere, Walter. You want to bet? I'm going across the border. How's this, Keys? I'm, I'm up on my own two feet. Walter, you haven't got a chance. You watch me. You'll never even make it to the elevator. So long, Keys. I'm much obliged. <laughs> Hello. Send an ambulance to the Pacific Building on Olive Street. Yeah, it's a police job. How you doing, Walter? Uh, I'm fine. Only somebody moved the elevator a couple of miles away. They'll be here soon. You know why you couldn't figure this one, Keys? Because the guy you were looking for was... was too close to you. He was right across the desk from you. Closer than that, Walter. Yeah. yeah. I love you, too. The curtain falls on double indemnity, and as usual, Barbara Stanwyck and Fred McMurray contributed splendid performances. Barbara, as I recall, you were a blonde in the picture, double indemnity. Yes, Bill. I always wondered how I would look as a blonde, and I found out. Then I decided to let nature take its course again. Oh, but not with your complexion, I hope. No, no, I'm very careful with my complexion. I always use Lux toilet soap. Uh, doesn't anybody care what I do? <laughs> oh. oh, yes, indeed, Fred. What have you been doing? Well, I've been making a picture at RKO. Uh, Skeely, uh, Never a Dull Moment with Irene Dunn. That's the title, Never a Dull Moment. And believe me, it's... Well, a... I've been uh, at MGM making To Please a Lady with Clark Gable, and, brother, mm -hmm. that wasn't dull either. For instance, <laughs> I... Oh, look, Barbara, uh... tomorrow night's Halloween, and if you don't let me say something, I'll set fire to your broom. Now, wait a minute. <laughs> Isn't anybody going to let me say something? <laughs> Barbara, didn't you just return from the premiere of your new picture? Yes, it was held in Indianapolis, and I certainly had a wonderful time. It's all about automobile racing, you know. Imagine going all the way to Indianapolis every year just to see those speed races. Well, that is hard to understand with Wilshire Boulevard just around the corner. <laughs> <laughs> What's just around the corner for next week, Bill? More excitement? Yes, Barbara. We think it's one of the most eventful nights of our season. First, the play is a powerful love story. David O. Selznick's immortal screen version of Rebecca. 
and our stars, two of the most famous, making their first appearance together on our stage, England's brilliant actor-director and his lovely lady. Need I say more? <laughs> Laurence Olivier and Vivian Lee. Oh! Good night. Good night. Good night, and come back again soon, both of you. Who is this Hollywood star? One of Hollywood's smallest actresses. She looks even younger than her 21 years. She tips the scale at 95 pounds, keeps her waistline a sensational 20 inches. Such a tiny package must be Wanda Hendricks. That's right, John. Because of her small size, Wanda has even her lingerie made to order. Loves being able to choose unusual shades for slips and nighties. She's very definite about their care. Insists on Lux Flakes for her personal things. She won't tolerate ordinary washing methods that might fade colors. As Hollywood stars know, gentle Lux care keeps pretty slips and nighties colorful as new three times as long. Take Wanda Hendricks' tip. Give all your lingerie that lovely Lux look. Get a big box of Lux Flakes tomorrow. Lever Brothers Company, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday evening when the Lux Radio Theater presents Laurence Olivier and Vivian Lee in Rebecca. This is William Keeley saying good night to you from Hollywood. We are all aware of the vital importance of religion in American family life. Religious education stabilizes the family and makes for better citizens. We urge you and your family to attend and actively support your church. Take your problems to church this week. Millions leave them there. Heard in our cast tonight were Bill Conrad as Keyes, Rhoda Williams as Lola, Bill Johnstone as Norton, and Robert Griffin, Howard McNear, Norman Field, Eddie Marr, and Virginia Agnello. Our play was adapted by S.H. Barnett, and our music was by Rudy Schrager. This is your announcer, John Milton Kennedy, reminding you to join us again next Monday night to hear Rebecca, starring Laurence Olivier and Vivian Lee. For almost two centuries, Americans have enjoyed the valuable privileges of freedom. Now, freedom needs each American to dedicate himself to its preservation. We must not allow our liberties to be endangered by neglect of our duties as citizens. During this year of rededication, join with your fellow Americans in reaffirming the principles on which this country is founded and the safeguarding of those principles. Make it your business to see that federal, state, and local governments are conducted honestly. Help to maintain the good morale of your sons and daughters in the armed forces. Learn the facts about all candidates and issues. Then, vote for the one you believe in. Make the most of every minute on your job. Produce as much as you can, and thus increase our military and economic strength. Work for better schools and a better community. Guard your American heritage of freedom. It needs you.